Hey hi everyone, this is Mukesh Otwani once again from learn-innovation.com. Today we are starting a new series for Python and we will be starting Python from the scratch till the advanced level. And later on, once you understand the Python's basics and all the fundamentals, then we will start automating our web applications, desktop application and other stuff as well. Okay. So before we move ahead, let's talk about what exactly is Python. Okay, so you must have heard this technical definition from Wikipedia from their official website as well that Python is high level interpreted general purpose programming language, which actually allow you to write programs in just few lines of code, right? So what exactly these technical terms like high level interpreted general purpose, we'll talk about this in detail one by one. Okay, so when you say high level, so all the programming language that we have in the market is like C, C++, Java. So just like that, Python is also high level programming language. When it comes to interpreter, it means it will execute your program statement by statement. Okay, so we have a compiler and interpreter, right? So when we talk about interpreted programming language, it means it will execute your program statement by statement. So debugging will be very easy for you. Now let's talk about what do you mean by general purpose programming language? It means you can use this programming language for the different purposes. Okay. So with the help of Python, you can do so many stuff that I will be discussing in few minutes. But when we say general purpose, it means you can use this programming language for all the tasks or all the stuff that you need to automate or develop. Okay. The main motivation behind Python was just to have a programming language that is easy to use, easy to read, and we should not struggle with the syntaxes. Okay. The main uh, motto of the creator of this Python was just we need to write code which is easy to read. Okay, so once you move ahead, once you move to the next lecture, you will understand how easy it is to write the code in Python. Now let's talk about what can you do with the Python. Okay, so when you are starting with Python, you can use Python for creating a GUI based application. You can use for web development using Django and so many other libraries. You can do so many stuff in Python, okay, whether it's a web automation, desktop automation, or whether it's RPA as well, Python is going to help you a lot when you start automating this stuff. And the most important part because of the machine learning, okay, so Python has immense support for machine learning when it comes to network programming, games, development, and there's so many things which you can do with Python. So once you move ahead, once you understand the different modules which is available for Python, the different libraries which is available for Python, you can develop so many applications and different varieties of application using Python. Now, Python is created by Guido van Rossum in 1989. And uh, the main motivation which I already discussed was to create a programming language which should be easy to read and we should focus more on the logic part, not on the syntax part. So let's talk about now what are the features of Python, why it is getting popular day by day and why you should go with the Python. Okay. So these are the couple of features that I want to highlight, which actually will help you to decide whether you should go with Python or any other programming language. So let's start with the first part, free and open source. Everybody loves free and open source tools, right? You don't, because you don't have to pay a single penny and you can modify these Python versions depends on a requirement. Right. So when it comes to free and open source, as I said, you don't need to pay a single penny to download it and you can start using it. The most important selling point of Python is easy. And when it comes to easy, it means they have a very easy syntax. Like you don't need to write 10 lines of code just to write a hello world program. You just need to call a print method and you can start printing anything on the console. OK, so once you move it, you will understand how easy it is to write the code in Python. So when it comes to syntaxes, again, when you move from any traditional programming language like C, C++, Java, right? You will see a big difference when it comes to syntax. So again, hold on for a couple of more sessions. You will understand how easy it is to write the code in Python. Third important part, libraries. Okay. Now Python has so many inbuilt modules or I will say library for different kind of application that you want to develop or different kind of uh, task that you want to achieve. So when it comes to base Python, when you download install Python, by default, Python has so many modules inbuilt, but whenever you have to do something extra, which is not in the base module or in the base Python, you can download the third party libraries for Python and you can start using it. Okay. So I can give thousands of examples, but just to give you one example, like if you want to work with Selenium, you can download the Selenium libraries and you can start using it. Right. 
So again, when it comes to library, there's limitless categories available for Python. Okay. So once you understand the principles, then you can also start exploring the different libraries depends on your usage. Fourth important point, portable. When I say portable, it means you can write the code in Windows and you can, you know, run in Windows, Mac, uh, Unix without making a single change. Interpret it. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it's a um, interpreted language. It means it will execute your program statement by statement. It will make your, you know, debugging very easy. It's object oriented. Again, it supports object oriented and procedural language as well. So when it comes to object oriented, so if you're coming from any other programming background where you have the oops concept, Python also supports object oriented programming concept and very interesting point called extensible. So when I say extensible, it means if let's say if you want to write the code in C or C++, you can do that in Python as well. So we'll talk about the extensibility feature also if required. But in case if you don't need this feature, like you don't want to code in C and C++, you can skip this part. But yes, in case if you have your requirement in future where you need to write the code in C++ or C, you can do in Python as well. Okay. And uh, I can give uh, a lot of features, but these are the main features which I want to highlight but again couple of more features that we will be discussing once you move it and the most important is dynamically typed language so what does it mean let's say you want to work with some data so you don't need to exactly tell what kind of data you're using right that is the integer flow double character boolean string the moment you start using these variables automatically python will detect what kind of data type it is and it will use it accordingly you don't need to mention the data type explicitly okay so again couple of more features uh, which is available in python which once you go more ahead you will understand but these are the high level features that i want to highlight now you must be wondering who is using python or the different companies who are using python so there are actually thousands of companies who are using python but i want to take few names which are actually well known to everybody okay so when you talk about google facebook instagram spotify netflix dropbox reddit these all companies are using Python. Okay. So I also want you to just do a quick search about how many companies and which companies are using Python and how they're using. It will be very interesting to know how these companies are using Python for their, for their product and for their different algorithms. Okay. So that's all I have for today. So in the next videos, we will discuss about the other features of Python and implementations how we can use it for automation and so on. Today in this video, we are going to talk about how we can download and install Python in Windows. So in case if you're working with Mac, Linux or any other operating system, then I will record a dedicated video on that. But let's focus on Windows today. Okay, so in order to download Python, you can directly navigate to python.org or you can just go ahead and search for download Python. The moment you say download Python, you will get their official site, which I already opened here. So let's click here and you will see the latest version that we have currently at the time of recording is 3.8.5. Okay. So in case we're working for, or in case we're looking for any other versions, then you can come back here and you can see the different versions, which is already available. Okay. Now they have also men mentioned that in case if you're working with 2.7 or any other uh, versions right then this is the end of support like at the end of 2021 it's already 2.7 is no longer supported right so i would highly recommend you to work with python 3 so we are going to work with 3.8 as of now okay and uh, let's see how we can download so before we start downloading let's quickly check do we have already python installed in our local system or not so how we can check just go to your search bar and search for python so in case if you already have, you will get Python. Otherwise you will get the search options. So in our system, we don't have Python. So let's start from the scratch. So first of all, I need to download this Python. So I will click on this download Python 3.8.5. It's a small exe file. It will take few seconds and it will download in our system. Yeah, so you can see right now Python 3.8.5 is installed. So it's just like an exe file. So it's just like we install normal software. We are going to double click on this and it will start the installer. 
So the moment you double click, you will see it is giving you a couple of options. In case if you want to customize the location and other stuff, you can go to customize installation. Right now, I'm not making any changes. By default, my Python will go into user folder, app data, local programs, Python and Python directory. Okay. I'm also clicking on this add Python 3.82 path so that it will by default go ahead to my environment variable and it will uh, set up the environment variable for us. Okay. So just click on install now and it will take okay it will ask one confirmation so just click on yes now it will take few seconds depends on your system and it will install python in your local system okay so now you can set up successful so now they also have given couple of link okay so you will find online tutorials and very beautiful documentation which you can definitely refer i would highly recommend you in case if you want to learn any programming language not only python you should definitely read the official documentation because they will be give you in depth about each and everything and in case if you want to verify whether python is installed in your system or not just go to this search and search for python this time and now you can see we have python in our local system which is python 3.8 okay so in order to cross verify whether python installed correctly or not just open a command prompt and just type python space hyphen version okay it says we need to say python hyphen hyphen version so just you can see python 3.8.5 installed in our local system and we also can verify whether pip is installed or not because pip will help you to install a couple of libraries so when i type pip and hit enter you can see it is asking us give additional command like what exactly you want to do with pip right so you can see a couple of options we got like do you want to install do you want to download uninstall a freeze list and there are a couple of commands which comes with pip so don't worry once we move ahead we'll talk about the pip as well how to use pip but for the time being just make sure that python is giving proper version or not in case this python version is not giving it means something is wrong with your installation or the environment variable is not set okay in that case we can go manually and uh, update the environment variable then we can again use the python so in case you are not getting this python version okay i will show you how you can manually uh, add into the environment variable so let me show you why where exactly our python is installed so let's go to c drive then go to users folder so if you, remember, if you remember when we were installing python it was telling us the exact location so we are just going to the same location so we'll go to users then we will go to app data then i will go to local then i will search for program and then you will find a python directory so this is exactly where the python will be installed in your local system so this is your home directory of python 3.8 okay so in case your your terminal or command prompt is not able to detect where the python is then we need to go to the path variable and we need to give this path so this is the first path that we need to set and another path that we need to set till script if you go to script you will find a pip that we will be using once you move ahead so definitely you need to set the path till home directory and the script as well okay so let me just copy this path and i will right click on my computer go to properties and click on advanced system settings and you will find here environment variable so guys i'm using windows 10 in case if you're working windows 8 or 8.1 you will see a different ui for environment variable so what you need to do first of all you need to go to the path variable again small disclaimer do not delete this path variable okay if you delete this path variable you will be in trouble many of the programs will not work after restart so do not delete this click on add it okay and once you come down here you will find number of path is already available okay number of environment variables so what i will do i will click on new here and i will give the path till home directory then i will again click on new and this time i will give the path till scripts okay so just come down and just click on new and add till the script this is only required when 
Python is not detected by your command prompt or your by your system. In that case, you need to do this. If it is working fine, then you don't need to make these changes. Okay. So I will click on OK, click on OK, and I will continue. So just open once again command prompt and just type Python. So you can see by default it is giving you an idle which is kind of a small editor where you can write your programs so either you can go directly from here or the moment you write python you will get this editor where you can write the small program okay so let me quickly check whether python is working fine or not so what i will do i will just write a print method and i will say hello mukesh hit enter and you can see it is printing Okay, let's do some other thing. Let me do 10 plus 20. Hit enter and you can see it is giving me the result. It means Python is working fine and we can continue with our programs now. So this is when I open Python from command prompt. But the moment you open idle, which is again a Python shell, here also you can do the same thing. You can just write your first program, let's say print statement. And let's say I will just say hello user. And you can see we are getting the output similar way if i say 10 plus 90.89 and you can see we got the output okay we'll talk about the data types and the arithmetic operation in detail one by one this is just to check whether installation is correct or not so now when you do a basic program this is fine we can go with this idle and we can continue or we can just go with this um, small editor but the moment you start writing the complex program or the big programs definitely you need one ide okay so id stand for integrated development environment there are a couple of ide available in the market like visual code eclipse pycharm you can go with any editor so in this complete series i will be talking about pycharm so let's go ahead and install one ide where we will be writing our actual code so i will just search for pycharm and hit enter you will get their official site so actually pycharm is a product of jetbrains okay so if you have worked with other uh, product of jetbrain then we have intellij as well so right now we are only going to deal with pycharm so it's a very famous ide for python so again it has two variants uh, the moment you click on download it will give you two options to download one is the professional edition and one is the community edition now right now I'm working with Windows so I will continue with Windows but in case if you're working with Mac or Linux definitely you need to go with their respective installer and you have to continue. I will click on Windows and right now if you see we have two addition uh, one is community and professional so definitely professional one is paid we need to continue with the free and open source one so I will click on download. It will take some time to download because it's a lengthy file around 295. So let it download then we will install pycharm so now pycharm is downloaded and again it's an exe file since i'm working on windows so i will double click on this exe file and it will start installing pycharm on my local system okay so now it's just like a normal software how we install the normal software click next 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 and install so in the same way we are going to continue just click on next now this is just a destination folder where exactly they're telling here pycharm will be installed and just Keep a uh, note here that you should have a sufficient space. Right now it is asking the space required is 761 MB. We already have enough space, so it should not give any issue. Let's click on next. And now you can see, it, do you want to uh, create a desktop shortcut? So I will say yes. Do you want to also create our default, you know, extension is .py? I will say yes and click on next. But in case if you don't want to select these options, you can continue, click on next and again just additional information click on install again wait for a few sec seconds and you will see pycharm will be installed on your local system so it's done now so let's click on finish and yeah let's start pycharm so just click on windows and search for pycharm and yes here we have pycharm community edition 2020 click on it and again since we are loading first time it might take few seconds again to get started so now again you need to confirm the agreement so click on confirm click on continue and again it will ask for data sharing i will say don't send yeah and it will take few seconds and finally it is giving few additional options okay now again it was asking you do you want this theme or this theme so this is actually known as darkula theme 
and this is the light theme again you can change the settings anytime so as of now i will continue with the light theme and i will click on next featured plugins so again here they generally recommend these are the featured plugins do you want to use them or not right now we don't need all of them so whatever plugins we have to use we will download and install separately as of now continue using default pycharm so start using pycharm yeah so here's the pycharm window you can click on the new project you can open existing project and you can also get the project from the version controls as of now since we are getting started you can click on new project okay you can also see we have configure option in case if you want to configure pycharm at the starting itself we can do that but these settings we can do after opening the pycharm as well so as of now let's keep it default and click on new project so expected it will ask you give me the project name okay so by default you can see all the projects will go under this location so in case if you have to uh, verify a couple of things go to this location and you can verify your files so right now i will say uh, this project name is python tutorials okay and click on create do not make any changes once you move it we will be talking about these things in detail so as of now and you can see by default there's one checkbox that create a main.py file which is nothing but a welcome script if you don't want you can uncheck this one for the time being i have clicked on it because this is the default checkbox click on create and now pycharm will start okay so you can see it is saying creating virtual environment so don't worry we'll talk about the virtual environment as well so what exactly is virtual environment here so again uh, it is giving a couple of tips i don't need these tips so i will click on close okay so now pycharm is up and running and you can see we got main.py file which is nothing but a sample python script generated by pycharm so again you don't need to worry about this uh, python script that is coming by default just to cross check whether everything is running fine or not we will simply run this program and we'll see what is the output so you can see right now it is giving output is pycharm right which is high pycharm in case if i change it to let's say mukesh utwani it should give high mukesh utwani so don't worry we'll talk about how it is working in detail once we move ahead so as of now it is just doing a print statement yeah so everything is done now python is installed pycharm installed our scripts are running fine today in this video i will be talking about how you can install python in my operating system so in our previous videos we already discussed about windows right but today we'll talk about mac and we will try to install python first then we will also install pycharm and we will try to run python programs from the terminal and we will also try to run python from the pycharm as well okay so just put mouse over on the downloads and you can see we have an option to download for mac directly in case this option is not coming for you or it is not able to detect your operating system you can see this option right view the full list of downloads the moment you click here you will get this link and here you can download the python for the different os okay you can see it showing for windows unix mac and others in case we are looking for a specific release you can also see the different releases they have in case if you want the specific release you can go ahead and download right now at this moment i'm just going to download the latest one which is 3.8.5 you'll get this small 28 mb file it will take some time to download okay so file is already downloaded now let me double click and install this in my local system so you can see by default it is actually stopping it because of the security preferences so no problem click on okay go back to this uh, apple icon click on the system preferences click on security and privacy click on open anyway and click on open and you can see the python installer started click on continue click on continue click on continue and you can see it says just accept the agreement just click on agree now it says this much space is available okay which is fine but this software only need 116 mb which is very less click on continue and click on install now it is asking some password let me enter my system password which is this click on install software it will take few seconds and it will install python in your local system so you can see we got this python 3.8 the moment you expand this you can see we got idle which is ideally 
python editor we got python launcher and few additional files so don't worry we don't need all of them now now let me first of all check the terminal this is my terminal now let's do one thing let's cross verify let me open my terminal and see do we have python installed in our local system or not so i will just search for python space hyphen hyphen version okay so you can see even though we installed python 3.8.5 but when i say python version it says 2.7.10 so why this is happening let me show you first of all the official documentation the moment you go to the documentation part and just go to python docs and it will navigate to docs.python.org we just need to come back to this python setup and usage click on it the moment you come down you can see using python on mac so just click on getting and installing mac python so by default mac comes with python okay so you can see by default mac comes with python 2.7 pre-installed by apple so what we need to do a uh, few people try to uninstall this but if you see the official documentation they highly recommend that you should never modify or delete this okay so what you can do let the older python be in your system you can continue with the new python that we installed so i already have 2.7 which is coming by default from apple but we have installed our python as well which is 3.8.5 so in case if you want to work with your custom python or the new python version that you downloaded you can continue with that do not modify or do not delete or try to uninstall the existing python because chances are very high apple might be using this older version of python for some other applications so if you try to uninstall this this might create a conflict or issue for a couple of existing applications so do not ever modify or delete the existing python so what we did right now we just installed 3.8.5 so what if i want to simply uh see the new python just say python 3 and hyphen hyphen version so you can see now i have two python installed in my local system one is python 2.7.10 another is python 3.8.5 which we downloaded just now okay so whenever you have to go with python 3 just type python 3 and you can run your python program now just type which python so you can see the existing python that we are using is available under usr local sorry usr bin yeah python so let me just keep the path here and if i say which python 3 then i got the path here that the python 3 that we installed is available under this path okay so now let's verify what i will do i will just go to just click on this go item and you can see go to folder so first of all let's go to this path which is usr sorry yeah just go to usr bin python hit enter and you can see we got this bin folder where we have the older python which is python 2 fine now apart from python you also find some other binaries okay that we are using internally so i don't want to disturb them now let me open python 3 that we installed i will just say command c go to go uh, click on go to folders paste this and you will see we got python 3 right so this is where the python is installed in case if you want to play around with python anything you just need to come to this location and you can continue so you can see we also got pip 3 okay so whenever you have to install anything any external modules we will be using pip so whenever you have to use pip from python 3 we will be using pip 3 for example let's say let me clear this if i say python okay pip hit enter it is referring pip from python 2 so these options are coming from python 2 what if i want same from python 3 i will say pip 3 that's all so python python 3 pip and pip 3 let's say i want to install some external module which is not available in my system so i will say pip install selenium okay so it will try to install selenium now and you can see it is downloading the latest version of selenium and selenium is in our local system and now let me also configure 
PyCharm with Python 3. So let's open the PyCharm. I am assuming that you have already PyCharm in your local system. In case if you don't have, then PyCharm installation is very easy. Just go to uh, Google, search for PyCharm download. Just navigate to their official site from JetBrains and you can download the PyCharm for Mac it's where you will get a small file. You just need to install just like a normal software and it will get installed in your local system. Okay, so right now you can see they have two uh, versions. One is professional, one is community. Click on the community and you can continue using it. Right now it's automatically detecting Mac. In case if it is not detecting, just go to Mac and download. Double click install and you will get this PyCharm just like a normal software. So let me start PyCharm. Now you can see PyCharm is up and running. I already have PyCharm installed in my system. I already have a demo project one. So it's loading by default. In your case, you will get a pop-up window where you can create a project from the scratch. So let me create a fresh project. Process will be same. So first of all, it will ask you, do you want to create project? So I will create this project as YouTube Python tutorials. Okay, now you can see here in case if you have two Pythons, one is Python 2.7 and we have now 3.8.5. The moment you click here, the interpreter, project interpreter, the base interpreter, you can change it. Okay, so you can see they have the multiple base uh, interpreter. The one which we have to select, which is the latest one, which we did right now is from this. Okay, now if you just cross check and verify this was the path right library framework python dot framework version 3.8 bin python 3 same thing you will you will find here so i just have to select this and i can continue in case if you select python 2 okay then definitely you have to go with python 2 and again there's a big difference between python 2 syntax versus python 3 syntax anyways python 2 is end of support already in 2020 it is no longer supported so it is actually i will say you will not get any enhancement, but still it works if you want to work with Python 2. But as Python suggests, we need to continue with Python 3. So we'll go with this and we can click on create. It says open project. Yes, I will say open in a new window. It will take few seconds and your project will be ready. Okay, so let's do one thing. Let's create one Python program and let's see if it is working fine or not. And if it is working, then we can continue with the complete tutorial. So right click, create a new Python file. This Python file, I will say check demo one, click on OK. And we got this. Now let me just write print. We got this auto suggestion. Let me just say hello. Right click run and we got the output and you can see by default it is taking 3.8 okay so it is referring to this in case if you want to change just go to interpreter settings and you can change the interpreter from here right now we just need uh, 3.8 which is already set we don't have to make any changes but yeah in case if you want here you can also do that so this is how we can set up python in mac and just to give you uh, my Pi, uh, Mac version, I'm using at the time of recording is 10.12.6. Now, what if I want to uninstall this? Again, same process that what we did. First of all, we need to go and delete the Python from this path. Okay, because by default, Python will go and sit into this location. So first of all, close all the existing editor if in case if it is open then go to this particular location this is only for uninstalling in case if you don't want to uninstall you can skip this part but in case you want to uninstall uh, python 3.8 or the newer version just go to this location where python is installed click on go click on go to folder navigate till here and you can see we have versions right so this is the one which we downloaded just now 3.8 so what i will do let me close this terminal and delete this it will ask the password just enter the password okay and it's done 
we don't have now 3.8 second thing that you need you need to also go to your applications and search for python you can see python 3.8 is already installed just right click and click on move to trash again it will ask you password and it is done okay so just delete from that location which is this we just deleted the home directory and then we delete it from the application and now let's do and let's see so now if i say python space hyphen hyphen version we got 2.7.10 fine now if i say python 3 space space hyphen hyphen version okay we don't have python 3 perfect what about pip 3 pip 3 is also not there if i say which python it is giving location of the existing python that we have which is 2.7.10 if i say which python 3 now it will not provide any location it means python 3 which we downloaded just now got uninstalled completely and now we can freshly start in case if you want to go with python 3 otherwise you can go with python 2. i hope this session was useful and i hope you are able to install python in your mac in case if you find any issue or any problem while installing python or pycharm in your mac let me know in the comment section so today we will talk about data types in python the moment you start working with any programming language, you should know the which kind of data type they have because every time you need to store the data, you, so you should know what data types they have. So in simple words, what exactly is data type? It will represent that what kind of data you are using. Okay. So let's quickly start the different data types we have in Python. So these are the data type which exist in Python. And so we'll talk about integer floating point, complex numbers, boolean, string, list, dictionary, tuples, and set. So the last five which you can see string, list, dictionary, tuples, and set. I will be recording dedicated video for each data type because they are very interesting and they are very important. So first five also, first four also is very important, but yeah, they are very easy. We don't have much to cover, but the last five requires a dedicated video. So don't worry, we will talk about last five in details in each and every video. We will discuss about the different methods. They have what kind of operations that we can do. Yeah. So I will be giving you overview about each data type now, but today we'll focus on the first four. So we have integers in Python, which will represent by int. We have floating point numbers, which is represented by float. We have complex numbers, which is represented by complex and Boolean will represent by bool string by str list by list dictionary by DACT tuples by TUP and sets with set. So these are actually the classes. Okay. So once I will move ahead, I will show you these classes. Each and every data type in Python is a class. So let me show you how exactly uh, they are and um, what kind of values they can store. So integers are just a whole number. So the moment you say whole number, it means normal numbers 3, 1, 2, 5, 19 or any number. So these numbers will come under integer category. This can hold the positive values and negative values as well. And integer will be represented by int. So don't worry, I will show you the practical uh, example for each and every data type. So let's quickly go through the slides that I have prepared. It will give you an overall idea how to use these data types. The next data type is float. Okay. So it's a real number. Whenever you have floating point that will be represented by float. So whenever you have any floating value like 3.14, 7.9, 1.8, anything, it will be a float. So generally float is represented by float in Python. Now this is complex number. So whenever you have any complex number, it will be represented by complex. And you can see one example is one plus i you can have n number of examples here so whenever you have any complex number it will be represented by complex now boolean now boolean has actually only two values which you can provide so in python we have two built-in values one is true and one is false and it is represented by bool again just a small disclaimer this true false the first character is capital okay so whether it's true so it will be capital true and capital false only the first letter not the complete sentence the next data type is string so string is nothing but a collection of characters okay so we don't have separate character data type in python so uh, 
what we have is a string okay so we can represent this string in python either with a single quotes or double quotes both are acceptable okay so any example you can take whether it's the python mukesh or twani selenium anything in double quotes or single quotes it will be considered as a string and it is represented by str next is list as the name says list right so it's a collection of objects or collection of values that we are going to have so when i say i have a list of friends i have a list of tools i have a list of gadgets so anything which is a collection we will call as a list so in python we represent list with a bracket okay so you can have any number of values within the list and we can play with the list so once you move ahead we will talk about how to work with the list in detail but for the time being this is what the list is it's a uh, it's a ordered collection and it can have the duplicate values as well the next is set it is also a collection of object but one thing which we need to notice here it is unordered okay and the main important difference is it does not support duplicate elements yeah so or whatever values you will be having it will be all unique in set it is represented in curly brackets and you can have n number of values here again there's no type restrictions when it comes to list set dictionary or tuple you can have n number of data without any type restriction and it is represented by set okay so second lot it is also a collection but now it's a key value pair okay so whenever you have some data and you want to assign certain key you have to use dictionary so if you remember what is dictionary generally in our old times right we had a phone dictionary so whenever you have to contact me you will find my name or my address then you will get my address or the number right so you have a key and then you have value same thing goes with dictionary here in python you have a key and value pair so whenever you have to get some values you will be giving a key and you will get the values again very interesting concept we'll see in detail for the time being it is represented by dict or you can call it a dict it's up to you and now we have tuple okay tuple or tuples it's up to you so it's a collection of objects again but here main thing is it's immutable so what is immutable here it means once the value is assigned you cannot modify okay so let's say uh, we have a tuple called mukesh and you want to replace with some other words called otwani or selenium you cannot do that okay and it is represented by tuple okay so let me start with integer float complex and bool so i will go back to python idle okay so in the last lecture we discussed how to install python right so now you can start writing directly the code in pycharm which we already have in case if you don't want to start you can for the simplest program you can go with the python shell or we will call it as idle which is idle so in case if you don't have this open let me show you how you can start just go here search with idle okay you can see this is python idle uh, just open it or in case you want to directly start from cmd just type python and you will get this python exe right so you can directly start writing code here as well third option you can directly start with a pycharm as well so i am going to use this idle which is idle which is python shell in short and just for since i am making tutorials video i will increase the font size so that i can show you better but in case if you don't want to increase the font size you are good with the default fonts please stick to default 10 i will go with 20 okay 20 will be a little high let me make it 16 yeah click on apply and okay and now we have bigger font size so let me show you uh, these data types one by one and you i will also show you the parallelly the operators that we can perform okay the operations you, the help of operators so let's say i want to run 2 plus 3 the result is 5 okay now if i say any subtraction operation you can see now we have the value is 5 90 minus 9 we have the 81 so you can see these values are getting operated or with the help of operation we are able to calculate and it is giving the result so plus uh, addition subtraction multiplication division modulus everything you can do here so let me quickly cover all the operators so if i want to say 10 into 3 i will say 10 star 3 and i will get the result if i say 10 by 3 okay which is divided by 3 i will get the value okay so you can see now this is actually your integer values which i'm able to show you right but this is actually a float value so whenever you do 
any division operator operation you will be getting a float value okay so let's say if i say 10 divided by 2 i will get 5.0 so whenever you say division you will always get the float values okay so let's say i want to get the remainder so now we are going to use another operator called mod operator okay so let's say if i say 3 divided by 2 i'm getting 1.5 Okay, so now if I say I want to uh, use the mod, okay, which is mod operator. So I will say three and I will be using now percentage sign and I will say number. So it will give me the remainder. Okay, so there's some indentation issue. So we'll talk about the indentation now. Okay, so the moment is a three module or mod two, it will give you the remainder. Okay, so the moment is a 10 by three. So 10 by three, when I say, sorry, it's a mod operator, 10 mod three you will get the remainder again which is one so maybe once you start giving you know basic interview questions they will ask you whether the number is even or not so you can use this mod operator it will always give you remainder so if remainder is above zero it means it's a odd number right so if i say 13 divided by 2 sorry mod by 2 you will get one like this you can do many operations so these are just a basic operators that we are using from our childhood right division subtraction multiplication and mod operator now let me also show you the uh, power of let's say i want to say 2 into 2 into 2 you will get the 8 right now what if i want 2 to the power 8 2 to the power 10 so i cannot just write in this matter in that case i will say 2 star star let's say 8 okay just a syntax issue just again say 2 and again we don't have to give any space okay the moment say you get 2 to the power 8 so when you set any power you just use two star operators and you will get the power of that number okay so again if i say 3 to the power 9 okay i will get the value so this is two star you can use when you have to take the power of yeah now again we don't have any option here to clear this idle so what i will do i will close this and I will start the fresh one now let's say I have one equation let's say 2 plus 10 plus 5 into 9 okay we got the value so how it is working okay so first it is saying if you just go in a left to right order ideally it should have given 10 plus 2 12 plus 5 17 then 17 to 9 but right now what it is doing first of all it is actually doing this operator right 9 so actually it is following the board mass so again if i write 2 plus 9 okay plus let's say 3 and again into 5 now i want that this condition has to be evaluated first then it has to multiply by 5 so again brackets have the highest order so when i say in this way first this expression will be evaluated which is 9 plus 3 12 and 14 then into 5 so we'll get the final result so whenever you have multiple operators okay then you can use brackets which will looks i will say the standard one right otherwise you can go in this manner but in this case what it will do it will follow the board mass and first it will do 3 into 5 15 then it will continue with this so if I show you once again 2 plus 9 plus 3 and into 5 okay and you will see the different output yeah so brackets actually will have the highest priority so whenever you have such equation use the brackets accordingly and you will get the desired result okay so this is how we are dealing with the operators but what about now the data types which I'm talking about so now you can use a function called type okay so the moment i say one you can see it will return me a int that it's an integer number and int is actually class which i already discussed now the moment i say type 1.5 okay and it says it's a float so you can see right by default when i'm using some inbuilt functions it is highlighting in a different color right the moment i say typ you can see it's completely black because it's not a predefined method it's just a, a simple string that i have created but the moment is a type you can see it's highlighting it means it's a predefined function 
I hope int and float is clear to you. So we don't use complex much. So we will be talking about complex data type in detail once you move it. As of now, let's talk about the Boolean that we are going to use almost every single day. Okay. So the moment I said type, okay, as I said, we need to use true. Yeah. The moment you said true and hit enter, you can say it's a bool class. And in the same way, if I type for false and I will be getting a bool class again. But again, as I said, T and F is capital. The moment you said type, okay. And if I say small t and true, you can see the moment I hit enter, it says name true is not defined because there's nothing called true, okay. True and false with capital T and capital F, these are built-in types, okay. Now, if you understood about the data types, now let me talk about how we can use in the variables because we cannot go without using the variables. So let's talk about variables. So let's say if I'm using one variable called name and if I'm using something called, let's say uh, 12. And if I simply say my name again, it will give me the value, right? Which is 12. Now we need variables so that we can reuse them or we can reference them for some other equation or for some other statement. So this is one variable called name. Now, if I try to say 12.0, will it work? Because name is already assigned with 12. But what if I say 12.0? Let's see if I try to print it again. So now you can see it's working, right? How it is working? Because Python supports dynamic typing. In other programming language, it will give you error. It will give you the uh, error because you cannot assign. But here it doesn't throw any error because of the dynamic typing. I hope it is clear now. So let's use some other variables. I will say this is my variable one equal to let's say 90. Then I have variable two, which is again, let's say 19.5. Uh, so if I have to use these two variables, now let's say finally, if I say result, I can do var one plus var two. And now if I simply just print the result, we should get the result. Yeah, which is 109.5 since now where two is a floating where one is integers the moment we get the result result will be always float values yeah so this is how you can store the value using equal to operator which is now let's talk about now bool so if i say status equal to true yeah you can see it's again highlighted in different color because it's inbuilt type the moment i say print again status i will get the value okay some spelling mistake just give me a second print and i will say status yeah we got the true but what if i say status equal to true again the moment i hit enter it says true is not defined because we haven't defined true and we are trying to assign into a variable status so it will say true is not defined okay so make sure when you assign boolean it should have the proper value now very interesting fact again what if i say status equal to none yeah it is acceptable now the moment i say print status again we have inbuilt type called none so we have true we have false we also have a none but again you cannot say none in this way Okay. If you do it, it will throw you the name error again. Yeah, I hope it is clear. So before we end this video, I just want to highlight a couple of points. First thing, always try to have variables, local variables for the timing with lower letters. Okay. Again, there's no issue, but always try to use lowercase letters when you're going with a local variables. Second thing, variable should not start with the number. So I cannot say one uh mukesh equal to 10 again it's invalid syntax you cannot start variable with a uh, numbers okay and try to avoid inbuilt keywords so just now i have shown you right list uh dictionary tuples set string int so try to avoid that the moment i say int equal to uh, nine zero so you can see it's again a predefined keyword the moment i say this again it will show me invalid syntax so try to avoid anyways you will get the syntax issue but you cannot use the inbuilt keyword that we have third very important point once again try to avoid the uh, 
characters special characters like which we are doing for addition subtraction right so if i cannot say equal to uh, or let's say this hyphen equal to 90 because hyphen is again a predefined operator you can use underscore that is fine i can say underscore name equal to let's say mukesh that is acceptable so if i try to print this name underscore name yeah it is working but i cannot go with plus minus modular hyphen and all the special characters yeah so this is how the variable works so just a quick summary you can reassign the variable because of dynamic typing in other programming language we have static typing the moment you start uh, you know assigning the values uh, different type of values again it will throw error but in python it will not definitely we also have pro and cons for this so the moment you say pro it's very easy you don't need to worry about the data type you can continue so development will be faster but when it comes to debugging that is actually an issue right because since we don't have any type restriction now we can reassign so you might get some unexpected output so debugging will be a little bit tricky sometimes yeah but yeah depends on the usage so we also have pro and cons for whether we go with static typing or dynamic typing it totally depends how do you handle this so in case if you're not comfortable with ideally which is coming by default from python you can continue with pycharm okay this is just to show you uh, how we can execute yeah the reason why i was showing because it was highlighting right this highlighting will make our task easy so if you want to do the same thing from uh, pycharm what you can do you can create a new file okay so let me show you let's create a new python file and i will say it's a demo one the moment you get your file ready you can use all this stuff that we discussed now so for example i want to give name equal to mukesh so we haven't discussed about string in real but whatever you give in double quotes will be considered as a string yeah now if i just use the print and you can see here in pycharm we're getting auto suggestions in case if you're not getting just type p and control space you will get this auto suggestions so i will be using this name just right click run demo one and you can see we got the output so let's say again you say this time again i will try dynamic typing this time i will say otwani and if i say print again and this time if i say name and if i just run this program once again you will get the otwani so this is the first this is the second output yeah so continue with this pycharm perfectly fine whatever i showed you i showed you so that i can directly hit enter i can show you the result yeah so last thing which i want to show you let's say you want the type right so i will say type of which i will say i want type of name variable that we're using so i will just say run demo one and you can see it's a string class which is represented by str today in this video we are going to talk about string in python so in the last lecture we already discussed about the different kind of data type we have in python but today we'll talk about string in detail so this video is going to be a little long so please uh, stick with me because this string class is very important when it comes to python or any other programming language so this session is going to be very interesting because we are going to discuss a couple of things in this video so we'll start with what exactly string couple of built-in methods that we have in string then we'll talk about few escape sequences that are frequently getting used when you work with python then we are going to talk about very interesting concept of indexing and slicing in python and we will be ending this session with format methods or maybe we can quickly cover these format methods along with the built-in methods that we have okay so so strings in python is nothing but a sequence of characters right so not only in python you take any other programming language string is a sequence of characters so we don't have actually character data type in python so whatever we have it's all about string so even if you have to start with character it has to be in a form of string string in python can be represented by double quotes or single code it doesn't matter okay but if you talk about java in if we give in single quotes it will consider as a character but in python it's very straightforward it's all about double quotes or single quotes it will be a string okay so let me show you uh, through examples and then we'll start again with the indexing and slices so let me go back to my pycharm so in the last video we discussed about this idle right so we have done everything in idle now i want to show you a couple of interesting features from pycharm that will give you so many useful information about the string class 
so i will be using pycharm now but in case if you want to still work with ideally or any other editor it's completely up to you okay so let me create a string class here uh, sorry let me create a python file and that we will be using for our demo so let me give here string demo and now i will be writing couple of strings so let's create a variable so i will give this variable as let's say first name okay i will be using underscore first name let's say my first name is mukesh then i will be using another variable called last name last underscore name equal to otwani so this time i will give single quotes okay so you can say if double quotes accepted single quote accepted so if i just say print first name and if i say print last name and i will simply right click and run string demo and you can say it is accepting so first string was in double quotes it worked second was in single quote it worked it means we can use both now how can we do the concatenation so again it's very easy in python you just say first name use plus operator for concat operation and just say last name and now you can say this run icon run icon right you can say run and this time you can say we got mukesh otwani so now if you want to put one space in between what you can do you can just give plus and in double quotes you give one space that is acceptable again the moment you run this you see we got output with a proper space now let me just put a comment or maybe we can continue here because because of dynamic typing we can reassign the same variable so i will give here full name okay and i will do first name plus space and i will say last name so I can use this full name variable now from the now onwards. So let me take another string and this this is going to be a little interesting. What if I want to say that I don't, okay, I will be using now single quotes, okay? And I will say, I don't know any programming language. Now, if I try to print this, you just say name and let's see what exactly is going to return. So just focus only the last one. Okay, this is the previous output that's fine. You just focus on the last output. So you can see it still works. So in double quotes, you can mention single quotes as well and it will accept. But you cannot do the reverse process. It means if I just say, okay, this and this. So when you do in this way, right? Now, Python will get confused because you are ending one string here, but you're not starting a new string from here so when you have a single code in between the strings always go with the double quotes at, at the starting okay and uh, double quotes in the end in between you can have the single code that is acceptable perfect let's see the new things okay another example so let's say i want to have double quotes in the output so right now i showed you the single uh, code right what if i want double quote so let's say i have another string and this string i will say automation or let's say any programming language okay so what i will say uh, let's say i want double quotes also as part of my output and this time let's say if i say uh, python and i want this also an output so how can i do that if i say this and if i say programming okay it says invalid syntax so what you can do if you want to have double quotes as an output now you can use escape sequence so if you say one backward slash okay and one backward slash here so what it will do it will escape this particular double quote okay now it will not consider this as a string it will escape this so now the moment you run this time you will see python in double quotes can you see this because this time you have used one backward slash before double quotes it will skip and same we did here so this is one of the escape character that we have used let me show you two more interesting uh escape sequence that we are going to use and they are very frequently used i hope it is clear so what i will do i will just do control c and let me do control v and this time i will say string demo 2 so that you will have reference for all the examples definitely i will be sharing all these examples in the description or i will upload on my blog you can go ahead and refer but i would highly recommend you try from your end because it's very easy it is just you need to write the strings 
okay so let's create another string and this string i will give as let's say name again and in double quotes i will say i know python so if i use one scape sequence called slash t so what t represent here it means tab okay so let me let's say i have a string like this i know python and if i simply print this and name and let's right click string demo 2 and you can see it says i know python is coming since i don't have any space in between so it is printing as it is what if i say one backward slash and t okay this time if i just right click or run or i can use this uh, this run button and you can see right now it created a tab now same thing if i want to show you for another one so let me just copy paste and this time uh, i will use an n means new line okay so let's run this run from here so you can see the i know is coming first then after this we are saying new line so this python is coming from the new line okay so forward uh, backward slash t for tab backward slash n for new line and we simply use one backward slash it is escape character it will escape the next character okay and in case let's say i don't want both the output i don't want these one so i can use a comment here so you can see if i use hashtag and hashtag again it will add this as a comment and python will not execute this statement okay so this time if i simply execute you can see it says i know python okay i hope it is clear so what if i want to use both yes you can do that so let's say again if i remove everything and if i run it says i know python so first time i will say slash t then i will say slash n backward slash t backward slash n and if i run this time it's i then tab no new line python okay quite easy now let's have a few interesting methods which is again built-in methods in a string class okay so before we move ahead i just want to show you a type method again so this type method we have used multiple times in the last lecture right so this time let's say i want to know the type of this name which is nothing but string right so this will definitely give me what kind of variable i'm using so i will be adding this in a print method so this time i will say print and i will use type method and i will be using name so it should return me what exactly the type is and you can see it's a str as i mentioned earlier it is represented by str and each data type in python is a class okay straightforward let's create another class and we'll see a couple of bintel methods so this time i will say string demo 3 and here we go okay so let's create a string this string i will give as a normal sentence so you can say s-e-n-t you can give any name and this time i'm going to write a small string and this string will be i love so let's use the first method from the string again you can go in any order at least just i'm starting from the one random order but you can practice these methods in any order okay so let me show you first method called length method so if i want to calculate the length of this string so i can call length which is l e n and i will simply provide the string here and first time if you see right now when i click on run it is still referring to my old configuration which is string demo 2 what if i want this configuration to come here so first time i have to run from here then this string demo 3 will come then i can continue with this okay so first time when you run your program just right click run from here and then you can continue with this button okay so you can see it is giving 13 so let's see this is one now again one thing to notice when you call the length method it also includes the white spaces okay so one two three four five six again white space so seven 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Okay, so output is 13. It means length method is working fine. Now, in case if you want to know the documentation, how exactly this method is working, or what is the definition, and what exactly it will return, I will show you how you can do that. But let me show you a couple of more methods, and then I will show the documentation. So again, in the next statement, again, I will be calling print, and this time I will say name, which is nothing but our variable. Then let's say I... 
okay so actually it's a sentence and this time if i say i need the index so you can actually get the index of a specific character so let's say i need the index of l so if i just say index of single quotes or double quotes l it should return me the index so if you see the output index is 2 because 0 1 and 2 right perfect what if i want index of i okay zero but what if i give some and any other value or the character which does not even exist okay in that case it will simply give you one value error called substring not found okay so python is smart enough it will give you exactly error what kind of error you're getting so you just need to focus what exactly we're getting so in our case it says simply says substring not found which is fair enough so i will go ahead and i will just get p means python p and if i want the index i got the index as 7. now let's do one more thing again i will say i want to replace p with j because we also have c python we have jython we have python so let's say i want to replace j or i want to replace p with j which is jython so again i will say sentence dot replace so what i want to replace i want to replace python p with j which is jython now this time when i execute you can see i got jython it means you're using replace method you can replace the characters or you can replace the series of characters as well okay so let's say i want to replace py with jk okay this sentence will not make any sense but still i want to show you that it can replace series of characters as well yeah we get to know what exactly each method is doing so first of all the moment you say that string dot you will get all these methods right but in case if you want the uh, the documentation of this okay you just first of all let's say i want to explore about the split method that we haven't discussed now okay so in case if you want to know the documentation just press control from the keyboard and put mouse over and click on it so you can see we got one file called builtins.py file and here you will get the documentation of that particular method okay so whatever methods we will be using you will find everything within this file so i would highly recommend you to watch uh, this file and understand what exactly the methods is returning what exactly they're doing okay so since i'm covering anyways these frequently used methods you don't need to worry but still i would highly recommend you to read the documentation because it will also give you additional methods that we cannot cover in this video right so let me show you what if i simply split this so again i will call print and this is my sentence and this time i will say i want to split when i want to split the moment i get let's say p i want to split the string so i will say single quotes p and again i will give capital p and let's execute this okay so you can see now it has divided my complete string into two part and it is returning me a list so you can see this is a list and don't worry we did we did not discuss about the list till now in the next lecture we are going to talk about list dictionary tuple set in detail but you can see this is one part before p this is the one part right and after p this is the second part so this is coming as a list and then we can get any value from that list let me show you another split again i will say print this is my sentence and this time i want to split with space right because i have two white spaces just after i and just after love so it will actually give me a, again a list so you can see i love python so these are actually three records we got and these records are coming in a list perfect now apart from that we have so many methods i want you to explore but quickly i will cover other methods as well and it's quite easy to predict the outcome if i want to convert my string into uppercase i will say upper if i want to convert my string into lowercase i will say lower yeah and in case okay let me just run it first and you can see it is in uppercase it is in lowercase now i just want to create a line between so let me just put star so that we can see the modules now 
this is first part second part so this time if I say uh, let me just change this string and this time I will just say I small L small and P small okay and again I will say print sent which is sent sentence and this time if I say title okay and just run this okay so you can see the output right so the moment you put mouse over and press control from the keyboard so it says it returns a version of the string where each word is title cased okay so this is how the title method works apart from this also we have swipe case we have is lower is upper we have a couple of other methods which will return you true and false let me show you three more methods if i say is this can you say is and we have a couple of is method like is title is space is printable numeric lower digit decimal ascii it's up to you i will be using two three more so remaining you can explore so is this lower complete string is lower yes right so the moment i execute and we got true and if i just call the other method which is opposite of this method if i say send dot is upper which is definitely not right because all are in small so it will give you false so let me cover the last method of this lecture called count so if i want to calculate if i say send dot count i need to provide which character i want to count okay so let's say i want to count how many times o is coming so in single quotes or in double quotes i can provide o and it should return me the count but the moment you run this and you can see we got the count what if i say some more thing let's say o twenty. so this time we have one more o so this time it should give me count as three and it's working so see the beauty of python for each and everything we have very handy methods you don't need to write much code everything is available as part of methods you just call these methods you will get the result and you can continue with your complete program right now if you understand this part let's talk about the indexing and slicing or maybe let's talk about the format method which is very useful and we have to use this almost every single day the moment you start working with real applications okay so let me close everything i hope it is clear now in case if you have any questions you can let me know in the comment section so maybe i will quickly create another python file and this time i will give string demo4 now let's assume that i have one variable called name and this time okay let's call python okay and now if i want to print this I will say I know and we used to say this one right that I know Python so right click and it says I know Python so this is how we used to concat right one string is fixed I have another string I used to call the plus operator and it we used to do the concat operation but now let me show you a format method and let me show you how this format method works so if I say name dot format or maybe first i will create another string and i will say uh, my language and in double quotes first of all i will say i know and i will use curly braces open and close okay and then i will say dot format method and here i will be calling name okay let's let's comment it out first of all and here I will say I know Python so what exactly it will do it will replace Python words with this okay so this curly braces will be replaced with this particular string so if you want to see the output just okay sorry we haven't done the print statement yeah so I will simply say print and I will say my lang, which is my language and just execute so you can see exactly it has replaced Python from this curly braces. What if I want to write something? Let's say Java. Again, execute, and you can see it is getting replaced. So, what if I want to? Okay, instead of hard coding, what if we have some variables and you want to assign some variables? We can do that. So, instead of hard coding this one, I can just provide the variable and this will be replaced. 
So what if I have multiple variables? Can we replace multiple variables? Yes, definitely. So let's say if I say this is my first language. Okay, I hope you understood this. So anyways, I can comment this time. And this one, let's say I will say I know Java. What if I say I want to have multiple curly braces? Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. It is just you need to pass the same number of arguments here. For example, I want to replace the first one with Java, second one with Python. Okay, since we are doing Python series, let's keep Python at first. Then I will have Java. Then I will add one more string called let's say JavaScript. So Python will be replaced here. Then Java will be replaced at the second index. Sorry, it's a 0, 1, 2. Okay, so this is first, second, third. But when it comes to index, it's 0, 1, 2. So this time when I simply run this, you can see it all got replaced. I know Python, Java and JavaScript. What if I want to change the order? Okay, you can just change the order and the same will be reflected here. Now, if you don't want to do in this case, we can also provide the indexes because by default internally Python is handling this with the help of index. For example, if I just say this is zero, this is one, this is two, which is internal. This is how it is happening. But still, just to show you, it is printing. I know Python, Java and JavaScript. But what if I say I want JavaScript first, then Java and keep Python at last. Will it work? Yes. You can see since this was zero, this was one, this was two. So I just said two, one and zero. So this is also supported in Python that you can pass the index and you can continue. Now there's one more variation which exists and which uh, you will see in most of the cases. What if I just replace this with key value pairs? Okay. So sometimes index, passing index 0, 1, 2 is not that handy because sometimes you need to remember. Right now you can see total values are 3. So it's easy for us to remember that 0 stand for Python, 1 stand for Java and 2 stand for JavaScript, right? But when you have a huge uh, number of values, then it will be a little tough for you to remember this indexing. In that case, you can have the keys. So let me show you how it works. For this, let me create another uh, string. Okay, I can reuse the same uh, variable because of dynamic typing. Here this time I will say, I know curly braces, curly braces, okay, curly braces. And this time I will say format. So instead of giving direct value, this time I will be assigning some key and then value. Okay, so let's say for Python, I will say P and then Python, when I say P, it will represent Python now. Okay, J will represent JavaScript sorry java now so i will say java and js will represent javascript okay or you can you go ahead with single quotes double quotes i will continue with single quotes so that we can have the uni uniform code yeah so instead of giving index i can now simply give that i know p for python and we have j for java and js for javascript right and now this time if I print, you will see, we will get the same output, but this looks okay. So you can see, right? It is not two times Java. It is just because of this. It's saying, I will say Java underscore script. Now this is actually making little sense. Now, instead of giving the index, I can give the key and this key is associated with value. Yeah, it's clear now. Just last sentence, which I want to highlight that make sure that you have the same number of arguments. So in case, let's say I add one more. Okay. And in the format method, I'm only passing three. Will it work or not? Let's see. The moment you run this, it will say index out of range because it is expecting one more that you have not passed. So if you see the output, right, this is not getting fulfilled. So actually in the format, we have provided three but it is expecting four. So make sure you get the exact number of um, argument in the format method. Okay, now the last thing before we end this video and this is going to make this task again more easy. 
so again let me copy this and paste in my folder or our project so now we are string demo 5 okay so let's see the next thing called f strings or we can call this as a formatting string literals okay so let me show you one example first then you will get the clarity what exactly we are doing so till now what we did in order to add two strings we did concat operation using plus then we use format method right now i'm going to show you a new thing called f strings so if i say my name is name okay so i'm trying to get this value which is equal to mukesh but i'm giving in double quote so definitely it's a string right so the moment i say right click run is you can say it is printing as it is because it is in double quotes so is there any way that we can get this value yes you just need to type f here okay and now you can see it has changed the color coding now it is replacing this with actual value the moment you run this you will see the output now you can see it says man miss mukesh and if i say any programming language so let's say if i create another programming language in this case i will say i know python what if i want to replace here so i will say and i know program which is nothing but python so you can see i can have multiple strings and it will be replaced with f strings the moment i run this you will see this is getting replaced here and this is getting replaced here so this is actually quite easy so this is little handy okay when it comes to format methods again you need to remember the indexes you can assign the key but here we have direct variables that variables we can assign into our string and we can use it right okay so i hope it is clear now so we discussed about what is string how we can do the call cat operation we discussed about the couple of methods we discussed about the escape sequences and now the very important part called indexing and slicing okay so let me show you indexing and slicing but before we move to indexing and slicing you need to understand the basic thing which is again indexing here so let's say if i'm writing a string called python so internally these string will be represented by individual characters right so p will stand like if i say python so each character is having an index since index start with zero so we'll say p with zero y with one t with two h with three o with four and n with five and good thing about python it it also supports the negative index okay so again n will start with minus one minus two and it will continue till the beginning of the string so this is very important in order to understand the indexing and the slicing part very easy so let me go back to our pycharm and this time i will be creating a separate python file and this time i will say slicing demo maybe we'll call indexing and slicing both okay okay so let's start with indexing then we'll move to slicing they looks a little technical term but they're literally very easy so let's say i have again a sentence called sentence and this time i will say that i or i will say python is very easy the moment i say print method if i say sentence if i say zero so what does it mean that i'm expecting or i need the first character of this particular string the moment i right click run you can see i got p if i want the second one i can go with one and i will be getting answer as y so in this way we can get any character from this string now let me show you one interesting fact here that if i say 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 so 6 is basically a void space okay so if i say 6 the moment i run this you will see blank output but it's not a blank output it's actually it's printing the space which anyways we cannot see right now right so basically space is also considered now let's see some other interesting fact okay what if i need the last character of this string okay so one way is i can count okay zero one two three and i can do that but what if i don't want to actually uh, you know get the i don't want to count the index of the last character 
so i can say this is my sentence and i can actually give minus one because as i discussed right i can use minus one in in case if i want the last character the moment i run this this time i will get y let me just use it five so that at least we'll get some output yeah so you can see i got y because we are coming in a reverse order what if i say minus two will it work yes it will work for sure and we got as this time right so this is how you can give the indexing you can get the index okay and whatever index you will provide you will get the value now let's talk about the slicing okay in order to explain the slicing part now i will be using another string this time and this time again i will use the name variable and i will say my name is mukesh and this time i want to do the slicing part so first of all i will say name then i will say start with one which is okay y or maybe we'll say start with index two colon till the end let's see what it prints okay maybe we can comment this because this is not needed now yeah to colon it will print till the end and it's saying name is mukesh perfect but now i only want this name okay which is actually this one so if i say i want to start from two which is this right and i want to go till e so two three four five but if i use one more which is six let's see the output so i have to give the six now you get the proper out output so now you must be wondering why because the last index it is the stopping one it will not count this one it will stop at six position so basically what it will do it will start from two but it will stop at six so in our case zero one two it will start from n and we have told till six so three four five six so it will stop at six, but it will not consider this. This is a small thing which you need to remember here. Okay, otherwise you will always get confused. So it will start is same, but when we talk about end, it will not include that particular index here. Okay, sometimes it gets tricky. So let me create another example, then it will be very clear. So let's say another string this time, and this string I will say Python is very easy let me use the same example i will say print i just want to print is okay so first of all i will say name now in the bracket let's start so 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 i want to start from the sixth okay colon 7 8 because I want is so I have to go till 8 then only I will get this start with 6 okay which is this 7 8 so 8 will not be included here so it will go till s so I will say 6 colon 8 now you just see the output this output I will comment otherwise you will get confused so just run it once and you can see we got the output called is so this is how this works so the last thing we need to talk about the step okay let the default step count is one but if you want to change the step count we can do that let's go ahead and use that so i will say start uh, i will be using this name and then i will say start with zero go till the end and the step count is two okay so if you don't give zero also it's by default assumed right so we can go in this manner also now earlier count was one but this time it is two so you can see the output now it is starting with p which is fine then it is going to t then o then i then v then r right and it goes from e, uh, like e and y because step count was two if i just change it to three you will see the output will be different and this time it's starting with p expected but now it is skipping yt and it's starting from h right then it is skipping o and starting with i and so on so this is how you can change the step count 
now the last thing which is frequently asked interview questions okay how do you reverse the string so if I ask you the same thing like can we do that so if I just give colon colon and this time if I give the step count as minus one will it work let's see so I will comment these because we have seen the output now let's see this so it has reversed my order okay because I have given step count as negative number so what it will do it will actually it should start from here right one two three and four when we say reverse count so it actually starting from here or I will say it jumped from here to here then it is doing like this okay when you say minus one so now the step is in negative so it's jumping directly from here and it is going in this way so if I say minus two will it work yes it will work but this time it will be again the reverse order but step count will be two okay so you can play with this uh, I will try to create a couple of exercises and I will let you know in the next videos but in case if you find any issue during string let me know in the comment section and we will discuss many things about string in detail once we move it okay so this is what I had for today so I hope you enjoyed this session if you are new to this channel then please hit the like button subscribe to my channel share with your friends and if you find any issue in Python uh, any issue related to string or any other thing in Python let me know in the comment section you can also mail me to my email ID which is mukesh one at the red learn hyphen automation.com and uh, I will try my best to reply okay thank you so much guys have a nice day bye bye Today in this video we are going to talk about very interesting topic from python called list okay so in the previous lectures we discussed about the string in detail so today we'll talk about the list and what exactly is list before jumping into technical part let's talk about what is list so the moment we say list right uh, what things come into the mind let's say i have a list of friends i have a list of phone numbers i have a list, list of documents so when i say list, it means collection of values or objects okay so if you are working with single thing then you can definitely go with the single variable but the moment you have more than one values definitely you need a collection right so we'll talk about list in detail so let me show you what exactly we are going to talk in this video we'll talk about how to create a list how we can manipulate the list so we will be discussing about couple of methods from the list which will be like append insert remove pop sort reverse and expand and etc so stay till the end of this video and i will be discussing so many useful methods that you will be using in your day-to-day -day life and now since list also have the indexing and slicing because it's a collection right it's the ordered number of collection of values so we can perform indexing we can also perform slicing so indexing and slicing already we discussed in the string video as well same concepts we can apply in the list as well and finally we'll also talk about what if we have list of lists so we'll talk about how we can create list inside another list again going to be very interesting so list is collection of values or i will say object because everything in python is an object okay so it list is dynamic in nature it means you don't need to provide the exact count let how many values you want to store in the list you can provide n number of values and it will pick up these values dynamically you don't need you don't have any size restriction in list now list can have any type of values okay so let's say if i want to create a list of students i can have list of strings let's say i want to create list of marks i can create a list of marks but what if i want to create a list of different type let's say i want to store my name my phone number my address my salary and all those details i can store into a single list list is again indexed so in case if you want to provide any index number we can provide so let's say i have 10 values if i say list of zero list of one and so on i can easily get the values with the help of index that's very important and very important part now list can have duplicate elements as well okay so let's say if i'm storing my name three times it will accommodate and it will give you all three values but when it comes to set it does not allow duplicate value that we will see in the next lecture but in this lecture let's focus on the list okay so don't worry about these uh, you know points which I highlighted I will show you with with the help of examples one by one now let's talk about syntax how we can create a list in Python it's damn easy you don't need to provide any keyword as such you just say bracket 
you provide the values okay value one value two and so on and it will create a list for you and when it comes to how do we access you just say list uh, whatever name you are giving okay and you can traverse with the help of index or you can get the values with the help of methods for example let's say I want to create a list of students marks I can say 10 20 30 and so on but if I want to create a list of different type I can also provide in this manner okay so let me show you one by one and the different methods that we have in list so I will switch back to PyCharm and let me create a Python file and this time I will say it's a list demo one okay we got the list so let me create a list and I will be storing this list into list one and let me create one list called 10 comma 50 comma 60 comma 90 my list is ready if you want to see just print list and just execute this program and you will see your list is ready can you see this 10 50 60 90 and one thing which you have to notice it is in a proper sequence like I have given 10 50 60 90 and it is giving the output in the same manner so if you want to see what exactly is the type of this list so just say type this type method we already discussed in the previous video and this type this time I want to say uh, let me give a list one here so that we can have multiple lists now and you can see list is actually represented by list and somehow that is the reason I renamed my variable name to list one because I don't want to use the same name which already is available in Python as as I mentioned in my previous videos every data type in Python is a class so list is also a class in Python yeah perfect now let's create another list and this list will have a different values so if I say that I want to store first of all my name so I will give my name as a string then I want to store a number then I want to store a floating value let's say integer and float and let me also store a boolean value which is true or false now if I try to print this again you will see I will get the same values which I am storing here okay and you can see again it preserve the order and it can contain different type of values as well perfect now let me show you how we can calculate the length okay so just say print and you just call one method called length and I want to get the length of list 2 so ideally it should give me count as 4 because we have 4 values within list 2 and you can see we got the value as 4 Okay. now what if I want to add list 1 and list 2 is there any way to do that yes so you can concat the two list as well with the help of plus operator okay so if I say I have a list 3 that will be the result of list 1 plus list 2 and if I print this list 3 again okay and you can see we got the combined output so the first list is 10 50 60 90 which is here and another list which is Mukesh 10 12 dot 9 and true which is here so I got the combined list and if I want to see the length of this again I will call length and I will say list of 3 and you will get the output perfect 4 for 4 plus 4 is equal to 8 so we have total list is 8 now let's see how we can do the indexing and slicing part okay so again I don't want to create so many uh, examples here so let me create another class and I will say list demo one copy and I will paste here and I will name this is list demo two you can continue with the same program it is just uh, I want to create a different files for the different examples so that I can share these files with you and you can practice so the next thing is let's say again I will create list one and this list have some values okay so let's say 12 78 that's 89 78 any random value it's just for your example I'm taking some random values but in real times you will get the actual values these values might come from your uh, application form maybe from your automation or maybe from any source so now let me see first of all this list okay so now I'm going to use this list one and the moment I put dot operator you will see the different methods that we have right so we'll talk about these methods now but as I said let's talk about the indexing and slicing so if I just use bracket 0 you will see okay so it is actually picking the list one let me right click and run this first 
then it will tick list demo two and now I can continue. Yeah, so when I right click, sorry, when I run this, I get the output as 12 because I'm only referring to index zero. What if I say index three, which is zero, one, two, three. So in this case, it should give 90. Perfect. What if I give some index which does not exist? So let's see what exactly the output. And this time it is going to say index error. And if you see, it says index out of range. Okay, so make sure you get the exact index which exists, otherwise you will get this index error always. Makes sense? Now, what if I want to get the last value? Again, I can say minus one, so it will start giving us the value in the reverse order. So when I say minus one, it should give me 90. Let's run this and you can see we got the 90. What if I want the second last? I can go with minus two, minus three and minus four and I will get the respective value. This is how easy it is in Python to work with the list. You can just get the index. Okay, so you can get the index in the forward and reverse both. Now, let's say I want to have some duplicate values. As I mentioned, it can have duplicate values, right? So this time, if I want to print again, if I simply say list one, you can see I got the duplicate values as well. I have given 93 times and I'm able to see three times. It means list allowed duplicates. But hold on. We also sometimes need to see how many 90s in my list. How can I do that? Okay, there are two ways. Either you can write a custom logic or you can create or call a direct function call dot count. Okay, so you can see it will ask you which element you want to search for the counting. In my case, I will say 90. So let's see what it returns. And it says 90 is coming in our list thrice. Okay, so count is three. What if I give some value which is only coming once? In our case, if I give 12, the count should be one, right? And what if I give some value which does not even exist? In my case, if I give triple seven, let's see what it returns and it says zero. Okay, so just remember count will not throw any error. It will simply give you zero because it's just doing the calculation, right? Now, when it comes to this was the indexing. Now, what if I say slicing that I want zero till the end, or let's say I want to start from 89 till the last. So I can say, if I say zero colon, okay, we need to give the list, right? List. If I say zero colon, if I don't give the end part, so definitely it will start from zero index and it will go till end. Maybe I will comment this now. And you can see it is starting from zero ending with 90, which is the last value. But what if I want to start from the first index, which is from 89, because this is zeroth index, this is first. So I want from first index till the last. You can see it now it is getting from 89 till 90. What if I want the sub list? Okay, so I only want 89 78 and 90 how can i do that i will say start with zero sorry start with one two three and four so if you remember in my last lecture i told this is actually the stop counter it will not include the fourth one it will only include till the three so you can see it is giving me the value okay just to make it little clear i will add few more values here let's say 45 and 34 in this case if I say one to four, it will start one, two, three, and four, but it will not include the fourth one. It will only go till 90. In that case, you will get, get only this one. Yeah, let's do it one more time. This time I will say five. So it should also include 45 this time. Yeah, so whatever indexing and slicing we have discussed in the last video in detail, I would highly recommend you to watch that previous video and apply each and every concept here. So you have seen how to work with list and uh, how we can do the indexing and slicing. Now we discussed about the count method. Let me show you a couple of more methods which will actually going to help you a lot. Yeah, I hope it is clear now. So this is my list one, right? In the list of in list one zeroth index, I have 12th value. What if I want to replace? Can I replace that? Yes, you can do that. So let's say if I go till zeroth index and this time I say that I want to replace with triple six. And now if I say print, 
list one and simply run this and now you can see the earlier list was 1289 78 ending with 90 and then we replaced with triple six so now our list is modified with the value so this is possible in list you can actually you know overwrite the values the reason why i showed you this example because once you move ahead you will see a different classes which does not allow modifications okay now let's talk about few additional methods so if i say list one dot let's talk about the first method called append so what exactly append will do it will append your value at the end of this list so list one if you see right now it is ending with 90 90 right so if i just give value as triple eight and if i simply print my list again okay let me comment this okay i'm just commenting this so that you should not get confused with the output in case if you don't want to comment just focus on the last result that you're getting and you can see it got appended at last very easy method is it necessary that I can only append the integer values? Not exactly. You can give any value of your choice. In my case, let's say I will give Mukesh. And if I execute this, you can see it appended at last. Clear now? What if I say list one again? And this time if I say append again, list one dot append. And this time if I say Python. And now let me print this list again and let's run this i will just comment this part and you can see we got python as well so this is how you can append the value at the last with the help of append method but the question comes is there any way that we can append or we can insert any value in between with the help of indexes yes there's a way so to do that you just need to say list one and now there's one method called insert so what exactly it will ask you it will ask you give me the index and give me the value okay so in our case if we see index uh, zero is having triple six but i want to insert another value so i will say zeroth index and i want to replace with uh, triple five now just print this list again and let me comment this one and can you see triple five is inserted at zeroth index and now all the values have been shifted let's try one more time this time again i will say list one dot insert and this time again i let me change at 89 so this is zeroth this is one this is two so i want at second index replace this with 444 and again if i print the list one let's comment this out can you see it inserted 444 at second index so how easy it is to insert at the last using a pen method if you want to insert at a specific uh, you know index you can do that with the help of insert now let me show you a few additional methods and again they are same very easy you just need to call the methods and you're good to go so again what i will do i will just create a copy right click sorry simple click and paste here and this time i will say list demo 3 yeah so i will just remove everything because these things we already discussed now let me show you another method called pop so as the name says pop okay but hold on before move to the pop i also want to show you one additional method called extend so let's say this is my list one i will just remove it and let me create list two this list two will have simple uh let's say two values mukesh and let's say otwani and let's say one more value called python so with the help of let's make it list two so with the help of insert i was able to insert the value at a specific index so now let me extend this okay so what i will do i will try to add list one and in the list one i will add the list two values so i will be using one extend method and in this extend method i will be passing list two okay so it will actually extend my list one the moment i say this time list one okay so list one actually have four values what i'm doing 
at line number four that I'm extending this list with list two, which actually have three more values. So if I simply write first, let me right click and run. And you can see this was list one and this is the list two. So this is how you can extend list one with another list. Now there's also a small catch here. So what this cat says, let's say if I have a st string here, okay. And this time, let me say list one dot extend and let me give list three here. Okay. And you just notice the output and I will tell you what is happening. So just comment this one and just observe the output. Okay, so it is not returning anything actually. So we need after extend, we just need to simply print the list one because extend will not return you anything. So it will actually extend our list one. So instead of printing the same line, once this operation is done, we need to again print the list one and just notice the output this time. Can you see list three had Mukesh as a string but when I'm extending with list one, it is actually appending characters by characters. The reason is a string is a iterable. Okay. So whenever you up, uh, extend any list with a string, it will actually append character by character. Okay. So you can see this example. So just keep this point in mind. You might get this question in interviews as well. Or maybe when you start giving some online exam, you might get this question. Okay. So this is what one behavior, which I wanted to highlight. Clear? Now let's see, we have seen uh, append method, we have seen insert, extend. Now let's talk about the pop methods. Pop method, as the name says, it will remove the values from the list. So if I use the same list, just comment this. And if I say list one dot pop. So pop method, when I don't give any index, okay, just notice the output this time we have H at the last, right? The moment I say pop and again, if I print list one, can you see the last value from the list has been removed earlier it was Mukesh and now it has been removed H. Now what if I, let's use a normal string. Okay. So that you can understand the difference. This time I will say list two dot pop. So in this case, it should return or uh, it should remove Python from this list two. Okay, if I print this list two again, okay, perfect. It is returning Python and we have only two. So now we can also pass the index in the pop method. It means let's say I have three values, zero, one, and two. What if I want to remove Otwani from this list? So which is first index, if I say pop one, and again, if I print this, you will see it will return the list with removed item. So, okay, so pop, if you don't give it, it will only remove from the last, but if you give a specific index, yeah, it will remove from that particular index. But what if you give some index which does not even exist as usual, you will get error, which is index error. So it says pop index out of range. That will be same for all the cases, right? Now, is there any way that let's say you don't know the index. Okay. Uh, as of now, since it's a small list, you have three values, you can easily remember zero, one, two, but what if you have a huge list and in that list, you want to remove one element or let's say one value or object, how you will do that. And if you don't know the index, but you know the value. So is there any way in Python where we can remove the value from the list with the help of value? So answer is yes. So there is one method called, okay. Okay. Let me just comment this and this time. I will say list two dot list two dot remove. So what exactly is you can see it is asking you uh, you that give me a value this time. So if I give the value this time, uh, let's say Mukesh. So it will search that value within that list. If that exists, it will remove. So again, we are printing after removing and you will see this time we got Otwani and Python. So again, if you want to remove, let's do it one more time. List two dot remove. Now, since we have two values, which is Otwani and Python, this time again, I will remove Otwani from here. So again, if I simply say remove Otwani and print my list again, okay, you will get 
only one value which is python so i hope it is clear now it's very easy just call these methods so now let me create another class and in this class i will be talking about the last two methods and very important concept here so this time i will say list demo 4 and i will remove this additional list which is not required i will only have the list one in the list one i already added few values okay so which is you can see now it is uh, starting with 12 ending with 2 okay the reason why i added more elements because i want to show the short method now the moment i say list one okay let me print this list first i will say list one then i will call list one dot short okay and after shorting again i will print this so let's say list one and let's right click run it first so you can see this was our actual list which was starting with 12 and ending with 2 right but the moment i call short method it is actually giving me a ascending order shorting and it is giving me the value right now if i want to show you one additional method called reverse so list one dot reverse and this time when i print list one you will see it will give you the values in reverse order okay so now okay so it is actually reversing the last string okay so after shorting we got this list right 2 3 8 12 so when i call the reverse method it applied reverse method on this and now you're getting 90 89 and 78 55 44 and so on so if you don't want let's comment this short method and let's comment this as well so before reversing we are printing and after reversing again we are printing so it should start with 12 and 2 then after reversing it should start with 2 and end should end should be with 12 let's run it once again and here we go so this is how easy it is to do the shorting and reverse in list okay now the last topic can I create list of list or list of list of list? Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. So how can we do that? Let me show you. Let me create one list and I will call this as my list. In this my list, first of all, I will store some values. Okay. Now I want to store another list. So I don't have to say anything. Again, I can say brackets. And this time I can say Mukesh. And this time I will say Python. And this time if I say selenium okay so this is my list if I try to print this list again okay you will see all the values so let me just comment this so that you get only the one output and you can see we got the values which is 10 90 89 and this is another list so what if I want to access the first value it's very easy as we have seen just now I will say my list and I will say I need the first index right perfect what if I need this one so this is 0 1 2 and this is actually complete 3 the moment I say 3 this time you can see I got this value now what if I just need the second one so again I can do the indexing here since this is also a list right so again I can do the indexing so if I say 0 it should give me Mukesh but if I give 1 it should give me Python so let's run it again if you don't want just comment this and you can see we got the Python so if you have one more list yes you can do that but again you need to follow this indexing you can just call your list again sub list and so on so this is how it works in Python again we have few more operations and I will also show you the different traversing ways in list but not in this video maybe in some other video i hope it is clear now in case if you have any query any question related to list let me know in the comment section today in this video we are going to talk about set in python so in the last lecture we already discussed about what is list and how we can work with the list so today we'll talk about the set and we will also talk about the difference between list and set okay so let's get started so what exactly is set so set is also a collection of values it means you can have different type of values in the set now again you can call either as values or elements or object doesn't matter it can have collection okay 
it is also a dynamic in nature it means you don't have any size restriction you can have n number of values so you can create set of a specific type or different type as well okay so just like we did in list right we created list of integers string we can also have a list of different type in a same way set can also have values of different types as well so once we move ahead i will create different type of set and i will show you now one important point that you have to notice here that set does not have any index okay so you cannot have the indexing in set which means you cannot do the indexing you cannot do the slicing as well which we were able to do in list and strings so just keep this in mind set does not have any index approach and another very interesting and unique feature of set is it does not allow or it cannot have the duplicate element but when we talk about list so list have the duplicate element so the difference if you talk about list have the index so we can do indexing and slicing set does not have index list allow duplicate set does not allow duplicate so now the question comes how we can create a set in python again very easy so there are two ways to create set in python so syntax one you can use curly brackets you can provide the values or elements or objects and it can create a set for you for example if you want to create a set you just say curly bracket and the values that you want to store in our case all values are of similar type integers so you can have 10 20 30 if i want to create a set of different values or elements you can have integer float boolean and string as well just like this example i have 10 as integer mukesh as string and 190.0 as a float number there is another way to create a set so you can use a set constructor so within this set constructor you can actually pass a list or tuple okay so don't worry i will be talking about this now how we can create a set using set constructor right now we haven't discussed about tuple so we'll talk about the tuple as well just for the timing just focus on the syntax okay so let me show you through a program what is set and what are the different methods that we can do on set so let me create a new python file and this time i will say set demo one yeah so let me create first set and i will say a variable called my set so i will be using curly braces and let me store a few values let's say 90 89 76 or any value doesn't matter here okay and the moment i say print my set just right click run as and you can see we got the output right now we got the four values but if you see closely we don't have any proper order here right so the order which i mentioned was 90 89 76 1 2 but here the index or the sequence is totally different okay it does not have any index approach so it will give you in a random order so let me add few more values so that you can see the difference okay i will add two and i will get triple eight save this and run it again this time again you can see some different order it's a random order now now how can i add more values okay so before i add more values let me add some duplicate values so that we can come to the conclusion that does it support duplicate element or not so let me add 93 times and this time when i run my code again and you can see even though it is not giving any error but at runtime we are only getting unique value which is 91s okay so that's clear cut it does not allow any duplicate element perfect now let's see how we can add more values in this set so as usual we have an add method here so the moment you say add it will ask you add give me the element that you want to add in our case i want to add triple seven and then again i will print our set which is my set you can see this is the set before adding triple seven and this is again a uh, set after adding triple seven again one thing to notice we do not have any order where this triple seven will get added okay so it will add at the random places so what about removing then if i say my set dot pop will it remove from the last okay let's see can you see now earlier we had seven values right and we also had two the moment i say pop it removed one element but it removed at the random place okay ideally if you talk about a list when we used to call pop it used to remove from the last but in set when i say pop it is removing at the random places okay so just keep this point in mind now let's talk about again 
what if I want to remove a specific value because pop as I said it does not uh, remove value from a specific position right because it's random so what if I want to remove a specific value in our case let's say I want to remove triple it so using remove method I can give exact value which I want to remove and this time you will notice it will not have triple eight just observe this output and you can see this was the last output the moment I called remove triple eight now the triple eight has been removed okay so pop random remove a specific value but what if I give some value which does not even exist in our case I am trying to remove triple eight nine let's see it is going to throw you one error called key error because it is not able to find triple eight nine which is expected right but is there any way in set that I want to try if this exists then remove otherwise don't throw me any error okay so we have another method now called discard okay so I will comment this method okay and I will say this time my set dot discard so discard method is exactly going to do the same thing which he remove used to do it will remove but discard will not throw any error if that element does not exist so in our case uh, let's say I want to remove this time 89 which actually exists right the moment I run this you can see earlier we had 89 now after calling discard method we don't have 89 but what if I give some random value which does not even exist and just notice we are using discard let's see if that element does not exist it will not throw any error it will simply keep the set as usual okay so that is the big difference between remove and discard just keep this point in mind in interviews you might get this question what is the difference between pop remove and discard okay just one line difference but yeah it will help you a lot in your interviews what about the length method can we call the length method here yes you can do that so let's call print okay length of let's say my set so what should be the output output should be six right so let's run this and yes we got the output as six okay so this is few methods from the set let me create a copy of this and we'll discuss the few methods in the next file so i will create copy paste and i will say set demo 2 i will keep my list as it is and this time let me have few more values okay and this time i will say i am adding mukesh and i'm also adding one float value which is 90.0 so let me print this set first and I will say my set let's see what exactly it is returning first I will run this now we have my set demo 2 and now we can directly run from here perfect let's call a method called my set dot clear so what exactly clear method will do it will remove or it will clear the complete set so next time when you use this set you will have the blank set okay run it again so you can see this was before clear method and once you do clear it is only returning your set constructor it means this set is completely blank now okay so whenever you have to remove or uh, clear the set use the clear method now what if i say that i want to create copy of that okay and uh, then i will clear the first one so before clear what i will do i'm just showing you a new method okay my set dot copy so when you say copy it will create a copy of this set and this time I will say my set demo my set to okay it means I'm creating copy of this I will have the exactly same copy of my set into my set to then I will clear my set which we will print here then I will print my set to so this should have the clear value means completely empty set but this will have the actual set which we had here right let's run it because we created a copy of my set into my set 2 so my set 2 have all the values which is available here but my set is empty here right let's talk about what about the different ways to create a set so if you don't want to go in this way you can just type set okay and you can see set it is actually coming from built-ins which is nothing but a class so if I use this constructor and in this constructor if I create a list okay let's say one two three and four 
So what exactly it will do, it will actually create a set for me that I can store into some uh, set one and you will get the set ready. The moment I say set one, you will see we will get a new set here. Can you see one, two, three, four. Let me add few more values here. Let's say I have Mukesh here and let's say I have one more value 12.90. Yeah, if I run this, we got the set ready. So this is another way to create set. In the set constructor, you can either pass a list that we did now. Another way is using tuple. Okay, so if I say again, set and in the set if I create a tuple again don't worry about the tuple that we will discuss next so how we can create a tuple in parenthesis and now I can give value let's say I want to give values as Mukesh again then I will say Python then let's say I will add one more thing called Java and again let's say 78 90 and so on this will also create a set for me and this time I will store into set 2 and the moment I say set 2 this is my another set so basically we have set 1 which is created with list set 2 which is actually created with the help of tuple and here we go so you can see we got this so in case if you want to see some difference let me add either I can comment the previous print statement or in double quotes I will just create some kind of formatting here so just after formatting, we'll get this output. Yes, so this is formatting that we did. This is set one and this is set two. So this is how you can work with set. Don't worry, once you move ahead, we'll see technically how to use set, how to use list, how to use dictionary and tuples. But for the time being, just focus on the fundamentals, just focus on the methods which they have. Again, I have not covered all the method. These are the frequently used method that we use. But I would highly recommend set also have a couple of additional methods which you should explore from your end. Okay. So that's all I have for today. Today in this video, we are going to talk about dictionary in Python. So till now in our previous videos, we discussed about the strings. We discussed about the list and the set. Today we'll focus mainly on the dictionary part. Okay. So let's talk about what is the dictionary and how exactly it works. So first of all, dictionary is again collection of items, but here each item in the dictionary will be in a form of key and value pair okay just like map so whenever you have to provide any value make sure you associate with a key it is also dynamic in nature it means you can have n number of key value pairs the main thing which we need to notice here it is again like unordered just like set it is also in unordered form we don't have an index feature here so whenever you have to get any specific value you need to provide the key and you will get the value it is actually very interesting and very useful when you start implementing this in a real project. Okay, so we'll talk about how we can implement once you move ahead. Today we'll focus on the fundamentals part. So now the main point which you need to remember in dictionary is we will be having key and values, right? So key should be always unique. You cannot have duplicate keys, but when it comes to values, you can have the duplicate values. That's not an issue. And we will also talk about different ways of implementing dictionaries like I will talk about how we can create dictionary in different ways plus I will also show you how we can create dictionary inside another dictionary inside dictionary we will also create a list so our dictionary will have the key value pairs we will also have a list inside the dictionary because in real time you will not have the direct dictionary sometimes you will have the dictionary of list okay so we'll talk about this in detail one by one it's again very easy it is just you need to remember the syntax part let me switch back to pycharm and yeah before we move to pycharm let's talk about the syntax so the syntax will be you need to start with the curly braces okay so we need to provide key then colon and value this is one set okay it's not the set that we discussed in python it is just key value pair that i'm talking about put a comma again you can have again key value pair and so on so there's again no limitation it's completely dynamic you can have n number of key value pairs here for example I can have one dictionary where I have number which is one which is nothing but a key and the value is Python I have another set which is nothing but a key value pair where I have two and two will represent Java so whenever I have to fetch Java I will just say two and it I will get the value Okay, we'll talk about this in detail through program just focus on the syntax right now so in the first example I have taken integer as a key 
and value was as a string right but here i can also represent key and value both will be in a form of string so actually there's no type restriction you can have key value in any form okay now let's talk about the syntax to or another way of writing dictionary so here now you can use a dictionary constructor so as i mentioned earlier we can represent dictionary by dict it's a separate class so using dictionary constructor you can create a dictionary again okay so the syntax would be like this first of all you need to say dict in parenthesis you can give the key value pairs and it will create a dictionary for you it's very easy i will show you through examples but this is just a syntax you can have the first key value pair then comma another key value pair mm -hmm. and comma and continue and another syntax which you will see in most of the development projects that we can also create dictionary within a list and this list will have the tuples okay we haven't discussed about the tuples that is our next video but yeah for the time being tuples or tuples whatever you say we can create a dictionary within a list we have to pass number of tuples and these tuples will have the actual key value pairs okay so i will show you all these three syntaxes so syntax two have actually two parts uh, that i will show you and syntax one is very easy without using any dictionary constructor so let's see one by one i will start from the basics so I will go back to my PyCharm and let me create another Python file. So just right click and create new Python file. And this I will say dictionary demo one. Yeah, and our file is ready. Okay, so in order to understand this example, let's take any, you know, CRM application or let's talk about the real time situation that I have multiple teams in my office and each teams will have some team members, right? So if I want to create a dictionary that I want to call one person from team one, one person from team two, or uh, let's call this team as dev team, QA team or DevOps team. And I want to see how many employee or how many team members are working within that team. So I'm going to create a dictionary. So in dictionary, I will have the first key value pair. So the key, I will say QA team. In the QA team, I will say then there's one guy called Mukesh. And I will create another key value pair. So I will just Okay, first of all, it should be colon. Yeah. Then put a comma and let's create another key value pair. So this time I will say there's another development team. In this development team, there's one guy called Akash. And there's one more team called DevOps team. In this DevOps team, there's one employee called, let's say, John. Okay. So this is actually a dictionary. I want to store this into a variable. So let's say this variable is named EMP, which is employee. If I simply print this, let's just type print EMP and just right click run dictionary demo one and you will see we got the complete dictionary. So QA as Mukesh, Dev as Akash and DevOps as John. Now, if I want to fetch a specific value because when I say imp, which is employee, it is going to give me complete dictionary. But what if I want to fetch a direct name? OK, but before I move to the fetching the values or the names, let me just quickly print the type, okay? Because we want to understand what kind of, what is the type of EMP. The moment I run this, you can see it's a dictionary, which is again a class. So as I mentioned earlier, every data type in Python is a class. Clear? Now let's say I want to find a person who is into development team. So I can simply say print EMP, which is nothing but our dictionary. Now there are two ways to access the values from the dictionary. Okay. So the first one is in the brackets, you can just pass the key. So the key here is dev. So I will say dev. And the moment I run this program, you can see we got the output as Akash, which is associated to dev. Now, if I simply say DevOps, the moment I run this program again, you can see I got the value John. Now, what if I provide some value which does not even exist? Okay, so in our case, if I say that I am looking for a manager, some dummy value which does not exist, the moment you run this program, it will simply say that there's a key error because this key does not exist in our dictionary. So make sure you give the exact key which is available, otherwise you will always get key error. Perfect. So let's try to give some key which actually exists, in our case, QA, Dev or DevOps. So this is one way to access. Another way to access this is if I simply say print EMP, 
now i can call a method call get okay the moment you say get you can see k means key it is asking give me the key and i will give you the value in our case i will give the key as dev again and you can see we got the output as akash perfect so there are two ways either you can in the bracket you can give the key or you can call a predefined method called get and you give the value and you will so you provide the key and you will get the value now let me make few changes that will give more idea about dictionary so is it mandatory that i should have the same type of key value not required let's say i have another key value pair this time so i will say there is one security guard okay and now let me put some random value. Let me give some ID to this guy called 90. So you can see here we were passing a string, but this time I'm passing 90, which is again integer. Okay, now can I change the key? Yes, you can do that. So if I give key as 50 and the value for 50, let's say I can put as Python. Is it possible? Yes, you can see it is not giving any error because key values can be anything now. Now let me print this complete dictionary. Okay, and you can see we got the output as well. So this is the two key value pair that we added, right? And it is coming now. So the main concept here is you can have any number of key value pairs if any type. Now let me show you what if I create one dictionary and inside this dictionary, I want to have a list of values. Okay. so. If I take the same example in the development team or let's say in the QA team, one more person is joining. Okay. Let's say one person who is joining, let's say called Rahul or any value of your choice. So how can we do that? So what I will do, I will simply uh, copy paste this one. Okay. Let's have another dictionary this time i will remove this that was just for your knowledge purpose now let's say in this team two more people are joining okay so what i can do i can create a list here if you have not gone through my list video i would highly recommend in list in the bracket if we give n number of values it will create a list so i'm going to create a list here that in the qa team two new people are joining one is rahul and one is let's say david okay now you can say this dictionary will have key and this is the complete value this is one key this is value this is one key this is one value so let's say if i want to just want the first uh, key sorry the first value so if i simply say emp uh, in double quotes qa which is actually our key and if i simply run this you can see i got the complete value and this value is nothing but this record right now if you are familiar with list if you remember we can easily iterate the list with the help of index right so if i need the second guy in this qa i can directly say one because index start with zero so if i say zero here i will get mukesh if i say one i will get rahul and similarly i will get if i say two i will get david okay so let me just use it one which actually represent rahul and you can see from this qa which is nothing but a key we got the list of values from that list. I'm looking for Rahul. Okay. Now, if you find this little complicated, let me actually divide the statement into two part. So what I will do, I will just say employee one. First of all, I will say employee and I'm only looking employee from QA team. Okay. So let me just add a comment. So this EMP one is actually a list. So if I say print EMP one, I got the list right now from this list if I say I'm looking for the first one and you can see I got the first guy what if I get some any ran, uh, random index which does not even exist so as usual you will get the error called index error which is list index out of range which is common when you work with list yeah so this is a very good example and very interesting scenario which we use actually in our day-to-day -day life where one key will return you list of values and then once you get the list of values it's totally a list concept you can iterate it easily okay let's create another dictionary and guys give us special attention and this example this is very interesting and if you understand this you will understand most of the python programs so let's create another 
dictionary i will be using same emp because of the dynamic typing we can reassign the variable now i'm going to create same qa in the qa i have only one team member let's say mukesh but now in the development team so i will just create a key called dev now i want to create another dictionary is it possible yes so let's consider within the dev team again we have two type of developers or let's say three type of developers one is ui designer okay one is backend developer and one say let's say support guy or uh, let's create two categories backend and frontend so what i will do i will just put a colon as usual now i will start another dictionary here okay here i will say i have one front front end developer and this guy name is let's say raji any name and i will put comma again again i will say backend developer and backend developer again i will put colon and this guy name is let's say let me add some girl name let's say neha yeah now you can see we have a dictionary inside this dictionary i have a key called dev the dev is again having a value as dictionary so what if i want to access some values from the internal dictionary we'll see but just focus right now this is how we can create dictionary inside another dictionary now let's say i want to access so first of all let me use print i will say emp and i will say get okay you can use get or directly in brackets you can give any key let me give key call qa first so that we'll get to know whether we are going correct or not and let's comment these print qa okay you can see i got mukesh which is this value now let me add this dev and i got this another list so what if i want to access one value from this list again i have to provide the key right so let's say i want this guy okay which is a front end i will again say dot get and i will provide another key yeah so you can see we will get the value first of all it is going to this dev key then it will return you as dictionary from that dictionary again i'm looking for a specific key called front end and will get the value okay again in case if you don't want to go with this get method as i said earlier you can use brackets right and same thing you can do it here it's totally up to you because at the end of the day we are just fetching the value so both is acceptable okay sorry this dot is not required yeah and you can see we got the value i hope it is clear now so whenever you have to go in this way first get the key and pass into the get method or bracket you will get the value if this value is a list you can iterate using indexes but if this value is coming as a dictionary again you can use again get method or this bracket with the key now in case if you are getting confused with this syntax let me break down break down into two sentences what i mean first of all i will just comment them i will say emp dot get what i'm expecting i'm expecting a dev which is this and it should give me these values so i will just give as emp1 again and let me print this emp1 yeah we got the value from this emp1 i'm only looking for the backend so this time instead of printing i will say emp1 dot get and this time i will say i need the backend developer and this time i will get the actual employee name i will say emp underscore name so the final value should be emp name and let's run this and you will see the output as neha this time so this two sentences if you want to write into single statement it would be like this that from the employee dictionary i am looking for a developer and then i am also looking exact backend developer yeah i hope it is clear now so let's see couple of methods okay and we'll see couple of operation i would say so we'll see how we can add the values in the dictionary how we can update the value in the dictionary how we can delete the value in the dictionary and couple of more method so first of all let me add one more record into this dictionary which is emp 
so i will say emp and in the brackets i will provide one more key this time i will say manager okay and for manager whatever value you want to assign just provide the key and after equal to you just give the value okay so let's say for a manager i will just give a random name called xyz the moment now if i print you will see we will get the updated dictionary with this manager role as well yes yeah, so you can see we got another record got added into a dictionary called manager name you can give xyz here or any other value so this is how we can add the values in the dictionary but what if i want to update okay let's say i don't want to keep xyz here manager name let's say i want to have manager name let's say satya so what i will do in double quotes i have to provide the exact key which i want to update okay sorry exact value which i need to update so values are associated with the key right so this xyz value is associated with a key called manager so this time i will just give a satya and now the moment i run this dictionary again you will see right now it is xyz the moment i run this again and now this got updated to a latest value it means if you want to update you just provide the exact key and the value which you want to update it will update so we don't have any specific method here so in, in case if you want to add just give the new key value if you want to update provide existing key and with the new value but now for deletion we have a dedicated method here okay so what if i say emp dot pop so when you say pop actually we have two method here if you notice one is pop one is pop item and you see there's a, actually a difference between their parameters so the first parameter or the first method pop says give me the key and i will return the exact same value so in our case let's say i want to remove a qa guy the moment is a pop qa and this time if i simply print our updated dictionary just execute and you can see earlier we had qa right this time when i say pop qa it actually removed this key value pair so in the updated dictionary we don't have any key value pair with qa so pop will actually ask you which key you want to delete so there's another method which was coming right pop item so what this pop item will do let me show you emp dot pop item now let me just comment this because we have very limited set of values right so the pop item what it will do it will remove the item from last in first order okay so let me show the documentation of this so press control from the keyboard put mouse over and click on it so you can see it will give you the actual definition or what exactly this method is going to do so first of all it is going to remove and return a pair of tuple that's fine now main important point the pair that we will be getting from this method it will be in last and first out order and it will also throw you key error if the dictionary is empty okay so let me show you once again so before this pop item let me do a print of emp okay that anyways we are doing on top no need to do it again but yeah what we can do we can create a pattern here so that we will understand this is the new dictionary so I will say print emp before pop item this is our dictionary and just after pop item again I will pr try to print the dictionary and just execute and just focus here so as I showed you the documentation right it always remove in last in first order it means whatever record that you added at last we added manager satya right earlier manager was xyz then we used update then it became manager satya now since we call pop item it always return in or always remove the values key value pairs from last in first order basis so last record was manager satya now it is not there okay so there's a difference pop will ask you a specific key but pop item will always focus on the leaf or order just keep this point in mind you might get this in interviews okay so we already have so many examples in this python file so let me do one thing let me create another python file i will do control v dictionary demo 2 and let me just have only one 
dictionary which is emp okay let me remove everything guys all these examples i will be publishing on github so in case if you want to refer the same you can just go to github and you can download it okay so right now i have only two key value pairs let me add one more key uh, key value pair again i will add same key called manager and this time i will say let's say satya let's talk about some other methods first of all if i want to calculate the length i will just call length and the length i will just pass this dictionary which is emp and it should give me okay first of all we need to run this in this manner so you can see we got the total number of records in this dictionary is three okay so it will always return you the length based on the key value pairs that you have perfect second if i want to print or i want to know only the keys okay so in our case we have dictionary as emp i just want to have the keys so there's a method keys within this dictionary and it will only return me the keys which is qa dev and managers okay so you can see we got dictionary keys as qa dev and managers now what about the values let's say i just want the values so i can again say emp dot there's a predefined method called values so in this case it will only return you the values not the keys just execute it yes so this was the length for this then we call keys so we got this keys which is qa dev and manager now when i say values i'm getting values these values are these values okay for qa this for development we have this and for manager is this but what if you want key value pair both okay is it possible so yes python says we have one method called items now items will return you key and value pair both the moment you write uh, run your program you can see earlier we were getting keys then we got the values but this time we have dictionary items and one thing which you will notice here it will return you key value pairs in a form of tuples okay again we have not discussed about the tuples but just keep this point in mind that it will return you the values in a form of tuples or tuples i hope it is clear now so please explore these methods now let me show you a different syntaxes that i showed you right how we can create the dictionary using different ways so this is one way that we have seen now let's see that a different ways how we can create dictionary now I want to give one task to you or you can call this as an assignment or maybe you can explore this that how we can delete the values from the dictionary. Okay. So let me give you a small hint. The moment you say print emp dot. Okay. We don't have any delete method here. We don't have any remove. We don't have any discard. Now you need to find out how we can delete the dictionary's values. Okay. So when I say values, I am only looking for a specific key value pair, not the complete dictionary. Okay. So if you want to delete the complete dictionary, you can call the delete keyword that we have seen earlier. But what if I want to delete a specific key value pair? Is it possible? If yes, then how? If not possible, then what is the reason? I want you to find out and let me know your answer in the comment section. Okay. I will be waiting. But yeah, in case if you want to delete the complete dictionary, I can show you. So let's say I want to delete the complete dictionary called EMP. So what I will do before deleting, I will print this. And after deleting, again, I will be printing. Let's see what will be the output. So just to differentiate the output, what I will do, I will just create a formatting here so that we'll get to know that whatever values are coming after star is the last three one. So let's run this. So you can see we got this dictionary which is before deleting but after deleting we don't have anything and if you see after deleting we are getting one name error called name emp is not defined which means this dictionary has been deleted completely once you call the delete you cannot access this further not only with this dictionary the moment you call this delete you cannot access that variable at all okay but yeah i want you to find out is there any way to delete a key value from the dictionary if yes then how if not then why let's create another just give me two more minutes guys and this is going to be interesting and this will help you a lot if you're giving interviews as well because in interviews they will expect a different approach from you 
okay one approach is not enough okay so let's say syntax 2 first of all you need to let's say I am using same EMP even though it's a new file let's continue with EMP I will be using dictionary so you can see we have a dictionary class we are going to use dictionary class constructor here I can provide the key value pairs separated by comma okay so let's say I will say I have a team called QA and here again I will use the same value is Mukesh now I have a dev team and here I will say Akash that's all two now if you notice here I am not using double quotes here by default here key is string if I just simply say one it is not acceptable if I say 10.0 it's not acceptable so when you go in this way whatever key you will give by default it will be a string and it is case sensitive okay so it means if I create another key value pair and this time if I say QA equal to Python it is acceptable okay so the moment I say print EMP it will consider this as a key value pair separately this is also key, ver key value pair separately because they are case sensitive the moment I right click run as dictionary 3 and you can see what if I say one more time this time Q is capital A is small and this time again I will say C Python which is the default which we are using now right and you can see it is again taking this as a separate key value pair so it means this is case sensitive now let me show you one more thing what if I have this key value pair repeated again okay so you can see now first of all it is giving me error okay the moment you put mouse over okay it says key keyword argument repeated okay what if I say Akash 1 okay so it means you cannot have the duplicate keys in dictionary but if I say dev 1 it is acceptable okay the moment I run this you can see we got key value pairs since this key is unique if you use the same key it is not allowed at all you will get error okay the moment you try to run this forcefully it will simply say keyword argument repeated it's a syntax error and it will give you the exact which value is getting repeated which is dev and you can see dev is already mentioned here clear so you can say as a dev one or devops it doesn't matter but make sure you have the unique keys now using the same dictionary constructor let me show you another way here I will be using a list of tuples in case if you don't understand this syntax that's perfectly fine the next uh, the next video which I will be having it will be on tuples or you can say tuples so once you understand tuples you can come back to this video and watch this last section again so let me create another dictionary called new EMP okay again I will be using DICT which is dictionary I will be using dictionary constructor parenthesis now I will be using list of tuples here okay so I, this is our list now within this list I can have multiple tuples so this is my first tuple then I will have another tuple so let me stick to two tuples as of now within this tuples I can have key value pairs so one key is let's say one and for this key I will be having value as let's say Java now again remember guys we don't have colon here it's just a comma this is the main important point second value I want to have this I want to have for Python now let's say if I want to add one more key value pair I will again create a tuple followed by comma then I will say 3 comma and this time I will say JavaScript so now my new dictionary is ready I can again say print new EMP and you will see now we have new dictionary ready and here we go this is my key value pairs this is key value this is key value so these are the two different ways to create a dictionary so this is dictionary using key value pair here key is a string value can be anything this is dictionary uh, using list of tuples okay so I hope it is clear now in case if you have any issue or if you're not able to understand anything from this video let me know in the comment section just keep this syntax in the mind anyways I will be sharing this example so you can just have this as a reference but yeah in case if you find any difficulty let me know okay so the next example will be on tuples okay so please 
make sure you watch the tuples video because tuples video will have the clarity then you will understand the difference between list set dictionary and tuples okay so once you move ahead we need to use all of them sometimes we need to use them together sometimes we need to use them independently right so do not skip any uh, data types because all are important but yes it depends on the usage we need to call them today in this video we are going to talk about tuple or tuple in python okay so till now we discussed about the list we discussed about the set we discussed about the dictionary and now let's talk about what is tuple and how we can use it so tuples in python is a collection of items just like we had this list set dictionary so it is also a collection of item so it is also a ordered and indexed it means you can have tuples values in a proper order and you can access them with the help of index now since it works on indexes so you can do all the indexing operation and the slicing operation so this indexing and slicing we discussed in detail in our string videos okay so in case if you haven't watched my string video there i discussed about indexing and slicing in details we'll definitely cover a few examples here it's well in case if you want to know about more about indexing and slicing i will give you the link in the description go ahead and watch that video very important point because it is same property just like list so what is the difference here tuple is immutable okay but list is mutable it means we have seen in list we can override the values right but tuples no tuples is immutable it means we cannot change the values which is assigned in tuples okay so i will show you with the help of proper example and the bonus point if you stick till the end of this video we will be also talking about tuple unpacking okay so how we can unpack the tuple how can we retrieve the values so let's go back to pycharm and let's create another python file so i will give this file name as tuple demo okay that's a tuple demo you will get this file now let me show you the syntax as well before we move ahead so syntax would be you just need to use couple of parentheses you need to provide value separated by comma okay so parentheses value 1 comma value 2 comma value 3 and so on and end with again parentheses so example would be like this if i have to store four values i can just give one which is integer again string integer and again a string again i can use boolean i can use float as well the syntax too would be as usual we have seen the same thing in list set and dictionary so here also we'll see how we can create tuple with the help of tuple constructor so here you just need to say tuple and in the constructor you have to provide a list and that list you can provide the value separated by comma very easy we'll see one by one so let's go back to pycharm we already created this file so let me create one example called tube one which is tuple one here i will just give okay parenthesis and here i will be using few values let's say one then i will give as python then let me give some value 90.0 and let me give some boolean values as well okay so this is our tuple ready in case if you want to print let's print the tuple values i will say tuple one and just right click execute this we got the values right you can see it is coming in a proper order one python 90.0 and true since it is a ordered base so if i want the specific value i can give the proper index it means if i want the second value so i will say this is zero this is one so i will say i want tuple one dot do we have any method so let's see we don't have any method here but since we know it is an ordered way what i can do i can provide the index as one which should ideally return me python yeah we got the python so now if you want to know the methods which tuple has just say tube one dot so first of all you can see we have a count right and then we have length not many methods right so we will be using these methods as well but other things which we need we need to play with the brackets we need to play with the indexing as well okay so let me add few more values so that i can show you the difference let me add one again let me add uh, okay let me add one three four times and let me add a few more values let's say i a qa okay so now we have proper values now can i do the indexing and slicing so indexing we have seen right i can give the index does it support negative index as well yes it supports okay so if in case if you want the last value of this tuple you just say minus one and you just execute this and you will get the qa 
so this is minus 1 this is minus 2 and so on so if I need the second last I will say minus 2 and I will get 1 right so indexing we can do positive index negative as, as well and if I show you the count method so if I say tube one dot count it will ask me which value you want to count so in our example I have four one right so if I simply say that I want to count how many times one is coming so I will get the value as five now you must be wondering why it is coming five okay so if you can see we have three one here and one is this then why it is giving five okay let me give you the answer but before that let me add few more values let me add two 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 three times I have did two okay and if I simply say count as two let's cross verify I will run it again and this time you can see we got the output as three which is perfectly fine I can easily understand but what about this why are we are getting five because we have four values so let me just run it again still value is coming five the reason is if you can see this true right internally Python considered true as one okay so because of that it is also considering as one and remaining four so we are getting value as fine so just keep this point in mind okay so count method is working fine index we have already okay we haven't seen the index right so let me say that I want to access tube one which is tuple and I want the index value of a specific uh, value so let's say I want to know the index of 90.0 so I will just say return me the index of 90.0 and let's say what will be the output output should be it should be 0 it is 1 it is 2 so output should be 2 yeah so we got the index of 90.0 so count method will return the number of occurrence of that particular value index will return you the index of that particular value now let's quickly check about the slicing part so if I say print uh, tube 1 now if I say slicing uh, I mean I want to get the sub tuple okay let's say I want from Python till 1 or Python 90.0 and true so how can I do that so if I say uh, 0 colon till 5 so what it will do it will start from 0 and it will go till 5 but it will not include this one okay what it means if I say 0 to 5 so it will include 0 1 2 3 4 it will include till here but but it will not include the fifth one okay which is fifth index so let me just run it and you can see we got the output till 1 what if I change it to 4 it means it should start from 0 and it should go till 3 it should not include 4 it means 0 1 2 3 it should in only include 3 it should not include the fourth one or the fourth index yeah so this is how we can do the slicing again slicing indexing we discussed in detail so I will keep this part for you just explore the indexing again with the tuple now the main important point that we are discussing today what is the difference between list and tuple or tuple because both are almost same it also have indexes it also have slicing we can do all the operations which list is doing so what I will do I will say tube one okay and let me try to add zeroth index and I will try to add some value let's say Mukesh and let me print this tuple again I will say tube one and just I will give the formatting so that we can easily understand the new output so whatever output we will get after star that will be the new output just execute this and can you see we got a type error and if you see it says tuple object does not support item assignment it means you cannot update the values in the tuple because it's immutable okay keep this point in mind so what I was actually doing at zeroth index we already have one I'm trying to update with the value Mukesh which is not possible clear that is the reason tuple is immutable keep this point in mind let's quickly also check the type what exactly it will return when I say type of tube one which is tuple one okay and uh, just give me tube one here yeah. just execute 
so again uh tuple okay it is giving error here right so anyways it's not possible so i will just comment this now i'm only expecting the type of tube one which is tuple and you can see it's returning me that it's a tuple it's a separate class yeah now there's some interesting fact which i haven't discussed till now because i was waiting for this tuple is there any way where we can convert tuple into list tuple into set yeah is it possible so answer is yes it is possible to convert tuple into list or tuple into set with the help of the constructor so that i will show you now okay so in order to show you that i will create another python file and this time i will call this as tuple demo 2 yeah and I, let me remove everything so just to show you first of all i will say this is a type method and i will say give me the type of tube one which is tuple one let's see the output okay it's a tuple or tuple now can i convert this tuple into a list yes so how you can do just say list inside list constructor i can pass tuple one the moment you pass tuple one within list constructor it will return your list so let's say l1 so if you want to cross check i will just say give me the type of l1 just to cross check whether it converted or not you can see this time l1 which is nothing but list one is a type list now earlier it was tuple just because of this constructor now it is converting into a list yeah same thing can we do for set yes we can do so just type set and here when i say again after this just print the type of s1 yeah. now the question comes can we convert it to dictionary no because dictionary need key value pairs right so that is not possible it will throw you error but yes you can convert tuple into list or set so in case we want to know the values as well just quickly print the values so this is our list one and this is our set one okay so just right click sorry just run it from here now the difference which you will see is very important here okay now this will give you kind of recap that we already discussed so let me print the tuple values yeah then we have list values and then we have set values so when you see the output list output and tuple output is exactly same because they also have ordered and indexed right but when it comes to set you will see two changes now first of all set does not allow duplicate so the value which you see we don't have any one multiple times it is only one here we also had two multiple times here it is only one so one thing is clear set does not allow duplicate perfect fine now if you try to see the order they were in a different order right one python 9.0 true and then finally q but you can see now it is not in a proper order because set is unordered right it does not follow index so it will always give you in a random order yeah i hope you got the difference so first thing it's also index ordered but it's immutable that is a big difference between list and tuple and can we convert list uh, tuple into list set yes we can do that now let me show you the one more way how we can create tuple and i will also give you some important facts okay that you need to notice now this might come as an interview question okay because when you get, start giving a python certification exam or you know some online exam you will get this kind of questions so let me create okay maybe i can do it here itself I'm creating another tuple called tuple2 and this time I'm just writing Mukesh here. Okay, so just type tuple2 and maybe I will just do a kind of formatting here. Yes, we'll see this output now. Okay. So what we got, we got Mukesh, which is expected. Now let me calculate the length. Okay, so the moment I say length of tuple two, 
okay just see the output now it is little confusing for you maybe right now but just give me a couple of minutes i will show you why it is giving the moment you say tuple with one value okay if it is a string what exactly it is doing it is considering this as a character by character so the count is six here so that is the reason you are getting length is six if i just give mukesh otwani here which is again six more characters okay so again in python we don't have characters okay data type but internally string is a sequence or collection of characters so it is counting character by character so count is 12 now but now let me show you a small variation the moment i just okay maybe i can create another tuple so that you will have a clear difference this time i will make it tuple 3 and tuple 3 and length of tuple 3 i will just put a comma here nothing much just execute the same program can you see now we got the exact tuple as output earlier you were getting as a string right as a character by character which is a string but now you got the proper tuple and now you're getting the proper length as one because the moment you have only one value in the tuple just make sure you give the comma otherwise it will consider just like a normal string but the moment you say comma it will consider it as a proper tuple and you will get the proper output okay just keep this point in mind now if i just add one more value let's see the output now it is quite obvious we will get the count as two and we are getting the value as proper okay so another very interesting example can we create list of tuples yes we can do that okay so let's say if i create l1 okay which is list and again in the list can i have multiple tuples yes i can have multiple tuples okay and uh, let's say i have one here three five here i will say two four six and here let's say 10 20 30. So let's say this is our list. In this list, I have three tuples, tuple one, tuple two, and tuple three. So in case if I want to access tuple one, I will say zero, which will give me one, three, five, right? Let's see, just right click run as I got the first tuple. Can I get the second tuple, which is indexed at one? Yes, we can do that. Right click run as, and you can see we got. Now, since it's a tuple, and again tuple supports indexing can i give the indexing as 0 1 2 yes we can do that so if i want value as 6 so this is 0 this is 1 this is 2 right click run again and you can see we got the output as 6 so it is also possible to have a list of tuples and since they both have the indexing you can access them with the help of indexes yeah so before we end this let me show you another way of creating tuple okay uh, so again i will create one more python file and this time i will say three and let me just remove everything so i will say again t1 means tuple one here i will be using tuple class okay or i will say tuple constructor now in this constructor you need to give the values in a form of list okay so you just say one or let's say some string i will take okay mukesh then i will say let's say python and let's say i will be taking some name okay some technology let's say automation and if i just say print type of t1 which is tup tuple and let's run this so you can see now t1 is actually tuple so this is actually a tuple for us in case if you want to know the value just print t1 and you will get the proper tuple value can you see this again it's a proper tuple now now you can just you know access them with the help of index so if i want python i will say 0 1 1 stand for python here and i will get the python as output yeah so don't worry guys once you move ahead you will see the real-time implementation of tuple dictionary set list string when do we use how do we use everything we will see as of now focus on the fundamentals your fundamentals are clear you can easily play with these data types so before we end the session as i promised the bonus part the 
tuple unpacking okay so how we can unpack the tuple so let's say this is my t1 t1 which is actually a tuple for us right what if i want these values in a variable can we do that yes so what i will do since it has three values right mukesh python automation so what i can do i can give x comma y comma z and here i can provide t1 so what it will do it will take the first value it will assign into x it will take the second value it will assign into y third value it will assign into z so this concept is known as tuple unpacking so let me print x let's run this we got the mukesh yeah if i say y we'll got python and similarly when i say z we got the automation now there's a small change okay not change but yeah let me modify the program and you can easily predict the output now okay so now tuple has four values but i'm assigning into three variables will it work or not let's see okay we got the value error and if you try to read it clearly says too many values to unpack we were expecting three but actually values are four so it is not able to unpack it means when you do tuple unpacking make sure you have the exact number of variables okay to store the values number of variables should be equal to the number of values let's do a reverse thing okay here values are three but i will keep four variables here let's say a so again total number of values from tuple is three but i have four variables will it work let's run it again and again same thing it says value error which is exactly same but this time if you see the description it says not enough value to unpack we were expecting four values right which is four variables but we got three so this is how you can unpack the tuple so you will be seeing this example when you run for loop right you will get the tuple as output and we will be doing this unpacking multiple times so just remember this concept very interesting but yeah you need to remember these points today in this video we are going to talk about conditional statement or you can say decision making statement in python so in this video i will talk about if condition if else condition nested if conditions okay and multiple if else if condition which we call as lf okay so this video is going to be a little long plus it is going to be a little interesting as well because all the next activities will be based on this okay so when we talk about conditional statement as the name says based on certain conditions or the output right we need to execute the next set of statement so whether you talk about python c c plus plus java any programming language conditional statements will play a very important role okay so let's say one by one so we'll talk about from the scratch what is the syntax how do we use and we'll see some real examples so let's get started i will be creating a small python file and i will say if demo okay so i will try to create multiple files for your reference so let's talk about the syntax first of all so we have a if keyword okay so if else il f we have some predefined keywords in python that we are going to use now so whenever you write if now you need to write a condition okay so this condition if this condition evaluates to true then it will execute the next set of statement otherwise it will continue so let's say i have some piece of code okay so if i say it if this condition is true okay so whenever you have to end this if you need to use colon here the moment you hit enter you can see now we have four white spaces so this is how the indentation works in python so whatever you will be writing after true condition okay or after if all the statement will be coming under this particular condition okay so let me show you if i will say true then say hello okay and let me simply run this so you can see since we are giving condition is true so definitely it is going to run this because we don't have any other condition so this is just a if condition and let me do one thing let me have some print statement okay after this and i will say thanks for watching videos okay and i will put one more if condition or sorry one print statement here and i will say welcome so why i'm printing this so that i can show you if this condition evaluates to true or if this if a statement is working what will be the output 
so whenever you are giving true condition definitely if block will get executed okay so in our case right now we are forcefully giving true so definitely first of all it will say welcome then it will say hello and then it will say this statement which is again a print statement what if i make this as false okay the moment it's if condition have false it will not execute this block of code okay the moment i run this again you will see now we got welcome since if condition is false now it is not going to execute this statement and you will get this final output very straightforward so now let's use some variables okay so let's say i have one variable called a equal to 30 now i will be writing a condition here if this condition evaluates to true it will execute this if otherwise it will not execute i will say if a is greater than 50 if yes then it will evaluate this and it will execute if false it will not execute this if so when i run this you can see i did not get any output because 30 is greater than 50 which is false it is not executing what if i make this 80 is 80 is greater than 50 yes so it will execute hello yeah now if itself sometimes it's not enough we need to add a else condition okay so just write else and now after else put a colon okay then again when you hit enter again it will take the four white spaces and now this is again indentation for else whatever you will write it will execute if this condition is false okay so if i say here bye if this condition is true it will say hello otherwise it will say bye in our case 80 is greater than 50 it will say hello so let's run this and let's take 10 if 10 is greater than 50 definitely not so it will execute and it will say bye okay fair enough very easy to use this now you can write any complex conditions here it's totally up to your expression or the condition that you're writing the main the output should be true and false if it is true it will execute if otherwise else okay so let's use some other example so again i will be taking one variable okay let's take this variable as name and let's say i will be using python this time okay and now if i write condition if this name equal to equal to python okay so you can see the moment i hit enter okay just after python we need to put colon again i will say print python found else okay just make sure if else in the same uh, line now i will say else colon and just say print sorry it's a print just a second and i will say python not found or any other statement it is just some dummy conditions i'm writing we will be writing some actual code in few minutes python not found okay the moment i run this you can say python found because name is equal to python and this is how we are going to do comparison with string if python equal to python it will say python found again if not it will say python not found so what if i want to write multiple if else conditions okay so then we can use if l if which is nothing but if else if if and again we can have multiple conditions here so that we are going to see now so again i will copy this code and i will go here and this time i will say if demo let's say if else if demo which is this and let me remove this again i will say let's say i'm going to use one language called python okay and now i will be writing some conditions so first of all as usual i will say if if this language is equal to equal to selenium let's say colon then we will say selenium found else if you don't want to write else if you want to write multiple conditions again after else so you can see we also have lf which is else if so again i will be writing a condition if language equal to equal to let's say java colon again and i can write print again that java found again i want to write one more condition okay there's no limitation you can have multiple else if conditions here. again i will say e l i f which is else if again i will say if language equal to equal to python 
okay and then I will say Python form at last you can actually we missed one semicolon here and it should be equal to equal to right now if nothing found I will just write else colon and again I will say if nothing found I will say sorry we could not find anything yeah so let's run this right click run as and you can say python found the moment you run this first of all language equal to python so first of all it will check this condition is python equal to equal to selenium no then it will come to this lf again it will check is python equal to equal to java no so it will not execute this it will go to again lf which is else if again it will check if python equal to equal to python and it says python found okay the moment it will find it will not execute the next statement it will come out of this condition because if any of the conditions true it will come out okay so you will not get this one what if I change this to let's say Mukesh okay so when I execute this and you can see this language is not able to match with any of the conditions so at last it is saying sorry we could not yeah sorry spelling mistake we could not find anything so this is how you can write multiple if else conditions okay and right now I'm just giving this hard-coded values okay so in case if you want some uh, user input we can do that so let's do one thing let's take this input from the user and I will say input input is a predefined function in Python which will take user input and then you can use that input for further calculations so the moment I say please enter any of the programming language okay so definitely whatever inputs we will be giving from our keyboard it will accept and we will be storing this into a variable called lang so I will just comment this for the time being so whatever input we will get from the user then we will compare so let's run this and you can see it is asking me please enter programming language let me say Java first and you can say Java found perfect let's execute it once again Please enter programming language. This time I will say Mukesh. Which definitely it will not match. It will say sorry we could not find anything. Let's try one more time. And this time I will give a Python here. Okay. And you can say Python form. Again very easy. It is just you need to understand how the flow works. Now if you are making this mistake that indentation. Okay. Then it will not work. The moment you put mouse over. It says illegal target for variable annotations. Because this is not following the proper indentation you can see it says indent expected so make sure you give the proper indentation and good thing about python sorry good thing about pycharm the moment you write if condition and you hit enter it will automatically have the indentation for you i will show you okay because the moment we write nested if condition then this nested if might create a problem for you so i will show you in few minutes now but before we move to the nested if I want to show you the shortcuts for this again when you okay uh, go to the next level you don't have to write the complete long statement you can just complete this in one statement as well okay so I will give you some shorthands here so again I will create a separate file and uh, I will say three so let's say I want to write one condition if and I will say if 100 is greater than 10 if yes then put a colon do this so I will say yes okay so this will only execute if this condition is true otherwise it will not execute so if I right click run as since this is executed like this and condition is true right it will say yes okay maybe I will do one thing I will just add a print statement I will say welcome and I will say bye so at least should give me if this condition is not true so if I say 5 5 is greater than 10 definitely not so it will not execute this statement okay if you see this it says welcome and bye but if I make it 15 15 is greater than 10 yes so it will say print yes this is only with if what if I have if else condition then what will be the syntax again when you have if else conditions first of all you need to write the statement which will run if condition is true so in our case I will say print yes when space if 
if this condition is true so if i say if 100 is greater than 10 execute this else again i will say else print no so left hand side will only execute if this condition evaluates true otherwise it will run the statement which is on the right side which is just after else so in our case 100 is greater than 10 years so let's run it you can see yes again but if i say 5 is greater than 10 then it will say no okay so you can see we got no so these statements are coming from this statement so we have already discussed but you can see this is working based on our conditions again i'm just hard coding this condition but you can have n number of like your own custom condition and based on that it will evaluate so let's do one thing let's create a variable i will say this is marks and i will say marks let's say 95 and i will write a condition here okay what i will say if marks which is 95 is equal or let's say greater than equal to 90 okay then do this else so if marks is greater than 90 i will say a plus else i will say a executed and you can see we got a plus what if i change this if i say it is 85 then definitely is 85 greater than 90 no so it will execute this and it will say print a and we got the output clear so this is how you can do the shorthand okay now let me show you the nested if condition okay so what nested if condition will do first of all it will check one condition if that evaluates to true it will check another condition it will check so it will have nested if conditions so let me show you let me just add some comments here so that we will not get additional output so let's say i just want to check the salary part okay so let's say the salary of one person is fifty thousand in inr okay and now i'm going to check if salary is greater than forty thousand then i'm going to provide a home loan not home loan or uh, let's say car loan i will say eligible for car loan okay again i will put one more condition this time and if i say if salary is greater than eighty thousand okay then i can put one more condition and i will say this time okay just add colon here eligible for home loan perfect what if i add one more condition that if salary is greater than one lakh then add or uh, just use this condition and i will say premium customer eligible for all kind of loan at last you can have the you know you can have the individual else condition or at last if you don't want to give multiple else you can come here and you can say if this condition itself is not matting or not getting fulfilled you can say print and you can say sorry we could not serve you okay so let's see right now fifth salary is above 50,000 so first it will check this it will say you are eligible for car loan let's right click run as and you can say first condition is met it says you are eligible for car loan the moment it reaches here you can say 50,000 is greater than 80,000 no so it will not execute these further statements okay this time let me make it 90,000 so first of all this this if condition will get evaluated and it will be true then it will come here is 90,000 is greater than 80,000 yes it will say eligible for home loan as well so let's right click run as and you can say eligible for car loan and home loan what if I say salary is 1 lakh 20,000 okay in this case the last if condition will also get evaluated and you can say it says premium customer you are eligible for all kind of loan now the last condition one more time and i have said salary is only ten thousand so in this case this condition will not evaluate to true it will come to else and it will say sorry we could not serve you 
perfect now again if you want to take salary as an input again i will be using here again i will comment this and i will say salary equal to i will use input method and i will say please enter your salary for loan okay let's see the moment i run this it says please enter your salary for loan so it is it will keep on waiting until we are not giving the input so the moment i say my salary is let's say 7000 okay and my program failed okay i will tell you why so first of all the moment you say salary okay this input which you are getting from the user is always a string okay in case if you want to see let's do one thing let's print the type and i will say type of cell so that we'll get to know what exactly it is okay let's say 9000 so you can see the salary that i'm getting from the user it is coming in a form of a string so i cannot compare string with these conditions right i'm comparing a string with 40000 which is not possible so first of all we need to convert this salary into integer right then only we can use it so one way is like you can simply say um, salary equal to you just say int inside this int you can pass this salary which we are getting let's have a proper name here salary so whatever salary we will get will first of all pass here so it will give me the type then what i will do i will typecast this and i will say we are having the salary please convert into integer so now this cell which earlier was string now it will be integer then i will compare okay so let's run this okay let's say twenty thousand. okay again it says we could not serve you perfect now last time let me write one more type statement and then i will show you okay so execute this so it is stopping here at line number eight again I, when i say my salary is let's say sixty thousand this time so you can see the first one right class string which is coming from here the moment we enter salary we are calculating not calculating actually we are checking the type so it says it is a string then i'm converting then again i'm printing the type so this ta this time after converting i got the integer Again, checking is salary which is sixty thousand is greater than forty thousand. So yes, condition is true. It says eligible for car loan. Next, it says sixty thousand is greater than eighty thousand. No, then it is not meeting this condition and it's not executing the further if condition. I hope it is clear now. So we discussed now if we discussed about if else we also discussed the shorthand for if shorthand for if else we discussed about the nested if condition just now and we also discussed if else if conditions right which is elif which is again a predefined keyword in python i hope it is clear now i can have more example here but for that uh, maybe i can use a for loop which we have not discussed yet but yeah let me quickly cover that part as well so that at least you will have clear idea how we can you know use this in an efficient manner just give me a couple of minutes maybe hardly two minutes and you'll have a better understanding of if conditions with for loop okay this is kind of a bonus in case if you don't understand don't worry in the next videos anyways we'll discuss about the for loop while loop then this example will make more sense okay so again i will take this one execute here and i will say this time fourth and let me create one condition here okay so before we create this condition let me create a list anyways we discussed about this list right so let's say i have a name list and this name i will say python and let's say i have a java let's say i have a javascript and finally let's say i have c sharp okay now i want to write a small piece of code where i want to check a specific tool within this list if that exists then say yes or true otherwise print some dummy message so first of all i need to traverse through this list right so how can i traverse i'm going to just going to write a for loop where i will be using one variable where i will be storing my values so let's say i will say uh, a okay just to give some name i have given a otherwise you can give x y z or any other variable let's keep name so this is names guys remember this is name 
so and i just need to write in this is actually syntax for creating a for loop and then i have to provide the list here so this is my for loop what it will do it will get one by one all the values from this list it will store into name so if i have four names it will run four times if i have 10 it will run 10 times so each time it will give me the value in our case it will give me python java javascript and c sharp my condition is i want to check whether um, javascript is available within this list or not okay so i will write a if condition here that we discussed just now and it is storing into this name variable right i will say if name equal to equal to let's say javascript okay colon if it is true then i want to print something that yes we found this programming language but i want to write in a different way so what i will do i will just create a boolean variable here called status okay this will be false by default and i will be writing if this condition is true make this boolean variable to true so i will say if we found the js just assign true here okay else print a message that please wait we are searching we are still searching or some message that you want to give to the user and at last we will again check if this status equal to false it means whatever value we were searching we could not find if it is true definitely we will say we found your you know the record so i will say if the status which is already a variable if this evaluates true will say print we are glad that we found the record in case if we don't find we'll say else sorry we could not help you or sorry we could not found the record okay now let me explain this code again the moment you run this by default status equal to false it means by default it will always say sorry we could not found your record now we have a list of python java java uh, javascript and c sharp using for loop we are iterating so one by one it will iterate it will take the first value which is python it will store into name we will check if python equal to equal to javascript no so it will print please wait we are still searching again it will execute this loop this time it will take java it will store into name we will see we'll again check if java equal to equal to javascript no it will again print please wait we are still searching last oh sorry second last iteration it will take javascript now here comes the magic if javascript equal to javascript yes and you can see what we are doing we are just making this status equal to true okay so by default it had false now we are making it true now once the condition is true i want to break this if i don't break again it will take the next record it will execute right so i don't want to execute it so i can add a break okay so i will show you the break uh, after this iteration let me run this you can see we got the record in the second iter third iteration but still we are it is searching for this guy as well because we are not breaking the for loop so it will keep on running till the list is reaching till the end right so it reached here js so ideally it should have print two times even though we found the record it was again executing for c sharp then it was checking is if c sharp is equal to javascript no then it printed again please wait we are still searching so you can see three records sorry three times this print and finally we got the record so the moment you want to break okay once your condition is true you can add a break here and say that once my condition is true break means come out of this for loop okay right click run and you can see it searched twice third iteration it got and it say we are glad that we found the record so this is how you can combine the for loop with if conditions again we are using some boolean flag here 
don't worry we will discuss more uh, kind of this scenarios once you move ahead and even if you don't understand this for loop part we are going to have the next session on for loop and while loop as well i hope it is clear please try to write some basic program from your end as well because here the main part is the syntax nothing much right so make sure you just use the proper indentation okay so if i show you quickly once again what we discussed okay so just indentation the moment you write if the next statement should have the tab or four white spaces same goes with else so you can see if else is coming in the same line right if you miss some indentation like this okay it might create an issue for you so you can see it again started through a error that indentation issue so please make sure that indentation is correct rest everything python will take care because in java or in any any other programming language we have curly brackets right but here we don't have curly brackets it's all about the indentation rest everything is fine so just try this and let me know if you find any issue today in this video we are going to talk about how we can debug your python program in pycharm debugging is one of the most important part for any other programming language so whether you're working with python java c sharp doesn't matter you should know the debugging because debugging will help you to debug your program easily and you will actually get to know what exactly is going wrong with your code okay so right now what we are doing we are just writing one or two lines of code so we are able to see the output but let's assume that you're working in a real time project and your program is failing now okay let's say it is failing because of some exceptions so how do you will get to know that what is going wrong with my code or what is wrong with this statement so you can actually debug your code with the help of debugger and you can easily rectify what is going wrong okay so i will show you with few examples and don't worry once we move ahead once we start working with complicated topics or i will say scenarios again i will be using this debugging multiple times so don't worry as of now just understand the basic uh, principle of debugging how to debug your programs how to watch the variables okay and once you move ahead definitely we will be using this for multiple examples again debugging in pycharm is very easy so what i will do let me create a python file first so that i can show you a basic debugging so just go ahead and create a new python file and here i will say debug demo okay let's create some variables so i will say x equal to 10 okay and let's say y equal to 20 again i'm using a very basic example next example will include some more uh, different kind of data types as of now i'm taking both number as integers and finally i will say the sum and this sum includes let's say x plus y makes sense and now if i print sum i should get the output this is what we are doing so far right so the moment i say right click run as debug demo and we are getting the output perfect now let's say i want to see what is going on within this statement i want to capture the internal state so how can i do that so in order to start debugging you need to add a breakpoint so using breakpoint you can tell exactly at which statement to stop okay so it will stop at that particular statement then you can debug your program so in our case what we can do let me add the breakpoint at statement number one itself so you can see i have these four statement one two three four in case these numbers are not coming for you just right click here okay and you can see this checkbox right so if i say uncheck i don't get these options so I, I would highly recommend in case if you don't have these line numbers, just right click and click on show line numbers. It will make your debugging very easy. In order to add the debug breakpoint, you just need to do a click once. Okay. And you can see this a red circle, right? This is a breakpoint. So now when you execute your program, it will stop here and then you can, you know, execute your program statement by statement. So in order to debug, you could just do the right click and say, debug and the moment you execute and you can see your program stopped at this statement okay so yes you can see right now the special variables the moment you open uh, this you can see these are the special variables which is internally coming from python right now it's not showing the local variables that we created okay so don't worry as of now don't expand this this is just for your information in case if you want to know these are special variables get loaded the moment you run your program now if i have to execute the next statement you can see i have an option called step over okay i can just do the step over and you can see it will execute the current statement and it will move to the next and you can see we got one value which is of integer type and value is 10 can you see so x is the variable name it is a type of integer and value is 10 same thing if i say step over 
now i got y as well which is again y is a variable type of integer value is 20 the moment i say sum you can see i got uh, some variable now again value is 30 type of integer the moment i is execute again now it will execute this print okay so you can just go to console and verify the output is 30. now let's change the values and see how it gives a different output so, okay so in this case if i say 20 dot uh, let's say 15 dot 5 okay and let's debug it once again so again i will say right click debug as and you can see now the debugger started again so let's execute i will say step over i got value as 10 type of integer let's execute the next statement now you can see the value right internally it is telling you that it's a value kind of float value is 15.5 and the variable name is y and now as we know when we combine or when we do the addition of integer with float we get the final value as float right so let me execute it once more and you can say finally we have variable as some type of float and the value is 25.5 so you can see now how internally we're able to see what kind of value it has and what the value is right now it's very straightforward because we are hard coding the values right but once you move ahead definitely you will be getting these values from a different file or from a different function or from a different class itself in that case it will be very helpful because you will be able to see what kind of values we are getting from the different files or from the different sources and it will make your debugging task a little easy as of now hard coded values but yeah you will get these values from a different sources as well once we move it as of now just understand the basic principle of debugging i hope it is clear now let me take one more example that will again make your task little easy so let me take some numbers i will say num1 and i will be using now input so input we already discussed right that it will take the input from the user so let's say i will say please enter number one okay and I will be taking input from the user. Same thing I will be doing for num2 as well. So I will just copy and paste. I will just terminate the previous debugger and just say number two. Once we get the numbers, I will just say sum. Okay, and I will say num1 plus num2. And finally, I will be adding this value and I will say value is, and finally I will combine with sum, yeah let's execute i will just remove this and i will add the breakpoint at line number six and let's execute okay so these are the variables and that is anyway showing because this statement got executed right we also executed print sum so if you come back to console you can see that we got the value but now the moment i come back here it stopped here at number one the moment i say step over or f8 right you can come here and you can see it is asking please enter your number one i will say let's say 90 okay so it is asking the next number okay so we need to exactly do this step over again now it is giving please enter number two let's say 89 yeah so now these two statements got executed so if i come back to debugger can you see i got num1 okay so we did a small mistake here guys we haven't given num2 okay so it was overriding the value so let me do one thing let's uh, stop this debugger and execute it once again okay so now it is asking please enter number one let me do this yeah so we come here and we say number any number let's say 12 now it is Coming to the next statement again, I will say step over. It is asking please enter number two, let's say five, six. And if I come back to debugger now, you can see we got num1, which is string now, because here's a catch, because the moment you get uh, values from the input method, it will always return you string, right? So I have 12, which is string, then I have num2, which is again type of string. The moment I say string with string, it will do the concat operation right the moment i execute this okay execute once again and can you see we got the value as one two five six okay so which is not even uh, what we expected 
we thought it will add the numbers and will get the output but because of this integers oh, sorry the string part it is just doing the concat operation now here comes the debugging part because the moment you start debugging you will understand that it's a string when we are combining two string we are getting one final string so what we can do we can just do now uh, typecasting we will convert this string into integer and then we can do the final addition right so let me just show you once again uh, so in order to typecast what I will do I can typecast directly here or I can typecast in the next statement it's up to you so let me do one thing let me typecast here it will make little uh, task easy so I will say num1 again I will I can use the same variable because of dynamic typing right what I will say uh, convert this num1 into integer okay same thing I will do here I will say num2 and we want to convert num2 also in a form, in an integer so I will say num2 here so earlier it was string in the next statement I will be converting into integer same thing I will get num2 as a string I will be converting into integer now integer with integer I will get final integer and now it should also give me the final output but again as we know that we cannot add or we cannot concat string with integer so again we need to do a small casting here that we will do okay but let me execute till here at least so right click debug okay let me execute this step over come back to here let's say number is 67 execute once again okay and let's say 90 now you come back here and just go to debugger can you see now number one is already converted into integer so it says num1 now is 67 which is integer but if you just notice one more thing we are or we have not executed this statement right so num2 is still a string right now but the moment i execute this statement you will see num2 will change to integer type so let's execute and you can see the moment I execute the statement num2 got converted into integer now we have integer and integer the moment I say integer plus integer final value also I should get as integer so you got the output as integer 157 but the moment I try to do the concatenation you will see it says you can only concat string to string not integer so either I can directly do it here or I can execute here. So what I will do sum anyways, it's coming as a string uh, integer. What I will say convert into a string and then use it. So this is how we can convert any value in string. So num1 and num2 was coming as integer. The moment I pass integer value within str, it will convert into string and we will get the final output. Okay, so what I will do, I will just put a breakpoint at this statement. I don't want to execute all the program. So I will just stop this debugger, delete all these logs not required. Just right click debug. It is asking please enter your number. I will say 90, 67. And you can see now let's talk about this sum so sum is right now it is a form of integer right and we cannot convert or we cannot concat string with integer so right now i have not executed this statement but the moment i execute just notice this variable okay sum it converted into string now i can concat string with string the moment i execute this now i can see i got the value as this so this is how debugging can help you i know this is very basic example but once you move it, same principle will be applicable for complicated programs as well and it will save a lot of time for you. So I would highly recommend just try the same examples which I showed you or maybe you can take some previous example that we discussed in the for loop or in previous programs. It will help you to debug your programs easily. So maybe quickly I can show you one more example that will make your concepts little better. So I will quickly create a list which is L1 and let's say I have some numbers here okay now I want to just run a for loop and I just want to 
get this value. So I will say for I can take any variable, let's say x in L1. So it will pick one value from the list, it will store into x and it will just iterate it. So I just want to print these values. Fine. So what if I want to debug and I just want to see how this for loop is working, how these values are getting iterated. I can add a debug point here at line number 17 and uh, let me just debug this. Okay, it's still ex asking us the numbers. Okay, let's enter some numbers. Okay, so you can see now, right now, this x already we have taken. Okay, so it's already taking some value 10. Don't worry. The moment we execute this, now this x has one value which is 2. So it's actually started taking 2 from this list assigned into x. Now the moment I step over, it is again going to the for loop and from this list it will pick 3 now and it will assign into x. You can see value got updated. Next value should be 4. You can see value is 4. Again it will go to list and this time value should be 5 and here we go. At last it should take 90. And now we don't have any value in the list okay so the moment i execute one more time it will go back and check do we have any more value in the list if no it will come out of this for loop okay so just try this debug breakpoint multiple times with multiple examples and it will make your concept clear today in this video we are going to talk about loops okay so in Python, we have while loop and for loop but this video is only talking about for loop in detail next video we'll talk about the while loop now, the moment you talk about the loop statement, as the name says, whenever you have to run one thing at multiple times, right? Instead of repeating the same statement multiple times, you can run a loop. So loop is nothing but you are iterating one thing multiple time depends on the conditions. So when I say iteration, it means one thing you are doing multiple times. Now you will see this term multiple times in Python that this particular object is iterable. Right. The moment say iterable means we can iterate this value or we can, you know, traverse these values. So till now, whatever we discuss, right, we discuss about the list, we discuss set, tuple, dictionary, string. These things are iterable means we can iterate these with the help of for loop and while loop. OK, so if I give you some couple of examples in real time, let's say I have to create uh, 100 files. OK, so instead of creating one file one by one, I can create a for loop that will create a 100 file for me. I'm just giving some dummy examples. Definitely when we write the code, we need to make some changes, but I'm giving you one overall idea how these loops can be used in real time, right? If I have to uh, count the number of links on this web page, or I have to write the number of records in the actual sheet, definitely I will be using these loop statements. So let's see how this for loop works. So I will create a Python file and I will say for loop demo. Yeah. So let's talk about the syntax. First of all, you need uh, anything which can be uh, iterated or we can iterate that particular object. In our case, let's talk about a string. So I will say I have a name and this name, let's say Python. And I want to traverse this or I want to iterate this. So I will write a for loop or I will just say for space, give any variable name. Okay. This is just a local variable, so you can give any name. I will give, let's say, A. Space, you need to say in. Now, after in, you need to give the object which can, which we want to traverse or which we want to iterate. In our case, we want to iterate name, right, which is nothing but a string. I will put a semicolon here and hit enter. It will take the white spaces and now we have a proper indentation. Let me just print this A value and let's see what exactly it is going to return. Let's execute this right click run as and you can see it is actually giving me all the characters one by one. So how it is happening. So when we say name right this string is nothing but a sequence of character or the combination of characters. So, it, so it's picking up one character which is P it is assigning into A then it is printing P which is this. Next time it is taking the second character which is Y it is storing into a and it is printing again which is y okay so this is how it is printing character by character from a particular string i know this is not the best example but let me 
cover multiple examples then you will get a clear picture about how we can run this for loop okay just give me a couple of minutes and trust me this concept will be clear for you now let's use some other objects which we can iterate so in the previous videos we discussed set list tuple dictionary everything right so in case if you haven't seen that video i would highly recommend you to watch that videos because they are actually we are going to use now every time okay so make sure you complete that videos so i'm going to create a list i will say this list is l1 or let's say this list is marks so in this list i'm going to store a couple of marks so let's say i have 70 80 and i have 90 and let's say i have 100 yeah so this is how we create the list now if i want to iterate this list i will say for again i will use some variable let's say m m for marks space in again i will be using this list that we created colon hit enter okay we got the white spaces which is indentation here now i will print m so what it will do it will take one value first value from the marks it will store into m it will print 70 then it will take the second one 80 1900 once it will reach till the end of this list it will come out okay then we will say bye okay so let's run this i will simply just run this program and you can see 70 80 90 100 and after this once it is done it is printing by clear because this is how it is working now instead of passing this list here can i directly pass these values here is it possible yes it is possible so what you can do you can directly say that i have a list of let's say again i will create a new list this time 12 23 34 45 so now it will pick one value from the list it will store into m then it will traverse just like it traversed this one so instead of storing into a variable then passing you can directly pass here as well okay so let's right click run as and this time you can see it has printed the latest values which is coming from this list not this list okay now what if I ask you to write a small program that will find the even numbers and odd numbers from a given list? Okay, that's very basic questions or very basic program that you write when you start any programming language, right? So let's do one thing. Let's write a small program that will count number of how many numbers are even, how many numbers are odd. So for that, I will be using list again. Okay, maybe we'll keep that program at last. Let's cover the different uh, ways how we can use this for loop. At last, we will be writing this program and it's going to be very easy. It is just, you need to understand some fundamentals that anyways I will cover. So you can take this program as a reference. Now, what if I ask that you need to find the sum of the numbers which is given in this list, right? So I will create a variable called sum, let's say. Okay, sum is also a method. So let's do one thing. I will say the final marks. Okay. And by default, I will assign a zero here. So instead of printing, what I will do. The moment we get the value, I will say final marks equal to this final marks with this value which we are getting from here okay so when we execute this program what will happen it will start with this 12 will be assigned into m so m which is 12 with 0 so final marks will be 12 so this value will get updated with 12 next time when the for loop will run 23 will be allocated to m so it is 23 23 with 12 we will get the latest value which is 35 and like this it will continue so once this for loop is done you will get the updated value in the final marks right so i will write here and i will say final value is now you will see a small catch here okay okay so before that let's print the final output then i will explain you this one so i will say print final marks and we should get the proper output with this which is the addition right which is perfectly fine this time correct because 23 plus 12 35 35 plus 45 it will be 80 80 plus 34 it is 114 perfect 
but now what if I say I want to say final value is and I want to add this then let's uncomment this one and this time when I say first print this one like final value is then concat the value which I have which is final marks let's run it okay and here we got the issue now so why we're getting this issue as you can see again we got the type here it says we can only concat string to string not into integer and that makes sense here because final marks which is actually integer and we are actually doing the concatenation with string so how it can be done you just say we will convert this into a string so just pass this integer value within a string constructor so it will convert into a string and then you can pass so you can see this time it is printing the string that we have given then it is saying 114 now in case if you're not comfortable with this what you can do first let's do one thing I will say result so this final marks I will typecast here using a string class constructor so this is how we are going to typecast so this is actually integer we are converting into string so the result finally we have is a string now I will just pass string here so we can concat string with string it is allowed and it we will get the final output which is this yeah it's very easy it is just you need to understand how these things works so we have seen how this list works right in the same way you can go with set also because set also we can traverse we can also traverse the dictionary everything so let me show you one by one i hope it is clear in case if you have any other issue let me know in the comment section i'm creating a new file and this time let me create one sentence and my sentence say uh, i love python if i want to traverse this again i will say for i or a x y z any variable in sentence and let's print i so what it will do it will print again okay let me just can you see it will print again with the white spaces because white space is also a character so just keep this point in mind this is the same thing which i covered in my previous videos as well that white space is also considered as a character clear let's create a set here okay for set i will be saying let's say i have 10 then i have 30 then i have 90 then let's say i have a value called mukesh and let's say one more value called 90.0 and let's say one more called python again i will give some duplicate value just to make sure that it should not allow duplicate so this is how we define set right in curly braces so this time if i say for abc colon or in sentence colon print abc and you will notice we will not have any duplicate value this time yeah plus if you notice they are not in a proper sequence i had a sequence of 10 30 90 mukesh 90.0 and python first it is giving 10 then it is giving python then it is giving mukesh and so on so it is unordered plus it is removing the duplicate okay so we discussed about the list we discussed about the set let's talk about the dictionary so again if i create my dictionary called my dict which is my dictionary and let's say if i am creating a dictionary which will have few key value pairs okay separated by comma so here if i say row number one to this guy row number two to let's say python so this is my dictionary can we traverse dictionary with the help of for loop yes we can do that so what you can do as usual let me comment this again i will use for i will use x or dict okay it's already predefined keywords so i will not use i will say d in and i will be using my dictionary that we created colon 
the moment you hit enter and when you say print d d is just a variable that we created right and my dictionary is the variable and this variable have the complete dictionary the moment you right click run this you will only get the keys guys just remember okay the moment you start using for loop and when you iterate dictionary by default it will give you the key which is one and two in our case what if i add one more key here okay so this time i will make key as a string so i will give key as a name and value also i will give as a string name here i will give let's say otwani and let's just right click run it and you can see i got one two and name okay now let me show you two very interesting method one is items one is values these two methods we already discussed in our dictionary video so in case we're new to dictionary please go ahead and watch that video now i will be using same for loop i will be using d variable since it's a local variable i can use it i will say space in and this is my dictionary so first of all if i say dot items okay and uh, just print this items and let's see what exactly it is going to return i will just say print d and uh, let me just comment this so can you see we got the complete items in a proper format when i say format it means key and value pair right i got one with mukesh two with python and the last record name with otwani but i don't want all the items okay let's say i just need the key i just need the value is there any way where we can store key value separately yes we can do that so what we can do i can say a comma b so key when we iterate right so all the key will be stored in a variable and all the values will be in b so you can see this right one will be stored in a and this value which is mukesh will be stored in b so right now we have three records you will get three times a and three times b the moment i run this you can see we got one which is key then i'm printing b which is nothing but the value of that record so one mukesh two python and name of one clear and if you simply say my items and if you just store into one variable it will give you the complete record now is there any way because when i give complete dictionary it is only giving me key when i use items it is giving me record and i have to store it separately is there any way that we can use or we can get only values is it possible yes so you just say for okay and let's use again a variable or any other variable in i will use my dictionary and i will say dot values so it will only return you the values and that values you can use let me put colon okay so let me quickly comment this and let's right click run you can see this time we got only the values which is coming from dictionary okay again all these methods are coming from dictionary it is just i am showing you how you can use them or consume them with the help of for loop okay clear let me create another class i hope it is clear in case if you find any issue guys please let me know in the comment section i will be happy to assist you so i'm just deleting all this statement that we have written okay so let me show you another very interesting range method here okay so let's say i want to print value from 0 to 100 so instead of creating a list i can use a range method here if i say uh, for x in now i need the numbers right or i need object which can be iterated now if i want to iterate some list i will create a list set dictionary but if i don't want to create i just want some values predefined so you can see if i say range range is a predefined class okay so you can see here i can provide start and stop so let me just give i want to start from 0 and it should go till 50 so what it will do it will generate a number okay from range 0 to 50 it will assign into x that i will be printing so i will say print x and you can see we got the value just remember one thing 
it is starting with zero right and what we said go till 50 so it will this 50 is the stop counter it will not include 50 here okay and in case if you don't want to give uh, the from where to start you can also give the final let's say I want number from till 30 so even if you don't give the first argument it will start from 0 it will end till 29 so this will generate a number in this particular range 0 to 10, uh, 10 30 or whatever value will specify clear now what I want I want to calculate all the even numbers and odd numbers from 0 to 100 and I want to print the even numbers separately and I want to print odd numbers separately so what can we do here let's see so for this first of all we definitely need the numbers right so these numbers are already available here so in order to get the even and odd number we discussed one operator called mod operator right which generally gives us the remainder so let's say if I say 2 mod 2 it will give me 0 which means it's an even number but if I say 3 mod 2 it will give me remainder equal to 1 which means it's a odd number right so I will just give a mod of 2 if it is an even number sorry if it is equal to 0 it's an even number otherwise it's an odd number so we will simply write a quick program which will do this task for us and we will get a list of even numbers and odd numbers very easy just two lines of code and you will get the output so we got this value right now I don't want to print this value I'm going to create two empty list one list will be for even one list for the odd so I will say this is even number list okay this is a blank list same thing I will do for odd list and this is also a blank list the moment I get the value I will keep on appending into this list that is what my task is so anyways we'll get the value within the x variable right so I will say if again we are using if conditions if x the value which is coming from the range mod 2 if the result or the remainder is equal to equal to 0 then it's a okay divide by 2 if it is equal to equal to 0 it means it's an even number right in that case I need to add this x into this list so how do we add this we will simply say even list dot append we discussed this append method in our list video in case if you haven't watched please go ahead and refer that video it's going to give you so much information about the list if it is not equal to 0 it means definitely it's any value other than 0 which is 1 in our case so I will say else add this into our list right if equal to 0 add into the even list otherwise add into the odd list and we are done once we are done with this for loop I will simply say print and I will print even list first then I will be printing odd list first sorry odd list after even yeah let's right click run as your program and you can see from 0 to 30 or 0 to 29 these are the even numbers and these are the odd numbers again this program can be man manipulated in any way right that find uh, find the number of Armstrong numbers palindrome numbers anything yeah so this program can be uh, you know manipulated with any other value if I say 100 it will give me the value from 0 to 100 number of even and odd right very easy program I know but uh, I hope you got the concept here we use if conditions else for loop list right so this is how you can play with this again we will be taking some complex examples as well once you move ahead but this is just for your understanding so let's create another file and in this program I will show you how you can create the nested loop okay or the nested for loop again it's very easy it is just you need to follow the syntax which I showed you and everything will remain same okay so in order to show you this example I'm going to create a uh, two list or two set or any two things which can be iterated so I'm going to take list one which will have few things and I will also have list two so this list can have any type of values so let's say I have few names let's say I will take name is Rahul 
second let's say rajiv and let's take one more called mukesh so i have three values within this list similarly i will take three programming language for list two here i will take python then i will take java and the last value i will take let's say javascript now what we did so far we did for and i have taken one variable right let's keep it a space in and i will say l1 colon hit enter sorry colon hit enter again we got the indentation now again i want to write one more for loop and this time i will say for i need one more variable so i will say b space in space l2 colon hit enter and you can see again we got the indentation so what i want i want to print first a value then space okay and then b so now let me show you how exactly it is going to run first of all okay let me show you the output first can you see first it says three times rahul then rahul with python java and javascript then it takes rajiv with three programming language at last it takes mukesh with three programming language so let me show you first of all outer loop will execute right so from l1 it will pick rahul rahul will be assigned into a then it will go inside the second for loop which is a nested loop here from the l2 it will take python now funds first this loop will execute once it is done then it will execute the next iteration of this for loop it will execute again and then it will take the third record and it will execute again thrice so when it start executing it will take python so it will have rahul with python which is this second time when you execute from the l2 it will take java still we have rahul so it will take rahul with java at last it will take js and js with rahul right once this inner loop completes it will go back to again outer loop from l2 it will pick the second record rajiv and then it will say rajiv python java javascript at last it will go with mukesh python java and javascript so this is how we can achieve for loop or i will say nested for loop in python what if i want to have one more is it possible yes you can have again again i will create a new list this list i will just have some values okay or maybe i can just write the location let's say india australia some dummy locations and let's say usa right click okay not right click now uh, let's execute so just after this for loop i will write one more for loop this time i will say c space in i will take l3 this time colon and hit enter let's add print first of all i will print a then plus space then b then using plus again i will create one more space then i will print c so again when it comes to execution now you know how it will work so first of all it will pick rahul okay which it will take list one rahul rahul will be in a then it will go to second loop it will take python and then it will go inside this and this time it will say india so the first iteration will be rahul python india second iteration rahul python australia rahul python usa sec okay once this complete then it will pick rahul java india then rahul java australia rahul js usa once this is done it will take the second record of list one this time again it will start rajiv python india rajiv python australia and rajiv python usa and it will continue so let me just run this and you just observe the output okay as i said first rahul python and then india australia usa once it is done then it will take rahul java with all this which is this and then i will pick rahul js with this values so again depends on your requirement you can have you know multiple nested loops and uh, we will be using this kind of loops when we 
start reading the excel in a nested format okay so don't worry we will be using two for loops not three three it is just i want to show you how exactly it works but two loops is enough i hope it is clear now now the last part before we end this video i want to show you this tuple unpacking so for that let me create a new file and maybe i can create copy of this So in case if you are new to tuple then please watch my previous video regarding tuples where we discussed tuples in detail. Okay so in order to explain for loop with tuples or tuples I just need two to three tuples so that I can show you how it works. So what I will do I will create tuple uh, t1 again okay? and this tuple let's have some values. So I will have two three four very basic tuple. Second tuple I will have let's say ten. 20 and 30 now i want to create list of tuples okay let's have one more tuple quickly so 20 third or let's say 100 200 and 300 perfect i want to create a list of tuples so what i will do i will just say l1 and inside this l1 i will say t1 which is tuple 1 t2 which is tuple 2 and t3 means tuple 3 so this list have actually three tuples so when i say print l1 you will just right click run okay tuple 1 tuple 2 tuple 3 perfect now what if i say i want to iterate these list of tuples so in that case what i will do first of all if i say x in l1 and when i say print x okay so this is going to return me tuples and we got the tuples 2 3 4 which is t1 then 10 20 30 t2 and respect to tuples now i want these values tuples values okay so this is giving me tuple again i can say 1 2 3 or 0 1 2 so let's say if i say x of 0 x of 1 x of 2 right because this is again index based right i can say x 0 x 1 x 2 the moment i run this and i got the specific value 2 3 4 10 20 30 100 200 300 but instead of using this index is there any way to you know get values in a proper variable okay so now yes it is possible with the help of tuple unpacking so what we will do we are getting three values right so what if i say x y z it means first value of tuple will store into x second value of the tuple will store into y third value of tuple will store into z so if i want to get this value i can say x y and z And you can see we got the exact output. Yeah. Okay, so sometimes you will also get this bracket here, which is also fine. Whether you give bracket or not doesn't matter. Okay, so you will get the same output. So this is for loop with list of tuples where you can do the tuple unpacking and you can use the tuple values. Again, you might find this little tricky, complicated, but it's not. Just if you remember the basics. This is all what we did earlier. It is just, I'm just combining everything and we are getting the output. Yeah. So I showed you how in a different ways we can use this for loop. Okay. I could have shown normal for loop, right? But somehow I found for loop is the base of any programming language. So we, sh we have discussed for loop with string, list, set, dictionary, uh, tuples, list of tuples. We have discussed about the nested for loop. Yeah. Today in this video, we are going to talk about while loop in detail. So in the last video, we already discussed about loop. So we started with a for loop, right? So just a quick summary, we are using loop so that we can repeat the task in an efficient manner. So whenever you have some task that you need to run multiple times, instead of using a statement by statement, we can run in a loop, okay, whether it's a for loop or while loop, and we can continue the repeated task, right? Now, we will be talking about while loop and this while loop I will be talking about like first of all while loop 
then while loop with else statement and while loop with break statement while loop with continue statement and while loop with pass statement so we will be discussing about when to use what and it's going to be a very interesting video so stay till the end because you will get to know so many different things about while loop as well so let me quickly start a new file i will create a new file called python file and i will say while demo or let me be very specific while loop demo okay so now while loop also have a proper syntax okay so let's talk about what is the syntax so the first step is you need to initialize okay you need some kind of variables because while loop works on the conditions okay so let's initialize some variables so first step is always initialize a variable so let's say in our case our variable is let's say x so i can give this value as 0 1 2 3 anything so this is our variable you need to write a while and after the while you need to write a condition now this if this condition is evaluates to true it will execute your while loop otherwise it will not execute your while loop okay so it has to be true then only it will execute so let's say i want to print python 10 times or 1000 times or 100 times so i will just say if or while x is less than equal to 10 then add a colon then hit enter the moment you hit enter you can see automatically it is giving us the indentation okay so whatever you will be writing here it will be considered under while loop okay so if you write here it is again a syntax issue so make sure you give the proper indentation here as well now let me print x or whatever variable we have taken in our case it is x so i'm just printing x now once this loop runs okay definitely again once this is done it will go back here again it will evaluate this condition so we need to also do the increment or decrement here right that is optional but in this case we need to give that what should happen to the x once it is done so in our case let's say once it is done i just want to increment by one so in our case when it runs one is less than 10 yes it will say one then it will say one plus one which is two and again it will evaluate this condition two is less than 10 yes it will print two and two plus one three three is less than 10 yes and it will continue like this so let's execute this so right click run you can see i got the value from one to nine because we have written less than 10 right so there will be a condition when it is printing 9 9 plus 1 equal to 10 and then it is evaluating is 10 less than 10 no and it is coming out of this loop right so if you want let's do one thing let's print bye bye let's execute once again so once it is done right it is printing bye bye it means this is coming out of this while loop now let me put a condition here or uh, let me just make it till three let's say four okay and let me just comment this for the time being let me add a breakpoint at line number three so in case if you need to debugging i already discussed a dedicated video where we discussed about debugging so i just added a breakpoint at line number three this time i will say debug as why loop so you can see right now we have variable which is x kind of integer and value equal to one okay one is less than four which is actually a true right so if i say f8 which is step over now the value is one because we haven't incremented it will say one okay and if you want to see this is the console output is one this time when i say x equal to x plus one you would just notice the value here it incremented to two right again it will check if two is less than four yes it will execute now just notice the value this time it is three three is less than four yes it will execute now there will be a chance okay where it will be value is four if four is less than four no it will come out and you can see it will not even execute the inside statement it means it came out of this loop this is first variation second variation let me do one thing let me put another while okay this time i will say x equal to 5 while 5 or let's say x is less than equal to 10 
then print python again okay cool and i missed here now one thing which you will notice here that i am just printing python i'm not making any increment i'm not making any decrement here so what will happen it will keep on running this loop okay unconditionally because we have given the condition this condition will be always true 5 less than 10 print python 5 less than 10 print python 5 less than 10 print python so this condition will never get you know false so let's run this and you can see this condition will never end because 5 is always less than 10 so in this case you have to stop the execution okay so there are two options either you press ctrl c or you can see this option right stop this program the moment you stop this program this will end here i hope you got the point so the moment if you don't increment or decrement the condition will always be true and it will always run an infinite loop so make sure you give some uh, expressions okay which should terminate your while loop or you should give some kind of condition which should come after the while loop if you don't give it will run in this mode so sometimes you might need this forcefully as well whenever you have to run a particular program unconditionally okay let's say you want to monitor a server okay that server is up and running or not and you have to keep on just making a request ping request and you should get the response and it should happen 24 by 7 into 365 in this case you can go with this case where you don't have to you know stop your program it has to do this continuously and it has to continuously monitor it is just kind of one of the scenario but you can just see which kind of scenarios you have and you can implement this while loop accordingly okay let me show the next example while loop with else so what i will do i will quickly create a copy of this program okay so let's say i have a number this number is equal to 10 and now i will write a while if number is less than equal to 10 then let's say 50 okay then simply print the number and increment this number by one again there's no uh, requirement that you should only increment by one you can increment by two three five i'm just incrementing by one now you need to write an else statement okay so the what else will do once this while condition evaluates to false it will execute the else statement okay so let me show you i will just type else colon and i will just write a print statement here that above condition above condition is not true okay let's see how it works so first of all let me make this number as 100 right click run so the moment you execute it says 100 is less than 50 no it's immediately coming to else statement and it is printing this print which is above condition is not true which is this let me make it uh, 10 okay let's execute once again so you can see right now it started executing 10 is less than 15 yes so it is printing 10 then it is incrementing our number by 1 so it is 11 11 less than 15 and it will continue you can see there will be a point where the number will be 14 here right then to say 14 plus 1 equal to 15 15 is less than 15 no then it will come to else and it will say above condition is not true right or maybe you can just modify the statement and say above condition is no more true yeah so it will work in both the cases again it's totally optional in case if you don't want to have this else statement it's okay but yeah you can have while with else as well i hope it is clear well if this condition true it will run your while loop once the while loop is done it will come to else and it will execute this if this while condition is not executing at all it will come to else and it will execute this statement which is above condition is no more true let's do it one more time this time it is 100 and you can see this else part okay now let me talk about while with break while with continue and while with pass okay so now let's talk about first break then i will show the opposite of break which is continue 
so again i will be taking the same example which we are taking now again i will take some number let's say this number is 15 or let's take this number is 5 as of now i will write a while again while loop if number is less than equal to 15 let's say okay colon hit enter now i want to print first of all x sorry uh, number then i will just increment this number by 1 which is num plus 1 and we will write if number which we are iterating is equal to equal to 10 it means it reached till the threshold put colon hit enter and you can see again we got the indentation so if it is equal to 10 now then it should break it should not execute this while so you will see um, let's execute this first so it is ideally it should go from 5 to 15 right because we are just using a while loop but we have added a condition that if number is reaching till 10 and if it is equal to 10 then break this the moment you say break it will break the current loop which is while loop in our case and it will come out I guess it will not execute anything after 9 actually it is executing till 10 but it is not printing but let's say if you want to print 10 then break you can say uh, value or you can just directly print this number so it will also print this number you can see it is also printing 10 because condition is true print number break it i hope it is clear now let's do it one more time this time i will make this number as 50 it will not even execute this while right i will just add as else here condition is no more true you can write any statement it is just i'm giving some statement which is readable to you yeah in our case we have given number as 50 50 is less than 15 which is false and it says this one so you can say i'm able to add break with else because both are independent right now let's make it uh 11 this time okay and what will happen this time see it is executing completely because we have given number equal to 10 which will never get successful because we are starting directly from 11 11 is less than 15 yes it will print 11 increment by 1 which is 12 again 12 is equal to equal to 10 no so it will come again 12 is less than 15 and it will continue so this if will never get executed because we are starting from 11 but if i start from 6 you will see a change in the output okay i hope it is clear let me just remove this old program let's try same example but this time with continue so i will take again number equal to this time i will start from 1 and i will write y num is less than equal to 10 okay num equal to num plus 1 okay so we'll get the increment now i want to check if the number which i'm getting is equal to equal to let's say 5 then earlier we were adding a break but this time i don't want to add a break and i will simply say continue okay so what exactly this continue will do i will tell you but let me just uh, write it here the number okay just notice my indentation within this if i have only one statement which is continue so this print is part of while but only continuous part of if okay because of this indentation so if i write anything here it will come within this if but if i just come out of this indentation it will be part of this while loop so before i explain this okay let me show you the output first just right click run as and one thing which you have to notice here that we are getting two three four but we are not getting five it means once this condition is getting true okay it says continue it means continue from the loop it should not execute this further okay after this whatever statement we have we are saying do not you know can, uh, run them continue with the same while loop break was terminating right but continue says if this condition is true 
then continue which means continue this for loop from this condition again let me show you if i write here called let's say python okay let's execute can you see python is not coming here because this condition is true ideally it should uh, this condition is true then we say continuous it is again executing this while loop but it is not running this if statement so it is not even running this print statement okay i hope it is clear now in case if you want to see let me just do one thing let me put this condition till 3 so that we can immediately see the output i will add a breakpoint at line number 4 and this time i will debug so you can see right now value is equal to 1 now let's say f8 which is step over now we got the value is 2 if 2 equal to equal to 3 no then it will print number now again it is evaluating the condition so our condition num is equal to 2 2 is less than 10 yes now 2 plus 1 3 so you can see we got num as 3 if 3 equal to 3 okay now you can see it entered into this if now when we say continue it is not executing the next statement after continue it is again going back to the while and now it will again check so what is the value of num here 3 3 plus 1 4 4 equal to equal to 3 no it will come and print and it will continue so you, the moment you resume your program you will see the complete output okay let's execute completely and we got the output till then yeah i hope it is clear now so we discussed about while with else here also we can use else i'm not using now but if you want you can add else here as well okay so let's say i just want to add else here as well and i will say uh, condition is no more true okay so this will work exactly how it worked with break as well so if i just execute this okay once the while loop is done again once this condition is false it is coming to else it is this condition is no more true so we discussed while with else while with break while with continue now the last one is while with pass again you might not understand this pass at this point but you will understand once you move ahead i will try my best to explain you what this pass will do okay so let's write a small program for the pass i will write a condition called let's say x equal to zero now when i say while x is less than five then print hello now due to some xyz reasons if i want to comment this code the moment i comment this code you can see i'm getting one syntax error here right it says indent expected now you can see i cannot give comment because we need to write some condition or we need to write some statement within while right so what can we do now consider a scenario that you want to write uh, this while loop but somehow the code is not ready or maybe this condition is not ready you just want to ignore this for the time being and you want to continue so i cannot do comment right because it says indent required it's a syntactical error is there any way that i just want to skip from here is it possible so yes it is possible with the help of pass the moment i say pass you can see now we are not getting any syntax error so as the name suggests pass statement simply does nothing this is actually is used whenever you know you have to complete the statement syntactically but you don't want to add any command or code to execute in our case let's say i have written a while loop but i don't want to complete this while loop as of now i just want to comment this which i cannot do so i can say pass the moment i say pass it will not execute this okay so can i say that can we use pass statement to write empty loop kind of yes okay so whenever you write empty loop you can use pass statements so can we use pass with any other control statements yes you can pa use this pass with a for you can use this with functions you can use with classes let me try to cover one more example okay i hope this will make your concept a little clear so let's create one variable called feedback okay 
So by default, this feedback, I'm just giving a blank string. Now let's use while, and I will be using this feedback variable that we created. And now I will check with a list, okay? I will be using not in and I will be giving a list. So we already discussed about list in detail, right? So in case if you're new to list, please go ahead and watch my previous videos where we discussed about the list in detail. So what I'm doing, actually, I'm just creating a while loop where I'm just checking this feedback within this list. So what condition I'm giving if this feedback, which is this, if not in this list, then ask for the feedback. So now we can use input to take the feedback. So just the moment I say input, it will ask me a prompt, like it will ask user to enter some values. Here I will say, please enter your feedback. Okay, so whatever feedback user will enter, I will store into the same feedback variable. So I will just store into feedback variable and I will just print thank you thank you okay just let me remove all this it's not even required it is just we'll quickly cover this part let's right click and execute okay so by mistake we remove this feedback as well so let me just add feedback and this feedback is just a blank string Okay, now let's execute this program. The moment I say right click, run, you can see it is asking, please enter your feedback. This time, let me enter my feedback as 9, which is not in the list. You can see it is again asking me feedback. So what happened? Let me tell you. The moment you execute this, feedback is blank. Now you can see this will evaluate this variable with this list of values which we have. So we have blank. Is it equal to this? It is not in this list, right? So definitely it will evaluate to true and it will come inside this and it is asking, please enter your feedback. I, and I added nine. So nine got stored into feedback. Again, it will check. Is nine is available in this? No. So nine is not in this list, which is true. So again, it will execute. So it will execute this while loop until I give any value which is in the list okay so let me do one more time it says please enter feedback i will set 10 is 10 not in this list it is again true so again it will ask me one more time please enter feedback but this time if i enter my feedback as 2 okay so the moment i say 2 2 is stored into this feedback 2 not in this which is false so it will come out of this while loop Okay, now you can see it is not asking any other feedback. It is terminating the program. So we will be using while multiple times when we start working with automation. So when we start with Selenium, API testing, RPA, we will be using while loop multiple times. I hope it is clear now. Today in this video, we are going to talk about function in Python. Okay, so till now, whatever videos we have discussed, we discussed about some pre inbuilt functions, right, which comes with Python. So today we'll talk about what exactly is function in Python. So this is the high level agenda for today. We'll talk about what is function, how to create a function, how to call a function, how to call a function, which will return you some values. So we'll talk about the return keyword. Then we will talk about creating a function with some different argument and creating a function with default argument. Just a small disclaimer before we start this video that do not get confused with methods and function. The moment we start working with oops concept then you will get the clear difference between function and method for the time being let's focus on functions as of now okay we'll clarify your doubt once you move ahead so what exactly is function let's see so function is nothing but a set of statement or i will say block of code okay which will do a particular task for you so let's say you have let's say 100 lines of code okay and that 100 lines of code you want to divide into some i will say functions or small blocks so that blocks we will call them as a function okay for the time being we'll continue with functions we'll talk about the methods as well so these functions can be having a proper name okay so if you see this example we can create a very meaningful function name let's say driving cooking video creation this is just a general name 
but when it comes to programming we will be writing function name which will actually tell us what exactly this function will do okay let's say i will be creating one function uh, calculate emi or check the result or get the value from our excel sheet or csv file so whenever we will write a piece of code we will surround them or we will you know club them into a function and we can call them again and again so what exactly function will help us or why we are uh, you know creating function so first of all it will create a modularity it means you will be having a big line of code or let's say 100 or 1000 line of code which definitely will not be a useful right if you do not implement functions the moment we say functions we will be creating some modules technical words will create functions or methods so that we can reuse them okay so once we uh, start the programming i will show you how we can reuse them but it will increase the modularity okay it will increase the reusability and the main part readability if i give you 1000 line of code you might not be able to read it but if i you know break down that particular program into function then it will be very easy for you to read we will be creating multiple function and each function will have a proper name which will represent that what function will be doing so just give me a couple of minutes and i will show you all these things okay so the main part we can also parameter as a function so the moment we start parameterizing our function we will make these functions dynamic okay so we will not hard code some values in the function we will parameterize and based on the parameters our function will behave differently and we will also talk about return keyword so functions can actually return the values using return keyword so let's say you have created some function that will do some set of task and you want to return some result set or some result from that function so we can do that so the first syntax which i want to show you is without any argument okay so if you see here we have a def keyword then we will give a space we'll write the function name pair of parentheses colon and we can continue with the set of statements okay the second will be with argument so as i said we can also pass the argument in the function so as of now in this example i'm only showing you two parameters but you can have n number parameters in the parentheses and it will continue then again set of statements that you need to write followed with indentation now you can also have function with default argument okay so if you can see param 1 is like mandatory but the param 2 i'm also making some default values it means if i don't pass some values for the second parameter it will take the default value and it will continue so don't worry these three we are going to cover in this video and the remaining two we'll talk about in the next video so we'll talk about first without argument with argument and with argument with default now this is just a highlight okay just want to give you what exactly we will cover in the next video it will give you information about the different type of syntax that we are going to discuss so this is known as arbitrary argument here when you don't have the fixed number of you know argument you can use the arbitrary argument where you can pass n number of parameters and it will take all this parameter dynamically next one is arbitrary keyword argument as the name says here we will be passing the dynamic parameters when the number of parameters are not fixed but here we will also pass with the keyword okay so we'll talk about this in detail once you move ahead as of now just focus on the syntax so let's create a function so i will be using a keyword called def and give a space and give the function name so let's say i want to create a function which will print some data so since this is the first method which we are writing i will call this method is hello world pair of parentheses and colon and hit enter the moment you hit enter you can see we got the indentation right so whatever we will be writing here it will be considered within this function so let's say i want to print some data here let's say hello python that's all so this is one of the function now whatever you will write within this function okay you can see the indentation is applied so let's say again i want to write let's say by or let's say again i want to write some more calculation let's say c equal to a plus b or let's say 10 plus 90 and i will say print c you can see all will be considered within this function now the moment you run this program okay so just right click and say run as function demo1 you can see i did not get any output okay the reason is we have created a function okay we have defined a function but we have not called so the moment you write function you need to call them 
so how do we call this function you just need to come out of this indentation okay so now we are back to our normal program now i will be writing the function that we have created the moment i type h and you can see i'm getting auto suggestion that hello world okay now let's right click and run and let's see what exactly it returns so you can see the moment i run this program i'm calling one function called hello world so the control is coming back to this function first of all it's printing hello python which is this then it is doing the calculation which is simply a basic addition it is printing the data which is 100 and printing by right so this is just a very basic function where i have not done anything it is just some print statement and some calculation this is a very basic function now let me create one more function okay and this time i will say hello world and this time i will accept one argument here okay or uh, let's use some other method this is just a very basic one so i will say again a new method called sum so this function will accept let's say two argument so i will take two argument let's say a and b or uh, let's use some number one which is num1 and i will say num2 colon hit enter and you can see again indentation now we can continue with this statement so what i will do i will take one variable called sum okay let's use the result for the time being because we are using the same name i don't want to uh, you know keep you in confusion so i'm using a different variable called result so whatever value we will get in num1 we will just assign here then i will do some arithmetic operation in this example i'm just doing a sum so whatever values we'll get we will just do the plus and we'll have the result and here i will simply say result is result okay now if i want to call this function what i will say sum and you can see it is asking me the two values which is num1 and num2 let me give 10 comma 30 so when you run this program first of all it will execute this function which is hello world and it will come back here and it will execute this function then it will start executing some function so when you say sum 10 so 10 10 will be stored in this variable called num1 30 will be stored in num2 it will do the operation and finally it will give you the result let's run it once again okay and you can see so this is coming from the first function that we created and this is coming from the second function which is sum so this is how you can pass parameters now let me do one thing let me just pass one argument and let's see what exactly it is going to return just run and you can see it is throwing one type error so if you try to read this simply says sum one which is a function is missing one required positional argument called num2 yes because it is expecting two but we are passing only one so in this case it is mandatory to provide minimum two arguments so how do we fix this that also we'll see but for the timing just focus here that we need to pass mandatory argument okay now if you just keep this method or if you just call this some function not the method guys within a print statement let's see what exactly it is going to return let's run it so can you see we got the result which is 900 plus 10 9 10 then it is returning none so what exactly is none is it is actually saying that this function which you are calling it is not returning anything the moment we call this function within the print it says none right but if this function will return something definitely we will get the some values so what we can do using return keyword we will be returning the value from the function as of now this function is not returning anything okay so the type is none but in case this function returns something we will get the value so let's modify this function so what i will do i will create a separate program okay so that you will have this as a reference I'm just doing the copy and paste here and I will call this as function 2 so let's remove this function it's not needed that was the basic one 
Okay, so you can see now this particular statement is throwing me error because it says it is unresolved reference because it is not able to find the function. Makes sense. Let's remove this. Now the next thing is let's say I have one more calculation that I need to perform. That calculation is depend on this result variable which is coming from this function. For example, I want to have one final result variable. Okay, and here I will be adding let's say 90 and I will be using the result which is coming from this function. So if I try to simply say result, you can see it is not able to detect what is the result. The reason is this result variable is only available till this function. Okay, so it means let's say if I want to do some other calculation, let's say final data equal to result, I can access it easily because I'm in the same function. But the moment I try to access this result here, I'm not able to do that because it is coming inside a function. So what we can do once we are done with our calculation, we can use a return keyword here and we can return this result variable, which is result. And now this function will return us the data. So how do we store this data? So if you can see still it is not able to resolve this because it is even though our function is returning something, but we are not accepting into some variables, right? So what we can do, first of all, just remove everything. This time I will be calling a uh, new result variable, some dummy variable I'm creating, and I will call this function. I will use equal to operator, and I will be calling the sum function, and I will be entering some values, let's say 12, 34. And let's print this new result. So what will happen the moment you run this program, it will call some function. It will pass 1234. It will print. Okay. So let's say if I don't want to print what I can do, I can just comment this. I just want the print statement here. So it will do the addition. It will return the result. That result will be stored into this variable that I will use here. Okay. So let's right click run as, and you can see we got here. So let's say I will just give some here that the value value is and you can see we will get the output value is 46 because now this function is returning some value let's modify one thing I will just add as 90 and we got the updated value fair enough so this is how you can retrieve the value from the function which is returning some value and you can accept and you can continue now the next part is what if i don't pass any you know mandatory argument which we just saw right it was throwing error so again it will throw us the type error it says one required optional argument is missing so in this case what we can do we can also provide some optional value here okay which means i will make it as equal to some default value in my case let's say i want to have the default value as zero it means if I pass some value, it will take that mandatory parameter and it will run. But in case if I don't pass, this 12 will be received in num1 and num2 anyways have the default value called 0. So just run this program again and you will see this time we will not get any error. It is taking the default parameters along with our mandatory parameter we got 12. So in this case, if I pass 12 with 12 again, we will be getting the value as 24. Yeah, very cool feature and this can actually help you when you, you know, don't want to pass always all the parameters. You can use the default parameters, right? What is next? Let's say I want to pass three parameters, four parameters. So in this case, what if I simply right click and run? Now it says again, same thing that sum takes one to two positional argument, but four were given because 12 will be received here. 12 will be received here. But what about these two? In this case also, what I can do, I can pass, let's say num3 equal to zero, num4 equal to zero. So let's do one thing. Uh, first example, I will only pass three, which is 12, 12, 34. So what will happen? 12 will be stored in num1. 12 will be stored in num2, 34 will be stored in num3 now. We are not passing the fourth. So this will be taking the default value. Let's run it. 
and okay we did a small mistake that we did not add the num3 so i will just add num3 and num4 here yeah and now let's run it and you can see we got the final output 24 plus 34 which is 58 since we have not passed the fourth parameter it is accepting this one so i hope you got the overall idea of default parameters so till now we discussed about the uh, you know zero uh, without any argument or you can say zero argument then we have seen the mandatory arguments then we have seen the default argument we also have discussed about the return how you can return the values now let me show you one more example it's going to be very interesting and uh, we will be using this a lot once you move ahead so let me create another file called function demo 3 and let me remove everything this time I will be saying again a new function and hello I will say greetings okay I'm just giving greetings to the user and what I will do I will just take here two argument so guys just a small disclaimer do not get confused with parameter or argument they both are same what we are exactly we are doing now I will accept one argument called first name then I will accept the last name and I will be just printing uh, you know hello or welcome first of all I will be using first name then I will be using last name here fine so if I want to call this I will say greetings and let's say Mukesh and I will say Otwani let's run this just double click here let's run this and you can see it says Mukesh Otwani okay we need to give one space so what I will do I will just add one space here okay and let's run it once again and you can see we got Mukesh Otwani so what is the difference this is what we discussed but let me tell you what if I change this order if I just say this is Otwani and what is this uh, let's Mukesh so definitely it will take welcome Otwani Mukesh so let me show you another way to pass these parameters or the argument so instead of passing uh, directly you can also mention that I want to pass the first name which is going to Mukesh okay comma and now I can tell L name which is already mentioned here right and I can say the last name is Otwani so instead of passing this way I can use this way as well so let me just comment this and let's run you can see it says uh, welcome okay should only because now this value is assigned to this parameter which is f name and this value is assigned to this variable which is l name now just to show you what if i change this will it you know uh, give the different output no because now we have bounded that i will be giving this value and assigning to this right so this time i have changed the order but still the moment i run i'm giving the same output because now this value is linked with l name which will be stored here this is stored oh uh, sorry this value is stored into f name which is here so based on your requirement either you can go with this where you need to follow the exact sequence in which sequence you are passing the parameter or argument but here you just need to give exactly in which uh, you know variable you want to store finally let's do one more thing I will say marks now if I say I want to store marks as well marks what should be the mark let's say 95 let's change here as well I will just say here marks and I will just say save 95 so now it doesn't matter in which order you give it will always get the same values now because these values are linked with these names which is nothing but the parameter name right it is not printing here because we haven't given here the print statement I will just say I also want to know the marks okay now just run this okay so it simply says you cannot you know uh, concat so what I will do here I will just uh, convert this into a string this we have seen in the past right now I can use them in the print statement and you can see we got the value I hope it is clear now this is what exactly I wanted to cover now if you are interested I also want to show you a different example where I will be passing list as a parameter it will do the calculation 
and it will return as a list okay so we'll pass as a list do the calculation get the values as a list and we will process it using the same concept which i showed you just now okay so just give me two to uh, a couple of minutes i will show you that example then it will make so many things clear so let me quickly create one more function and this time i will make it as four and let me remove everything so let's create a function i will just use def keyword and let me create a function called check even numbers so i will just write check even numbers now i will be following one convention again so i will be uh, you know separating them with underscore it will make it more readable so check even number now we will do a small logic here this logic we already discussed in our previous videos we are going to use a mod operator so let's say i'm getting one result variable so this function will accept one argument called number or num1 so whatever number we will get i will just do a mod operator and i will say mod by 2 if the result is equal to equal to 0 then it's a even number if it is not equal to 0 it's an odd number for example if i pass 3 mod 2 will get remainder as 1 that is odd number but if i say 10 mod 2 will get 0 which is remainder right then it's a even number so once it is done i will simply print the result okay let's do one thing let's test so i will call this function call check even number i will pass let's say first 5 so 5 will be received here 5 mod 2 equal to 1 definitely it's not equal to 0 then we will be getting a result so what is the result it's false false means this equation is not true false means it's a odd number if i just make it 10 let's see we got true fair enough so let me just create this method in an effective way so instead of accepting one number i will be accepting a list here okay so let me give a list one because i want to get not one number i will be passing multiple numbers and i want to check all these numbers are even or odd or not fine now what i will do i will just create a dummy list so i will just say i have a dummy list so here i will say even numbers i'm just creating a variable so this variable is nothing but a list type so i'm just creating a blank list so in case if you're new to list we already discussed about list right so i'm creating a list here which is blank as of now so whatever values we will get inside this list first of all i need to run a for loop right so using for loop i will get all the numbers one by one i will do the mod operator if equal to zero it means it's an even number and then i will add that even number into this list that is the logic so i'm going to run a for loop again if you're new to for loop please go ahead and watch the for loop concept i'm going to use one variable called a b c or x y z let's say x in so whatever list values i will be getting right i will be passing here colon all the values will be stored into x right so now i will say if x mod 2 equal to equal to 0 it means it's a true right if it is equal to true i want to add that number into this list so what i will say even number and in the list we have one method called append right i will be appending this value which is x in case if it is not then i will just write the else colon and i will simply use the pass now we don't want to do anything i simply want to just you know pass that statement so this pass also we discussed in the previous videos so this is one of the easiest logic where you will be passing a list we will also have the empty list we will iterate all the list one by one we'll do mod by two mod two if equal to zero it means it's an even number then we are going to just add that value into this list if not then simply pass and i also want to return okay because we will get all the numbers here right so once we are done i just want this even number list so i will simply say return 
and I will simply return this even number from here. Now let's call this function. So how do you pass the list? As we have discussed earlier that whenever you have to pass a list you need to use brackets and you can pass the n number of values. So let's say I will pass some random values 1, 3, 4, 6 and 8. So as we know 4, 6, 8 is even number right. Let me add 32. Let me add 64. Some more even values. And now let me run this. Okay. So there is a small change that we need to make in the program that the moment we call this function it is returning this number right but where we are receiving nowhere so I will say this is my result which is nothing but a list so I will simply go and print this result and you can see we got all the even number from that list so this is the list that we passed right 4 6 8 32 64 we got all the numbers. I hope it is clear. What if you want to simply reverse it? Okay. In that case, let's say I will just create another empty list called odd numbers. And here I will do opposite. Okay. Here what I will say, if equal to equal to zero, then simply do a pass. But if it is not equal to zero, then append all the values into this odd number list that we created yeah and once you're done we will simply return this and now let's run it once again this time you will only get the odd numbers and you can see we have only two odd numbers which is one three let me add 99 let me add 87 and just run this program and you can see we got all the odd numbers so very easy program it is just you need to understand the few things that we discussed so here we have used a list concept for loop concept if else we have used functions with return right so this is how we will be writing further programs now if i want to add further checks okay this is going to be just the last condition don't worry what i will do first of all i will you know check this uh result length okay let's say i do not have any odd number okay for example i'm not passing any odd number this time so what should be my result it's a blank list right but i want to give some you know small condition that if it's an empty list it means if it is not returning any number then it simply it should print that this list is empty no even number found or no odd number found so i'm going to again use one if condition and I will be using one inbuilt function called length where this is the result right I will simply say result if the result is greater than equal to zero okay or simply say greater than zero then print the result which is nothing but actually our final data right but if it is less than zero or it's a blank then i will simply say else and i will say sorry no odd number found let's do one thing right now you can see the list which i'm passing is four six eight no not even odd number is present right so right click run as and you can see sorry no odd number found and if I just add let's say 1 and uh, 5 two odd numbers I'm adding this time when I run you can see we got the prop out so this is how you can play with the programming and what we did actually we changed the logic but we have not changed the method name so let me this change this method name to check odd numbers because what we did is odd number right so instead of giving this method I will say check odd numbers and you will get the same output I hope it is clear now if you have any other question please let me know in the comment section and I will be happy to assist you. So do not skip the next video because that will talk about arbitrary argument and arbitrary keyword argument which is actually going to help you a lot once you move ahead. Just to give you one example if I open this length function right 
can you see this we have aigs and we have kwaigs what exactly they are we will see in the next video today in this video we are going to talk about what exactly is arbitrary argument and what is arbitrary keyword argument what is the difference between star args and what is the difference between double star kwaigs we'll see in this detail one by one so in our previous video we already discussed right how to create a function how to call a function how to pass the parameters or argument so in our previous videos we have seen that if i if my function accept two parameters then i have to pass two parameters if i if my function accept 10 parameters i have to pass 10 parameters but what if there is a situation that you don't know that how many argument will be passed to your function okay then how you can handle it so we can handle it easily with the help of arbitrary argument so let me explain you through a basic program then you will get the clear difference and the real usage so i'm going to create a function so i will be using dev and let's say i'm just using one function name called print underscore names and whatever names i will be getting here let's say name one name two and i will simply print them okay so i will say whatever name one we are getting we will print what if i say one more let's say name two i just need to say name two right so if i call this function let's say print name i will say let's say python comma i will say let's say java so python will be stored here then java will be stored here and the moment i say you can see i'm getting python and java what if i say i want to also print c when I right click run this program we will be getting this error because okay let me run it again we will get this error that this function print name takes two positional argument which is this but we are passing three fair enough it means I need to use one more variable here right let's say name three and this I will print here name three this program will work right now we know that how many parameter i'm passing so it we can easily change our function and we can accept and you know continue second way is like we can also assi assign the default values but again the number of parameters should be fixed what if i don't want or if i don't know the number of arguments or the parameters which i will be receiving so we will be writing star and args so what does it mean that whatever values we will be passing will be stored into ARGS. Okay, so let me just do one thing. Let me print this ARGS. Let me just say ARGS. You can see I'm not getting any error at all. Let me simply run this. Then I will explain you the you know, program. So now if you notice the output which you are getting is coming in a form of tuple or tuple. So in case you need to tuple, please go ahead and watch my tuple video. We discuss what is tuple, how to retrieve the values and all. Okay, it means if I'm passing three values or three parameters, it is able to accept and it is able to print. What if I pass two more values? Let's say I'm printing JavaScript this time and let me also print Ruby. Will it work? Yes. So just run this and you can see it is taking all the five values. So it's kind of dynamic that depends how many values you're passing. It will be stored into ARGS and we are able to use it so the first point that you need to remember that ARGS will receive value as a tuple so you can see we got this value as tuple so we also know how to retrieve the value from tuple right so if I say print ARGS let's say one I will simply comment this let's do not comment let's simply run it so you can see this is our tuple right and we know tuple also works in indexes so it's a 0 1 2 3 4 right so if i say args 1 it means i am only asking for java and we got java what if i say args 3 which is 0 1 2 3 it should give me javascript this time right so if i say 4 i will get ruby but if i say 6 or any other index which does not exist definitely you are going to get index error that we used to get with tuples right which is acceptable so one thing is clear that we can pass a number of argument with the help of arbitrary arguments so is it mandatory that i should only use args no it is just a variable you can write mukesh as well okay so in that case 
you can access this tuple with the help of Mukesh. So all this value will be stored into Mukesh. This will receive all the values as a tuple and then we can access the tuple. But as a standard, we follow ARGS, which simply, or I will say the shortcut of arbitrary argument. Okay. So when you open the Python documentation or when you open, uh, you know, a standard function, which is created by standard developers, they will be using ARGS. I hope it is clear now. Let me show you one internal or I will say inbuilt function in Python, which is called length. Okay, so if I open this length inbuilt function, you can see this function accepts one ARGS, which is arbitrary argument and one keyword, arbitrary keyword argument as well. So we discuss about this, right? We will also discuss about this. What if I want to retrieve all the values from this tuple? Yes. Can we do that? Definitely we can do that. So one way is this, I can print the complete tuple. I can get the specific value. What if I simply want to run a for loop with this tuple? So I will say for, sorry, for, let's say some name, space in, and this is our tuple, right? Which is Mukesh, I will say Mukesh here. All the values will be stored one by one into this name variable, which I will print directly here. Yeah, let's run this. And you can see we got all the values this time. It is taking Python, it is printing next time it is taking Java and it's running. So I will make this a standard. Okay, because this is what we have to follow. Again, just to show you that we can use anything I have just renamed it, but we'll continue with ARGS. Okay, let me show you one more program. What if I just want the total number or the total sum of all the numbers that we are passing as an argument. So I will say get sum of all numbers. So here I will say star ARGS that whatever number of arguments I will get, I will receive as a tuple. Then I will just do a sum and I will return them. Okay, so one way is like you take a variable add, get the values from the tuple, just add them and finally return. I will call a sum function. Okay, you can see it's a built in function where I just need to pass the iterable object, which is in our case, it's a tuple, which is ARGS, right? ARGS. Okay. What if I want to get them? Okay, let me first of all run this. Okay. Uh, what I will do, I will just call this function call get sum of all numbers. And here I will pass 10, uh, 30, 60, three values. Okay. So ideally 30, 60, 10 will be 100. It should give me value as 100. Let's run it. We got value as 100 because this is received as a tuple and we are calling a some function on tuple, which will give me the final value. Okay. What if I want to create one more function, which will simply calculate the minimum number or it should give me the minimum number or the maximum number. So I'm just creating two more methods here. I will say get minimum number or let's say minimum number. Okay. And uh, I will just call this as a give me maximum number. Okay, so we haven't called this. So let me call this again. Uh, I will say get maximum number. I will say 98, 78, 1, 2, 2, 8. Okay, so what it will give out of all this argument that I'm passing, it will give me the maximum number, which should be 90, right? Ideally. Now I will call another method, sorry, function this time, which is get minimum number. And let me call this as uh, let me just pass some random values and in this case it should return me value as 2 right let's run so you can see we got 100 which is the sum then I call the max number so it is giving me the maximum is 90 
and when I call get minimum it is giving me 2 so it means we can receive these values in a form of tuple and we can do the calculation or whatever uh, you know required operation you have to do based on your requirement very interesting you will use multiple times once you move ahead let me create another example for arbitrary keyword argument for example let me create a function using def and let me call this function name as again print names okay and let me use underscore names and parenthesis colon and here in this i will be taking arbitrary keyword argument so here we need to use two asterisk okay or two star and now you can give any name so let me use the standard name which is key w a r g s but again as we discussed you can use any name but this is the standard which we use keyword uh, arbitrary keyword arguments now whatever values we will be getting let me simply print here now let me call this function i will say print names and this time i need to pass keyword arguments okay so let's say i want to pass keyword argument as my name which is let's say mukesh okay then you need to give comma then i will give let's say my address let's say address i will put bangalore then finally i want to let's say enter my phone number i will say phone number and i will give some value and let's say the final thing call pan card let's stick to three the moment i right click and run this program just notice the output all these keyword argument have received with arbitrary keyword arguments now one thing which you have to notice is this is coming in a form of dictionary okay so the complete values that we have passed it's getting received as a dictionary now it's up to you how do you want to retrieve the value from this dictionary okay let's say this is a dictionary right which is k w a r g s i simply want the address how can i get the address i will simply say k w a r g s in the brackets i will only say i am looking for address so this is how do we traverse the dictionary right we already discussed this in our previous videos so I'm I'm getting this as a dictionary from the dictionary I'm looking for address and you can see we got Bangalore since we were printing this as well it is printing the complete dictionary but if I simply comment it out and I will only say I'm looking for address we got Bangalore what if I need phone number I will simply go ahead and change this to phone perfect so this is the difference when you go with normal arbitrary argument you can pass the values and it will be received as a tuple but when you go with arbitrary keyword argument it will be receiving or it will receive as a dictionary and then it's up to you how do you want to traverse this dictionary now let's say i want to traverse all the values again i can use for loop right where i can simply get all the values and i can also get all the keys as well it's totally up to you you will get this as a dictionary so if you want to cross check whatever we will do we will simply say type yeah and i just want to see the type of this kwargs variable and you can see it's coming in a form of dictionary fine now if you open any built-in function that we have right this is just a built-in function from python you will see most of the time your built-in function will receive one argue on your uh, arbitrary argument and arbitrary keyword arguments so is it possible to pass both yes we can do that so what i will do let me create one more and i will simply say hello world okay so first of all i will say args star args and for arbitrary keyword argument i will say double star k w args and let me simply print okay so i will print args and i will print kwargs now when i call this i will simply say hello world and i need to pass now first arbitrary arguments then arbitrary keyword arguments so let's say i'm passing 10 20 30 so what does it mean 
this is not a keyword argument right so this all will be stored into ARGS but the moment I say name equal to let's say Python okay and let's say if I say country equal to let's say India so these two values okay these two arguments will be received under KWARGS so let me just run and show you can you see this this value which is ARGS which is 10 20 30 is coming here and remaining two things which is name and country is coming under KWARGS I hope it is clear now it is just you need to pass multiple values and based on your values this will receive as a tuple and this will receive as a dictionary I hope it is clear now what one last thing I want to show you is this possible that I can take one more you know argument here called name then how it will behave okay just run this program okay and you can see okay this is a sub silly mistake I have done I will say I will use some different variable okay f name now if you observe the output okay I have not printed actually let me print f name as well here right click run as yeah so this is the output when you have in this manner the first argument will be received into f name okay which is coming this 10 and the subsequent one now this is done right so whatever you will pass now 20 30 this will be received under ARGS and this will be received under KWARGS okay you will see multiple times this kind of syntax as well where you will be using uh, argument then arbitrary argument and arbitrary keyword argument okay so this is what I have for today today in this video I will be showing you how you can read the Python documentation because till now whatever we have discussed right you must have understood but let's say you want to explore a few more things about python which we haven't covered in the last videos or let's say you have some additional requirement which you are not able to find anywhere you can go back to python documentation and search about that particular module and you can search about the syntaxes the different built-in functions they have okay so let's let me show you just type python and just type python documentation so you will get their official documentation so you can see here at python.org doc just click on this and you can see we have a documentation tab so again depends on your requirement you can read the documentation so they have a different categories so first is the docs then they have audio and videos then they have beginner guide developer guide faq and so many other things so as of now since we are starting i will just click on the python docs and you will get their official page now again on the left hand side you can see we have the different documentation for the different releases right so as you can see now python 2.7 is out of support so you can see uh, we have all the versions documentation here okay so you can just navigate and you will get the documentation but right now we are using 3.8.5 at the time of recording which is stable version and you can see 3.9 is in pre-release phase and 3.10 under development so don't worry let's focus on 3.8 which is by default it is detecting now very important part here in case if you want to start from the scratch you will find the tutorials what's new in the python 3.8 okay and the main important part as you can see here library references and you can see they have clearly mentioned keep this under your pillow so let's open this library references and you can see the different libraries which they have so if you have followed my previous videos we discussed so many built-in functions so far right so just if you open built-in functions so these are the built-in functions which they have already provided so let's say you want to explore something about these functions let's say i want to explore about this main function so it will exactly show you that what is this what parameters it will accept what exactly it will return and what this function will do okay so i would highly recommend you to go with this you know uh, standard library section which they have because once we move ahead we will be talking about modules as well so you can see if you come down here we have the different modules available okay we have different services available 
plus we have all that information about the exceptions the built-in types they have so everything standard library related thing you will get here so let's say i will uh, let's say i want to show you something about the unit testing so they have given the separate section for unit testing let me also show you the os module that we want to discuss in future so you will get all the information about all the modules everything will be available under standard libraries so please go ahead and check out this uh, library references okay it will give you so many additional details as well now there are some other information like how to set up and usage faq and distributed python module and so many other stuff so this documentation will help you a lot so if you have gone through my previous videos right uh, we discussed about mac installation so if i open this python setup and usage you can see they have mentioned if you're working with different platform let's say working with mac linux okay windows and different operating system you will find all the information about downloading installing setting up the path everything from this section yeah so it's all about the theory part on this video it is just i want to highlight that how you can read the documentation and if you want to become the master in python definitely you should know how to read the documentation as well okay so let me show you one important fact here let's say i want to explore something about the str which is nothing but a string class so you can see right side we have a quick search option right the moment i type here str and hit enter so you can see right we got so many things so as we know that this is a predefined class right so you can see here we got a python class which is a, again in the built-in type the moment i click here you can see it's a class and what exactly parameters it accepts what exactly the value it will return everything you will find for that particular class so this is just a quick way in case if you don't want to you know go through the complete documentation you want to search for a specific thing you can do the quick search here and you can also see in the left hand side we have again table of content so in case if you want to jump from one topic to another topic just check out this table of content and you will get to know so many other stuff let's say i want to explore more about the list part so just click on this list and again it will give you all the information about the list so don't worry it is just a, a quick video to show you the how to read the documentation but once you move ahead i will be using this documentation very often and i will be giving this links like what to explore next okay so that's a quick video and i hope this will be helpful so again guys if you want to become master in python you should know how to read the documentation okay today in this video we are going to talk about modules in packages in python so till now we have covered so many examples right we have created so many python files we have created a couple of examples but today we'll talk about the modules now what exactly is module is module is just a python file okay don't get confused with this technical term called module and packages we'll discuss this in detail but in clear words module is just a python file or you can say any file with dot pi extension you can consider as a module so one module can contain you know multiple functions we can also have classes we can also have some variables so module can also have some runnable code so what exactly i will do i will uh, divide this video into three parts so in the first part we will see how to use the existing modules which comes along with python in the second part we will try to create some uh, modules okay uh, which is like user defined modules and we will try to use them in the third part we will see some external modules which is not available in python a uh, standard library okay we need to download these modules separately uh, or i can say we have to download these packages and modules separately and we have use we have to use it okay so it is going to be very informative so please stay till the end because we are going to discuss a lot about modules and packages so to start let me show you the official documentation of module so if you go to docs.python.org so this is what official documentation says a module is nothing but a file which contains python definition and statement in simple words in module we can have function classes variables etc and what exactly is packages packages is just a way where we can structure all the python modules it means if you have multiple packages or multiple uh, modules you can combine into packages we also have sub packages that also i will show you but for the time being modules is just a python file and combination of multiple modules we can combine into packages so just to give you idea 
let's say i have to build a very build or uh, let's say i have to build one uh, bank application and i have these modules already available in my project let's say i have one module which take care about the car loan i have another module which is again nothing but a python file called home loan and another module called python loan so these three files is already available in my system right so in case if i have to build one bank application definitely i can reuse this module so let's say i have to build some application let's say for public bank and private bank so i can reuse these modules so somehow modules will help you a lot when it comes to reusability plus it will make your code readable as well okay so we will not jumble everything into one way in one file we'll create multiple modules and each module will have one you know uh, logical group of code or statement so when you combine multiple modules into one package okay or i will say folders so officially we'll call them as a python packages so when you create python package you will also get one you know standard underscore underscore init underscore underscore py file that i will show you what does it mean okay so let's use some existing packages which comes along with python so i'm going to create a separate file so whatever examples i have covered so far i already you know structured them into a proper packages so i will be sharing these packages with you in case if you want to directly try just open these packages and you can use these programs so let me create a separate python file okay or yeah let's create a separate file maybe i will just right click on this python tutorials and i will create a new python file and i will say uh, modules demo one okay so this is a separate file now let's say i want to see existing modules which comes with python so if i go to official documentation if you scroll up you will just navigate to the documentation part and uh, just come back here and can you see library references so these are the standard library which comes along with python let's say i want to explore about calendar module okay which comes along with python and you can see right this calendar the moment you click here it gives you first of all the source code okay in case if you want to explore the source code this complete source code is available on github so that you can ex in, you know, explore from your side and one module can also import another modules as you can see this calendar module internally is using some other modules as well so don't worry i will explain you this import and from but for the time being i'm going to use this calendar module now and if you see the description it simply says this module will allow you to output calendar like the unix cal program and it will provide some additional function which is related to calendar okay so similarly we also have time module we have os module calendar module and so many modules which is already they have listed here if you go back and see you will find all the modules which is coming so right now i'm going to show the calendar module let me show you how do you import this module and how you can use it so let me go back to pycharm the moment you have to use any inbuilt module you just need to say import and you can say import is getting populated just hit enter after a space give that module name module is ju just again a python file so i'm going to use a calendar module which is inbuilt so it is coming as an auto suggestion now if i have to use this calendar okay so let's see how we can use i will say calendar dot and you can see all the functions which is available in the calendar is getting populated for example i just want to see the month okay so you can see we already have a month right now within this month function i just need to provide some argument that i want a specific month from this particular year for example i am recording this video in september september 2020 so if i want let's say calendar of 2020 and you can see it will also ask you which month you want so let's say i want for the month of september which is the current month so let me store the output let's say in a variable called result okay and let me print this result so just say print and say result just right click and simply run and you can see we got the current month okay and you can see it is giving you in a proper format it says september 2020 and it is giving me complete uh, calendar of 2020 september that's awesome this is inbuilt module which is created by python so right now i'm not jumping too much detail into calendar module okay once we move ahead we'll talk about the different module which exist when to use what okay but you can see how we are able to use it 
right now let me show you one more example i want to use one os module so again you say o import and just type os we already have a os module from python side now this time if i say os dot again you will see i will couple i will get couple of variables and i will get couple of methods so let's say i want to again get you know call some methods so you can see these are the methods which is coming the moment i type get i want to simply just want current working directory which is get cwd hit enter and it should return you current working directory so let's print that i will say print and just execute this program okay i will comment this or maybe i will keep this at last okay let me paste it here now simply let's right click and run once again so you can see i got my current working directory so this is the current working directory where my project is you know located so if you see current working directory is c user pycharm project and python tutorial so how it is coming it is coming from predefined os module get cmd is a function which is under os module what if you want to explore few more function from os module just type get and you will see all the methods which is coming here i hope it is clear now so let's clear the output let me show you one more module so this module i will say just say import and i will call one more module called math module okay so from this math module now you can also call all the functions which is coming from math mo math module so i will say print let's use math module again and i will say dot and you can just type a square root so this square root function will simply ask you one argument and it will calculate the square root of that number so let's say i want to provide number as 4 so it should give you the square root of 4 so let me just comment out these two print statement right click run as module demo 1 and you can see we got the square root of 4 if you want to explore more about this let's say math module or let's say this function just press control from the keyboard and just put mouse over and click and you can see it's coming from math module which is math.py file and we are using this method sorry function called square root so what exactly it does it returns the square root of the number which you are passing yeah i hope it is clear so this is the first part where we are calling some inbuilt module which is coming from python what if i want to create my own modules and i want to use it let's see so let me just close this file and let me simply clear, clear the output so let me create my own module so i'm going to create a new python file as we know module is nothing but a simple python file so i will give name called my module okay and within this module i'm going to create some functions so we discussed about the function in detail so in case if you haven't seen my function video i would highly recommend to watch that videos because we discuss a lot about functions so i'm creating a function called hello world okay just a dummy function and i will say hello world and we simply prints hello world okay and i will say hello world from python yeah now just save this file and just close it and let's create a new python file this is actually my separate file and from this file i'm going to call the module that we created okay here i will say X, uh, let's say my program some dummy name I'm giving don't worry so now if I want to use this module that we created okay so what is the module name is my module right so I will say import and just type M and you can see I'm getting auto suggestion that my module right the moment I just hit enter this module is getting imported automatically so in case if I want to use the function which is available in this module, I will say my module dot and you can see I'm getting hello world. Let's say I want to run this, just right click and run. And you can see this output is coming from this function which is available under this module. So if I just open this, it says hello world from Python. What if I create another method, if I say def I will say let's say calculate EMI okay again it's just some dummy value I will enter I will say EMI is let's say 20k now if I want to call this particular function 
from this program again I will say since it is available under same module I will say my module dot and you can see I'm getting a function called calculate EMI so let's run this and you can see I got the same output so now can I have my own function in this uh, Python file yes we can have so let's say I'm creating one more function here and this time I will say let's say home EMI okay and this time again I will give some dummy print statement that home EMI is 50k okay 50k INR so if I want to call this function I will just say home EMI and let's run this so first of all it is printing hello world yeah because it is this is now python interpreter is coming into picture so it is executing your statement you know program statement by statement so first it is executing this function then this function then finally it is coming to home emi which is nothing but a function which is internally you know calling this function so this is just a way to call function from another module but if you have function within the same module you don't need to say you know that module name you can directly say home emi and you are able to call now what if i want to call all the functions directly i don't want to call every time my module this my module that so what we can do okay let me just create another program and i will say my program 2 so in this one what i will say first of all i will say from now what is our module our module is my module right now in my module which is uh, this file I have two functions right if I want to import any specific function so I just say import and I can say which function I want let's say I want only hello world so if I want to call hello, hello world this time I don't have to call the module name I can directly say hello world the moment you say right click run as you can see I'm getting hello world from python because we have directly imported that function first of all we said from this module import this function now what about the second function which is calculate emi so can i call directly no you can see i'm not getting suggestion because we have not imported so can i import again yes we can do that again i will say my module import and this time i will say calculate emi Right? So again, I will say this time calculate EMI and I can directly use it. Perfect. What if I have multiple functions? So this approach definitely will not be helpful, right? Because I'm importing all the function one by one. Is there any way that I can import multiple function within a one statement? Yes. So what I would do, I will just remove this statement. I will put comma and I will just say here calculate EMI. So I can give multiple functions here and it will import all the function. So the moment I run this, you will get the same output because functionality wise we have not changed. It is just I have, uh, you know, imported two functions in one statement. Now, is there any way that if I have, you know, 100 function, then do I have to mention again one by one? No. In case if you want to import everything, you can also give import star. So, okay so just to give you example i will create one more uh, function here and this function name i will give personal loan emi and this time i will make it let's say 10k so you just notice here i have not imported any specific one i just said import star so i will just call personal loan emi and the moment i run this program and you will get the output okay because of this wildcard or you can say star yes i hope it is clear so this is fine when we have under the same directory right now we have all the files within the you know current working directory so what i will do now let me create one package okay the moment i create package just notice one thing okay i will just say here my package hit enter the moment you hit enter it will create one package for you and you will also get one additional file called underscore underscore in it underscore underscore dot py file this file is completely blank as of now okay so this is just a way which python understand that this is a python package okay so don't worry about this file what is the you know i will say the importance 
how do we use we'll see in, in separate video sometime as of now by default when you create python package it will have one file with this way python will understand that this is a normal python package so what if i keep my module within this package so i will just do one thing i will do control x and i will just do control v yeah you can see now my module is available under this package what if i want to use it so again if i go here let's right click okay so by default if you just notice here automatically since this is now pycharm functionality that it is also modifying your existing code because we did refactor right so now it says first go to my package then go to this particular module called my module and then import everything okay so when you have your modules in some package you need to first give the package then you have to give the module and then you can import the specific functions so if you just remove it okay and now you can see right it is throwing error because it is not able to understand where is my module it is not able to find so if i say go to my package okay let me just note it down here i will say from what is the package name my package dot my module and then we'll say import star then it will work so this is called package and if you want to access any module within that package we need to use this dot operator just keep this point in mind now one last point can i have one more sub package inside this package yes i will say my sub package and you can see this package have this init file and my sub package also have an init file okay so i don't want to call this lengthy name so i'm just giving an init file but it's actually underscore underscore init underscore underscore dot py file now let me create one more file this is going to be very quick file so i will say my sub module okay and again i will say uh, hello python just any random function i'm creating okay don't worry i just want to show you the concept of packages and modules so program complexity we will see later i will say hello python now what if i want to call this function okay here so first of all let me just okay let me just put a multi comment and i will put everything here okay now if i want to call function which is under sub module how can i say that first of all i need to navigate till my package right so i will say from my package dot you can see i also have my sub package and you can see the colors as well right this is kind of a package and this is a module which is python file so i will say go to my package then go to my sub package then go to my sub module and import what is the function name it's hello python right so i will say import hello python and now this time when i simply say uh, hello python i can directly use it okay so do not get confused i just actually just want to show you the multiple scenarios so that in future if you get this kind of requirement you can do it easily so this is how we can create our custom module okay i will say um, not predefined our own modules our own packages our own sub packages and how we can deal with it so please try it from your side it's very interesting very useful and super easy it is just you need to understand the concept so the last part which i want to show you what if i have some external package which i want to download and use it how can we do that because the first example was the predefined modules which we had then we created our own modules now let's talk about third party modules so let's say i want to automate my web application okay so in order to automate my web application i need selenium selenium is again one of the library which will help you to automate your web browser so what i will do i will just type selenium python just hit enter and uh, just go to this section which is selenium in python so this is one of the way so this is the installation guide you will get here the moment i click on installation 
you will see we will get one command called pip so what exactly is pip we will see in detail but as of now with the help of pip you can install any third party packages okay so we just need to say install and what is the package name and you will get this package in your local system and you can start using it okay or in case you want to let's say do api testing then definitely you need one more module called request module so using request module you can do the api testing now how can i use that request module again i need to search uh, python and i will say request module okay so you can see again we got here uh, the official documentation for request okay in order to use request module we need request package so this is how the official documentation so let me do one thing uh, let me show you one example so that you will get a clear picture and once you move ahead we will have a dedicated series on api testing with python selenium with python okay and mobile automation with python and so on as of now quickly in let me install this request package okay so you can see this right we have pypy.org here you will get all the packages which is available so i'm just going to use one request module which is simply going to help you to perform kind of api testing so this request package will allow you to send all the http request and you can just play with the data so how do we first of all install this package okay they have not given here so let me just go to documentation yeah and the user guide first of all installation of request and every time you will find pip install and finally the package that you want to install okay so let me open my pycharm or you can directly you know do this from the cmd as well let me show you directly from pycharm itself the moment you click on terminal this terminal window will open just type pip space install and just type the package name that you want to install so i will say the package is request hit enter it will take few seconds depends on your requirement and it will install that package in your system so you can see installing collected packages and finally it installed okay so i already have this so it says requirement already satisfied but in case you don't have this package it will you know take few seconds and it will install this package for you now let me show you how to use this first of all you can refer their official documentation okay so this is their official documentation like how you can use it so let me show you for this i will create another package okay let me close everything i don't need any any of them i will just go ahead and create a new package and i will say api testing demos you can see i got this package i got this file as well let me create another python file this python file i will say uh, make api request that's all now since we have you know installed this package now inside this package we have one module called requests module so let me just type import and now let me import the requests module okay the moment i type req you can see i got this request right now the moment i say request dot let me just make a get call so guys in case if you don't understand this example that is completely fine because this is a little bit from the api side that we will be making few requests to the server and we will be getting the response okay so don't worry about this in case if you don't understand i just want to show you this module which we downloaded externally and we're using it so i'm just calling a request module and i'm calling one function called get function where i will be passing one url and i should get the response from the server so let me just hit google.com okay which is known to everyone so i will just say www.google.com and i will be getting a response the moment i make a get request that response let me store into res variable which is response now let me say print response hit okay just right click run it is making actually request to the google.com and you can see we got the response is 200 
again if you don't understand this response it's completely fine it is just you need to understand how we are using it so let me show you a couple of other things which we can do from this rest uh, rest variable that we got which is nothing but a response let's say i want to capture some cookies okay let's say i want to capture the url the end url okay that we have just called and let me just only capture the response code okay so just give here status code and finally i just want the text the response in a text format okay yeah we got the complete details so this is what we can do from this request module it is just an introduction part we will discuss this in detail once we move ahead but uh, i hope you my i hope you got my overall point so the first part done where we have taken some inbuilt modules we have executed second part we have taken we have created some own modules and we executed this is like some external modules which is available okay third party modules we have downloaded using pip and we are using it so i hope it is clear now yeah so just try this from your end and if you find any issue or any difficulty let me know in the comment section today we are going to start with object oriented programming okay so as the name says object oriented programming it means now whatever programs we will be writing or whatever logics we will be writing it will revolve around object okay so we'll talk about what exactly is object okay then we'll talk about what is class and why we are working with class and object so let's begin uh, so let me quickly show you what exactly we are going to cover in this video so this video is going to be a little long because i will be covering multiple things but it's going to be very interesting and this video will be the base for your object oriented programming so watch the video till the end because this is the bread and butter for the upcoming sessions okay so we'll talk about what is object because we say object oriented programming right you should understand what is object then we'll talk about what exactly is class and once you understand the basics of object and class then i will show you how you can create a class how you can create methods and how you can create object so do not get confused i have mentioned right how to create methods but till now whatever lectures i have provided or whatever video i have recorded i was always talking about function but why i'm suddenly changing from function to methods today you will get to know okay so just watch out this video till the end and you will get to know the difference between method and functions and once we are done uh, with creation of class method object i will show you how you can call the methods or how you can access the variables with the help of this object finally we'll talk about the constructor constructor in python we'll also have a dedicated video on constructor in detail but we will also touch a quick part from the constructor side okay that's the obvious one we'll talk about the difference between method function finally we will be using self a lot in this video so we'll also talk about what is self so what is object okay forget about the technical definition right now i'm talking to you right i'm using some headphones i'm using some system i'm using some mobile phones everything is an object right everything that we are using is object and when we talk about object definitely each object will have some property okay let's say if you take my example my properties or my data would be my name my height my phone number my address or it can be my pan card aadhar card driving license anything all the details would be nothing but my properties but when you talk about my you know behaviors my behaviors is i can talk i can walk i can eat drink i can teach so these are my behaviors or i will say these are my you know methods so each object have certain properties or i will say variables or in simple words you can say data and each object have certain behaviors or you can call as a methods and these methods will work upon the data that we have or the variables or the properties so object is nothing but a collection of variables okay in simple terms data and the method which works on the data okay so if you uh, just see the small part i have mentioned here as a tip that remember one thing that in python everything is an object okay so once we move ahead we will be creating object so when we say object 
so we will call this as an instance of a class okay just keep this point in mind i will be repeating multiple times object or instance so both are almost same don't worry just to give you a clear idea let's say i'm creating a class don't worry about the class i will talk about the class now after this slide so let's say i have created a class called person okay so this class have three properties or i will say variables which is name phone number and let's say country and i also have three different methods okay or for the timing i will call this as a function so that you don't get confused let's say sing run and walk but i have not created any object but the moment i create object let's say i have created one object object out of this class so you can see these three variables right name phone number sorry name phone number and country you can see now when you create object these object will have its own value so this object let's say this guy has a name called akash he has its own phone number and he has um, own value in the country we we'll call india he can sing he can run he can walk so class was just a dummy blueprint for object so using class we can create an object can we create multiple object of a class definitely yes i can create multiple instances or multiple object of a class so with the same class i can create another object but this time i can feed another data i can put another name another phone number and another country and this object will also will be having same properties or i will say behavior or methods which is sing run and walk i'm just giving you two objects right now but there's no limit okay you can create n number of objects from this class so now you must have got an idea that class is nothing but a blueprint of object and class can bind the data member and function together so when i say data member so you can see these properties right name phone number and country this is nothing but a data member or i will say variables and function together these are the functions right sing run walk so with the help of class we we can bind data member and function together into a single entity called class i hope you got the point of class and object if not then give me couple of minutes let me create a basic class object some methods and then i will show you okay so let me switch back to the pie charm so this is the pie charm let me quickly create another package so let me just right click new and package and i will say oops demo object oriented programming concept demo i got this package and as usual we got this in it dot py file that we discussed already let me create a python file this time i will say this as a class demo yeah let me just increase the font size so how do we create the class so before creating you know object you need a class right because you need a blueprint then only you can create object so just write a keyword called class and you can see we are getting auto suggestion just type class give a space and give the class name so i'm giving a class name as person because this is what the example which i showed you right put colon and hit enter you will get the indentation now whatever you will write within this will be coming under a class okay so let me create one variable this variable name let's say i will give as company name or maybe i will just use the same properties which i showed you in the example so i will create a function here okay now what is the difference between function and method you will get now so right now you can see i am writing def and i am writing one function called hello world or i will say let me give some other name this time give me let me give welcome the moment i write parenthesis automatically this self is coming okay so what is this self i will tell you let me just quickly complete this program and then we'll talk about what is this self why it is coming automatically what will be the consequences if i remove this self moment i hit enter i will get again indentation now whatever i will write will be coming under this method let me just say print and i will say hello python okay so this is my class this is my method now let me show you how do we create object how do we create object is very straight forward first of all you need to write the object name in our case i will give as p p means person you can give any name equal to then your class name what is our class name is person right 
just write person and pair of parentheses and your object is ready now once your object is ready you just need to say that object name in our case it is p i will put dot operator and then i can call the methods that we created so right now we have one method called welcome so i will just say welcome and the moment i save this file right click run and you will see i'm getting this output which is hello python so what exactly we are doing we are creating object of this person class which is p using this p object i'm calling a method called welcome and it is printing hello python yeah fair enough very straightforward let me create one more method here this time i will say let's say hello world okay this time again the moment i you know give parenthesis automatically pycharm is adding self here i'm just giving here hello world and if i want to call this method again i will say p dot hello world just right click run as yeah and you can see we got the output this is also a very straightforward this is what we have seen earlier that how do we create function here i am calling method so now let me show you a difference okay so now let me do one thing let me simply keep this hello world okay outside this class okay so you can see the moment i just remove this indentation now this will not come under this class because i just removed the indentation now if i call this hello world okay how can i call this hello world i can simply say hello world and i should be able to call it because this does not belongs to any class now right so this welcome belongs to this class but this hello world does not belongs to any class so i can directly say hello world but can i directly say welcome you can see i'm not getting any option here the reason is this welcome belongs to that class which is person class right so i cannot call welcome method directly but i can call this hello world function directly so if i want to call welcome i have to say p dot welcome let me just run it we got the same output okay it says hello world missing one argument positional argument self okay this actually we need to remove okay we don't need to give this the moment you are working outside the class so i just removed it for your for your information as of now now here comes the main part okay what i will do i will just type that i will just print the type of hello world and welcome because both look same right this is also a set of statement this is also set of statement the only difference is welcome belongs to this class but hello world is not coming under this class it's just part of this python file the moment i say hello world or let's say hello world and i will simply remove this parenthesis okay i will not call this uh, function i will just say hello world without parenthesis same thing i will do for p dot welcome i will just remove this parenthesis just right click run so you can see this hello world is actually a function but if you talk about this welcome this welcome is a bound method of person class okay that is the big difference function does not belongs to the class but welcome or the methods in our case which is welcome method this belongs to this class so you can see method it's this is a bound method of person class but hello world is just a function okay so you will uh, frequently get this keyword now function and method so whenever we say method it belongs to certain class but when i say function it does not belong to any class okay i hope it is clear now you will get more clarity once we move ahead as of now just remember this difference this is more than enough to understand the difference now now let me create another class okay so that i can show you a few more examples this time i will say class demo 2 and let me just open it and let me just keep this within the class okay and let me also pass the self 
Now let's talk about the self now. What exactly is this self? The moment I say p equal to person and when I say p dot welcome, what is happening behind the scene? So other way of calling this welcome method would be just type class name which is person in our case then call the dot operator and call the method which is welcome and you can pass the object that we created called p so what will happen internally this p object will be passed here into a self okay it means now it is referring to the current object which is p okay so the moment you run you will get the same output which is hello python so this statement or this statement both are exactly same but this is how you will see in most of the official documentation or when you see some professional code right this is how we have to write this is how internally it will get converted but this will make your code more readable okay so we'll continue with this one so i will just comment this so that is the reason the moment you say p dot welcome internally this object or this statement will evaluate into like this the moment we say p p is nothing but the object this object will be passed here so when i say self self means instance of the current class okay let me create one more example then it will be very easy or clear to all of you so let me create another method called sum and the moment i hit parenthesis automatically self is coming acceptable here I will accept number one. Okay, I will say num one. Here I will accept num two. And what I will do, I will just simply say print num one plus num two. Now how do we call this sum method? I will say p dot sum and you can see it is asking me to pass three argument. Okay. Internally it will pass three, but we have to pass actually two automatically internally it will also pass p object so it is expecting num1 and num2 so let me pass two numbers let's say 12 and 34 so it should do the calculation and we should get the result let me simply run and we got the output as 46 yeah fair enough so this is how we are creating methods we are calling and now let me set some properties okay so this is actually a local variable guys so when i say num1 num2 these numbers are getting passed and we are getting this uh, you know calculation but what if i want to set some property or you know the variable of this class okay so let's say i want to create two object and each object will have different set of properties for example uh, I'm creating one object called Q or maybe let me just remove all of them again I will say P equal to person okay which is nothing but our class name and then I will say P dot let me set the name okay I will use the same example I want to set a name this name let's say Mukesh then I want to set let's say phone number okay i will say number let me be specific it's a phone number and let me give some phone number some random and again i will set some okay property let's say country and again i will set to india so what exactly it will do it will set these three properties or which is nothing but variables okay for this particular object now let's say I want to create one more object okay so this time I will say Q I will use the same class which is person in our case and this time again uh, let me simply use the same thing and this time I will simply change it to let's say Akash let me change some dummy values and this time let me just give another country so this is how I'm creating two different object sorry let me change here as well So what exactly I'm doing, I'm creating two object. These two object will definitely have the different set of properties, which is this and this. Okay. So let me simply print. I will say P dot name and let me say Q dot name. 
right click run so you can see I'm printing p dot name so p is actually this object and with this object I have three property associated so name phone and country I'm only accessing name which is Mukesh and here is Akash what if I want country from the second object which is Q so I will say Q dot country and this time I should get Mukesh and USA so each object as you can see have its own set of properties right now is it possible to have some more field for a specific object yes we can do that what if I want to add one more property to P object called city and I will give the city name as let's say Bangalore so if I want to access city name from this P object I will say P dot city so it should give me my name then from Q object it should give me country which is USA and for P object the city should be Bangalore let's right click run again and you can see we got this so what exactly we are doing we are setting up the property for the specific object and then we are accessing now is it like the proper way to set the properties okay if you have you know very small a program or very small application where you will be creating few objects few properties it's fine but consider that you have to create a hundred object okay or maybe this object creation is dynamic so you don't know how many times object will get created how many properties will be set so this is not going to help you a lot this is just for your understanding I showed you but the ideal way should be we need to initialize this object value through a constructor okay so we'll see how this constructor part works I hope this is clear for you now before we jump into constructor I just want to debug this program and I want to show you how exactly internally these objects are getting created and these values are getting set so I'm just adding a breakpoint at line number 22 okay anyways we we are not using these methods but anyways we will keep them and let me simply right click debug so you can see we got the debugger okay and here our debugger will start so as you can see we got two object one is p one is q so the moment i open p okay let me just you know keep it in a maximize mode yeah so p object have four properties city country name and phone number and you can see it's bangalore india mukesh and phone number and phone number is in integer format same for Q, Q for Q we have three properties country name and phone yeah and you can see this is actually object of person class this is also object of person class and this is the memory location yeah so now let me quickly show you how you can set these properties with the help of constructor which is actually the ideal way so again I will go back to our project I will create another class called class demo 3 and just I will remove simply these methods are not required I will be using a few different methods so let me simply delete everything so it's a plain person class now how do we create the constructor it's just like you need to say def and for constructor you need to call a special method called underscore underscore in it okay and underscore underscore so this is how you will create the constructor of a class so let me just print a hello world or I will say hello Python why I'm giving you this let me run this program then you will get the exact uh, you know reason why I'm writing hello Python the moment I say x equal to person okay person is the class okay I'm not calling anything I'm just doing a right click run as class demo 3 and you can see we got the hello python so what is happening actually the moment I create object this constructor is getting called and this set of statements is getting executed as of now I have only one statement which is hello python but if we have other statement that will get executed so this constructor will be invoked automatically the moment you create object okay so let's say I will create one more object which is y again I will say person pair of parenthesis run and you can see I got hello Python now let me create this as a parameterized constructor okay uh, let me 
give this as f name which is first name and this is last name so this constructor is accepting two argument first first name and last name and based on the first name last name we will simply change our print statement so i will just say hello f name then i will give a space okay and then i will simply give l name now this time when you create object i will say x equal to person okay i'm not passing anything okay just simply right click and run and you can see we got one type error so what exactly it says this constructor which is in it missing two required positional argument called f name and l name it means this constructor is expecting two additional argument first name last name which you are not passing that's the reason we are getting type error so i can pass here so the first positional argument is mukesh second is otwani the moment you run this program it will call this constructor mukesh will be passed here otwani will be passed here and you will get hello mukesh otwani right click run as you got this right so this is how you can create a constructor you can pass this values right now we are not storing this values we are not setting up this values so in case if you want to set this values or you want to uh, get this values as a property what you can do you can say self dot okay i'm just using some variable uh, let me use same variable f name equal to f name so whatever values i will get okay i'm assigning into f name same f name i'm assigning to f name variable okay so is it mandatory that i should use the same no i'm just keeping it same so that you can easily understand i will change it now just understand this principle first so i will say l dot self dot l name equal to l name so this time or uh, maybe just yeah, let's change this okay i'm keeping this x and y uh, let's say f and l okay so whatever values i will get i will assign here and whatever values i will get from l i will assign into l name so actual value that we have passed here right that got received into f and l that we are passing into f name and l name so you can see now we are getting error why because now it is not able to understand from where to get this f name from where to get this l name so whenever you have to access the property from that particular object you need to always say self dot f name okay and self dot l name this time when you right click and run you get the same output just to make it simpler i just changed it so that you should not get confused you can write this variable whatever you want it's not that you need to get the same thing here also you can write anything let's say i want to write name one here i want to write name two so this value will be assigned into name one name two and then i will say from this particular object give me name one and from the sale self means current object and give me name two yeah we got the same output so generally we don't give this kind of name one name two so i just i will change it to uh, f name and l name yeah fair enough now before we end this program let me tell you final point like is it mandatory that i should call this as a self like can i write something else see self is just uh, i will say a keyword now okay when i say keyword it's not something reserved keyword it is just some random string i have given i can write mukesh here okay it means i will use this mukesh everywhere okay to refer the current object it is just it should be the first argument of your method or constructor now this time when i say internally object of this class will be passed which will be stored into mukesh which is actually a uh, self okay so when i say from this particular object give me first name from this object give me last name and then i will use the same so this time when i run you get the same output right 
so it, it should not be the self but yeah if you see the official documentation or professional code people write self but it can be anything self means the current instance of the class uh, okay just to make it more clear let me create a one more uh, method here and I will say sum okay and this time let me accept two numbers okay and I will do the sum and finally I will return the values so I will just say uh, variable 1 or variable 2 so I will say self dot v1 equal to v1 self dot v2 equal to v2 again I'm using same variables but it's not mandatory you can have anything here you can have x y and you can pass x y here yeah so the moment you run you will have two more variables called v1 and v2 that will have the actual value finally i will say return self dot v1 plus self dot v2 so it will do the addition and finally it will return the result now this time if i have to print i will say print x dot sum i will pass two numbers 89 and 98 and it will simply call this method receive this value and it should give me the output yeah which is 187 now why i have created this because i want to show you how it works in the debug mode so i am adding once again uh, one breakpoint at this particular uh, statement which is a statement number 14 right click debug okay so right now you can see we don't have anything because first it has to create object then only we will get everything right so as of now i don't have anything i just have the spatial variables let me simply step over the moment i execute this you can see we got x which is nothing but the object which belongs to person class right and if i go back to console i already got mukesh utwani because we received mukesh and utwani here so it says mukesh utwani now this time let me step into this method okay which is sum so just step into and go back to this just notice here guys right now whatever values i have passed right the values which i passed here is 89 and 98 that we got into this x and y and you can see sorry yeah x have 89 y have 98 right now this v1 and v2 is not even created because i have not executed the moment i say step over can you see we got v1 and the moment you expand this can you see we got v1 and the thing which you have to notice here that this v1 belongs to this object yeah i hope i'm able to make my point the moment i execute another statement i got v2 v2 also belongs to this particular object it means x and y is not bound to this particular object they were local variables but when i say self dot v1 v1 is part of this object now okay v2 also part of this object the moment is self dot v1 it says from this object get the v1 plus self v2 from this object get the v2 which is 98 and finally it should return you the value yeah and we should get the output which is 187 yeah so this is what we covered we discussed what is object what is class how to create class how to create methods how to create object we discussed about the constructor we discussed about the difference between function and method and we also discussed about the self okay so i have few more points that i will be discussing in the future videos or the upcoming videos okay so in case if you uh, have any other issue related to this lecture please let me know in the comment section and if you want to send any other query feel free to send me an email to my email which is mukesh utwani at that learn automation.com in the next videos we will talk more about the object oriented programming concept and few other things from the python side today in this lecture we are going to talk about inheritance in python so in the last lecture we discussed about how to create classes how to create methods how to create object and how to call the methods with the help of object right 
Now, in order to move forward, we should understand inheritance because this inheritance we are going to use a lot in the upcoming sessions. Whether you talk about exception handling, polymorphism or any other modules or the packages that we are going to use in future will include inheritance. It is one of the most important topic when you talk about OOPs. Okay, so we'll see step by step what exactly is inheritance, different kind of inheritance. We'll see one by one. So let me switch back to my PPT. So let's talk about what is inheritance. So before jumping into technical details, technical definition, let's talk about inheritance in real life. So as we all inherit some properties from our parent, right? So let's take a very basic example that if your father, if your parents have some car, so you by default, you have this access to the car, right? By default, let's say if your parents have some property, some assets, definitely you are part of their assets or their properties, right? So what exactly are doing? You're doing inheritance. So indirectly, all the things which your parents have is yours as well. So this is actually inheritance. So how exactly this inheritance will work in programming? Let's say you already have a class, okay, which is created by somebody else or let's say one of your team member have created that class that class have a couple of methods now you also have to write the similar methods okay but with some more functionality or let's say you want to use that method which is created by somebody else now instead of creating directly from the scratch what you can do you can reuse that class you can reuse that method with the help of inheritance okay you don't need to write everything from scratch you can simply inherit that class you will get all their properties and methods in your class and you can continue with your own set of functionality. So you don't need to write everything from the scratch. That is the beauty of inheritance. So you will inherit that class and you can continue with your own methods and properties. The main advantage, as you can see, reusability of code. I don't need to write everything from scratch. I can reuse it. So don't worry. I will show you uh, different examples okay different type of inheritance as well just give me a couple of minutes and everything will be clear so throughout the video i will be talking about different type of interface so first we'll talk about single level inheritance then we will talk about multi-level inheritance and last we will discuss about multiple inheritance and there is one more in inheritance called hybrid inheritance that i will give you as an assignment because that will be the combination of multi-level plus multiple inheritance so let's see one by one first i will cover one type of inheritance i will show you program then i will move to the next next one okay so what exactly this sim single level inheritance says suppose you already have a class called person okay and this person class have a couple of methods let's say walk run and eat so if i'm creating another class let's say this class says male or female or any other class I want to access or I want to reuse all the method from person class. How can we do that? I have to simply inherit this person class from my mail class and I can access all the properties and the methods from person class into this class. How actually we can do in programming? Let's see one by one. And once you understand this first level of inheritance, then I will go back. Uh, I will start the multi level and multiple. So let me switch back to the pie charm. Okay, so this is our PyCharm. Let me create a simple class. I will first of all create a Python file and this Python file I will give as let's say inheritance. Now let me create a class and the moment you start working with inheritance, right? You will see different terminology. So do not get confused. You can call these classes. Okay, if I go back to this example. So person class, you can refer as base class or you can say parent class. Okay. And this class, which is male class, you can say as a child class, subclass, drive class, etc. So don't worry about the terminologies. This will interchange many times with different blocks, different uh, videos, but the concept will remain same. So I'm creating a class and let's say this class name, I will give base. Okay. And I put colon colon. And now I'm create going to create a method here. Okay, so this method, I will say def and let's say this, I will say method name is base method. Okay, and I will simply give a print statement and I will say I am in base class. Now, I'm going to create another class. This class is done. Okay, I don't want to write 
or make it very complicated focus on the principle as of now focus on the fundamentals once you understand this everything will be easy okay don't worry worry about the complexity of the program that anyways we will do once we move her to different concept right once you start selenium api and other stuff we will be writing some complex code so i'm going to create another class and this time this class name i will say child class okay base child or you can say parent child so i'm just going to create another class called child and again i'm going to create a method and i will say child method okay and here i will simply write a print statement and i will say i am in child class now let me create object of child class so how do we create object i will simply say c i will just give any names i'm just giving c equal to child so this is my object now which is c the moment is a c dot you can see i'm able to call child method which we already created right so if i simply run this you can see it says i am in child class right now there's no connection between base class versus child class now i want to access this base method so one way to do this i will create object of this base class so i will say b equal to base class okay uh, just say base parenthesis so now b is our object i will say b dot and i can call this base method so this is what we are doing without inheritance now what if i want to access base method okay with the help of this object which is child class object so what we can do i can inherit this class which is nothing but base class so how do we inherit i will simply write parenthesis inside the parenthesis i will give the class name which i want to inherit in our case i want to inherit the base class okay now let's remove everything so what exactly i'm doing i'm just creating object of child class which is c and this child class is inheriting another class called base so now this time if i say c dot can you see i am able to access the base method as well because child class is now inheriting base class yeah so if i just simply run this program i will get the same output because i have not changed anything in the method it is just with the help of one object i am able to call child class and base class as well now i just want to add a small disclaimer that each and every class in python by default inherit object class as well okay so the moment i say c dot can you see apart from these two which is coming from base this is coming from child i'm also getting so many other options you can see here right and all these are coming from object class so whether you mention or not by default each and every class in python inherit object class so this is just a single level inheritance let me create one variable okay so this i will say name equal to mukesh so this is just one of the property which is available in the base class i'm going to create another variable here called company and here i will give the company name as learn hyphen automation so with the help of the c object you will see i can access both i will say c dot and i can see name so this name is actually coming from base right and if i say c dot i can see i'm getting company as well and this company is anyways available in the child class so we can directly access and you can see without any problem i am able to access everything with the help of just one object which is of child class yeah very easy this is called single level inheritance i am able to access properties which is nothing but variables i am able to access methods as well now let's jump into second example which is multi level inheritance so what exactly this multi level inheritance says suppose there's one class called c okay i can take any class name but just to make it simple i will take abc okay so this class c extend another class called class b now this class b also inherit another class 
or the base class of class B is class A. So can you see this, right? I have multiple level of inheritance. And indirectly, as we know, class A inherit object class. So now this concept is known as multi-level inheritance. Single level, just we have one class, sorry, two classes, one is base, one is child. But when we say multi-level, you have series of classes and each class is extending another class or, you know, ex uh, inheriting another class. This is again very straightforward, but let me write a program so that all concepts will be clear. So I will just copy this program and I will simply paste and this time I will make it inheritance demo two. Okay. And let me remove everything. So first of all, I will say class A colon and here I'm going to create a method called hello world. Okay. Uh, let me just say method A. Okay. So that we can understand that this method is coming from class A, which method is coming from class B. So I will just main, name it method A, method B and so on. And I will just give a print statement that I am coming from class A. In a similar way, I will be creating another class. I will say class B. And this time I will say method. Okay, just let me just put colon here method b and again i will say maybe i will copy paste this just to save some time and this time i will say i'm coming from class b and let me create one more class because this is the same example that we already discussed right now i will make it class c and i will say this is method c this is also as class c now, how do we achieve multi-level inheritance? Very easy. As you can see this diagram, class C is the subclass of class B, right? So I will say class C is inheriting another class called B. Now, as you can see this diagram, class B is inheriting another class called class A. So I will make it, this is inheriting class A. Now, very easy, just create object of class C. Again, guys, focus here that I'm creating one object called C, okay, and class name is C. So do not get confused, I'm just giving C here and it is C. Let's make it OBJ1, object one. I'm creating object of class C. To make it more specific, uh, let's say class A, and this also I will change to class A, this I will say class B, this I will mention as class B and I will mention as class C. Okay. Just to make it clear. So when I create object this time, I will say class C. So this is our object now. Okay. Why it is giving error? Okay. Because so I'm creating object of class C which is obj1 so as per this diagram class c can access all the methods and property of its own class from class b and from class a as well okay so if i say obj1 dot can you see i'm getting access to method a i'm getting access to method b and i'm also getting from c now this time when i run Again, very easy. It says I'm mean, from ABC because with the help of this, I'm able to call everything from class A, B and C. Make sense. Now let me create. Okay. Before we move it, I want to show you this thing. You can see this is a special uh, symbol, which is given by pie charm. So what it says, if you just put here, it says, is subclass by class B and C and the moment you put mouse over here it says is this is subclass by class C see the beauty of Python it is giving you everything the moment you write inheritance it is giving you this kind of additional information now look, this is very straightforward situation you will not get any doubt but the moment I create one more method okay uh, let's say def hello world Okay, and if I say hello 
from class A. So what is happening right now? I have just created one more method. And if I just give the same method, okay. So before we keep the same method in different class, I will simply call and I can say hello world. And definitely when we say hello world, it is available in class A and it will simply run and it will say hello from class A, right? But what if I give the same method in class B as well? Okay. So the now the question comes, okay. Uh, the moment I execute this program, will it give me hello world from class B or from A or from both? Ideally, I'm just calling once, right? So the moment I call hello world, either it should give me from A or B. Let's right click and run. Can you see? It is saying hello from class B. But why it is not calling from class A? Because same method is available in class in class B, right? But when I say I just want to say hello world. So ideally, which one should get executed? Now, here comes the another concept of override. Can you see this uh, special symbol from PyCharm? It says overrides method in class A. And if you put mouse over here, it says is overridden in class B. Again, I just want to give you an intro about the next video that what exactly we will discuss. So this feature is known as method overriding. It is part of polymorphism that we have not discussed yet, but we will be discussing again in, in upcoming videos. So just want to give you the scenario that if same method is available in class A and class B, but the moment you call uh, hello world from class C, the method from class B will be called because of method overriding. This one. Okay, if I just give one more example, if I put the same method in class C as well. And if I say from class C, now you can easily guess the output. Now hello world is available in class A, class B and class C. Now, obviously class C will override class B method, right? So if you see this one, it says override methods in class B. It means the moment you call hello world, first of all, it will check the immediate class, which is class C and it will just execute this. It will override class A and class B. And you can see, don't worry about method overriding. I will be discussing in detail in the polymorphism. This is just one glimpse I have given. Now the next one is very interesting. So just do not skip that part because there we will also discuss one another very important concept called MRO and you will be getting this question in interviews as well. Okay, so what is MRO and how it works in multi pull inheritance? We'll see now. So for that, let me create another class. Just a second, I will just say inheritance demo too. And yeah. So before we jump into technical details, let me show you what exactly is multiple inheritance. So suppose you have a class, which is say class C. Now this class C is inheriting class A and class B as well, okay? So in the multi-level, we had class A, then class B, then class C. But in this case, class C is inheriting two classes parallelly together. I'm just giving example of two, but it can have multiple classes as well. So now class C is extending class A or I will say inheriting class A and class B. So what is the syntax? How do we do? Let's see now. And then we will talk about the next part, which is MRO. For this, I need again three classes that we anyways have. So let me just double click. And this time, I will simply remove this part, okay? So now we have three classes and all these three classes are totally independent. Class A is independent, B is independent, C is independent. So the moment I run this program, this will definitely fail, yeah? Because 
with the help of obj1 i can only access uh, method c right i cannot access anything so this will definitely will give me error now what this multiple inheritance says that you can extend or you can inherit more than one class in our case first of all i want to ex uh, inherit class a comma then i can also give i want i also want to inherit class b now let me just remove this and let me do one thing i will say hello world 1 hello world 2 just to give you a clear idea later on i will just give you i will put the same method name and i will tell about mro as of now again i will say c equal to class c which is i just want to create object and i will just say class c yes i will say c dot i can call method a i can call method b which is quite obvious and definitely method c and if i simply say c dot you can say i can also access hello world 1 and hello world 2 So in this case, this is our scenario. C is inheriting A and B. I can access everything, and this time we should get the proper output. And you can see, method A says I'm coming from class A. Method B says I'm coming from class B, and so on. Hello world and hello world two is also working fine. But what if I just change the scenario that I will put hello world here and hello world here? Now in this case. what should be the output okay i will just change it to hello world and i will simply remove everything because now they are not required the scenario says now it is you know inheriting two class and both the classes we have hello world so if i simply right click and run which one it should run let's see you can see it's actually calling hello world from class a which is this why it is happening let me just show you another part what if i say that class b comma class a still i should get the same output right but the moment i run you can see it changes the output so this is our situation right now so we have a class a we have a class b both the classes have the same method name so if i want to call function 1 in our case it's hello world which one it should take it will now follow mro which is method resolution order okay so what exactly is this mro it's just an one order in which python actually will check the hierarchy of the classes okay so in our case you can see hierarchy right class a and class b so now it should give priority to class a and then goes to class b so this is going to play a vital role when it comes to multiple inheritance and single method is available into multiple classes in our case function 1 function 1 right as per this ppt but as per our code hello world method so the moment i say class b and class a so first of all it should give priority to class b that's the reason it says hello from class b which is this but if i simply reverse the order if i say that it is uh class a and class b now hello world first of all it will take from class a so if i just right click it run you will see a different output now how do you verify okay let's say you this is what i am teaching you but what if you technically want to see that what is the method resolution order from python you just need to say print and just call class c okay and just call dot mro can you see this right click run sorry i just did a debug let me stop this debug right click run so can you see now it says the first priority will go to class c then class a class b and last the object class but 
what is class C now because I don't have any method in class C which is uh, the same name right hello world if I have the hello world in class C okay let's do that so now you know the output as Python says priority will go to class C then class A and class B then object so in this case if I simply run my program can you see this it says hello from Python C it is happening because of this MRO method resolution order last time I will simply reverse this order this class C first inherit class B then class A in this case you will see this order will change so just right click run and you can see again it says first it will look for class C since we have changed here right it says then I will look for class B class C and last at the object class so this is how multiple inheritance works I hope I was able to make my point right the last one is hybrid inheritance that is the combination of multi-level with multiple inheritance that I will give you as part of the assignment you just explore it. it's quite easy just combine these two inheritance and you will be able to achieve hybrid inheritance guys this MRO is very important okay uh, in interviews as well you will get this question plus the moment you start working with some complex library you have to follow this okay once you move ahead you will see one class will be inheriting multiple classes and when it comes to multiple inheritance it is going to be very useful I hope you enjoyed this video I hope all the concepts are clear in case if you still have any doubt don't worry let me know in the comment section and I will be happy to assist you today in this video we are going to talk about method overriding so in the last lecture I already discussed about what is inheritance right now inheritance is one of the most important concept when it comes to object oriented programming and in order to understand this you need to understand uh, inheritance first because when we talk about method o overriding right so in order to achieve method overriding we need two classes and we need in simple terms one parent class and one child class okay so what exactly is more method overriding let's see one by one so before I implement the program I just want to give a quick definition about method overriding for this let me go back to the PPT as the name says method overriding so first of all what is overriding as we know when one thing override another thing we will say it's overriding so what exactly is method overriding when one method will override another method now in order to do this we need two classes okay so well, let's say I will be having one parent class or super class and base class let's say and I have one child class or you can say uh, subclass okay when both the classes have the same method with the same signature in that case check child class is overriding the parent class method okay simple words so for example if I'm creating one class called let's say a in class a I have one method called walk so if class B which I am creating if this class B is inheriting class a and if class B also have the same method let's say walk okay so in that case whatever walk method we have defined and we have given the definition in class A it will override in class B okay so when you create object of class B and when you call this method class B is overriding walk method okay I will show you through example don't worry so method overriding can be achieved in single level inheritance multi level inheritance and multiple inheritance okay so let me show you uh, two programs and this will clarify all your doubts so this is my class and let me create a class called class a okay and I will simply going to create a method here called sum this sum method uh, will simply say that sum of two numbers is let's say 15 some random digits I'm giving just a fake values now I'm going to create another class okay this class is B and right now if I create the same method here called sum again and this time I will call a print statement and I will say sum of two number is let's say 25 and maybe I will just write calling from B okay so this will give us clarity that 
this some methods belong to class B and here I will say calling from A now if I create object okay now notice guys I have the same method in class A and class B and this class B is inheriting class A so this is how we inherit right and the moment I inherit you can see this particular symbol by PyCharm and what it says that this particular sum method it's it is actually overriding method in A it means we also had one method in sum and we also have the same method in class B so actually it is overriding and if you just see a special symbol here for class A it says this is subclassed by B okay fair enough now let's go ahead and create one object of class B I will say obj1 equal to A let's go step by step so what I'm doing right now I'm just creating object of class A the moment I say obj1 dot sum so this obj right now is the object of class A the moment I say sum method definitely it is going to call this one right so yes you can say calling from A and sum of two number is 15 this one now if I simply say obj2 equal to b and now if I say obj2 dot sum so you can see right now when I say obj2 which is object of class b class b also inheriting class a and both have the same method this time if I simply run you can see this time I got the output from some method which belongs to class b so this is known as method overriding okay so if you don't want the first output just comment this part and let me simply execute once again you will see I'm getting always method from class B because of overriding I hope it is clear now or uh, before moving into one more class let me create one more method this time I will say or uh, let's modify this someone uh, let's say some new so right now you will see earlier we were getting that specific symbol right that is gone now because some belongs to A and some new belongs to B so both the classes have different methods so this is not overriding so this time if I try to say obj2.sum so sum only belongs to class A so this time when I run you will see we will get the different output I hope it is clear now so make sure you give the same name and the moment you give same name you will get these two specific symbol from PyCharm now let me create one more class that is example of multi level inheritance but in case if you want to try with multiple also that's up to you concept will remain same so I'm going to create class C and this class C is going to inherit class B and this time again I will have the same method and class C and this time I will say calling from class C sum of two number is 50 so this time if I create object okay now we have okay three different scenarios just observe one by one guys it's very very important so obj1 first of all when I create object of a and when I say obj1 dot sum definitely obj1 belongs to now class a so when I say sum method it should give me this result let's execute yes now if I simply make it B now when I say object of B now it has class A and class B class B inheriting class A when I call some method it should give me this output right because both have some method class B overriding this method from class A so this time output should be this so let's right click run and here we go now the last thing if I say C now C is another class which is inheriting class B B is inheriting class A 
and a in, uh, indirectly is inheriting object class right and all the classes have the same method called sum so when i say sum now you can easily guess because sum method is already present in c so it is if you see this part it is overriding the method in b okay same story now this time when i run you will see calling from c and it says sum of two number is 50. i hope it is clear now so let me give you one more example and this is going to again very interesting and this is frequently asked in interviews and when you talk about in real time we will be using this function very frequently called super so let me create a class and let's say i'm going to create a class called base class inside this class i'm going to create a method called hello world so i'm just going to create a method called hello world which will simply give some print statement in our case it says hello python now i will be creating another class this time and maybe i can copy paste or let's create another class class called child class and i'm going to inherit base class and again i will be writing the same method again hello world and uh, this time i will say hello python and maybe i will simply write from child okay here i will say hello python from base now let me go let me create one more okay let's stick to two classes i'm going to create object of child class so obj one and i will say child class so this is how we create object i will say obj one dot hello world now because of method overriding it is going to call hello world from the child class and it should say hello world from child and you can see we got the output right now what if i want to call base class hello world okay is there any way i don't want to create another object of base class so one answer could be create object of base class and call the hello world that is one option but we don't want that is there any way that using the same object can i call the hello world of the base class yes so what you can do the moment you come inside this method you can say base class okay and you can put dot operator and you can see hello world so what we can do we can call base class hello world from hello world of child class the moment you run this program definitely it is going to call hello world control will come here moment we call this base class called uh, base class dot hello world control will come here it will simply execute the base class hello world and it will say hello python from base now before we run the program you also need to pass self okay so we'll call, pass self here now this time when you run you can see the moment we execute this program first of all it says hello python from base because before executing this statement we are calling hello world which belongs to base class and it is printing this right now if you don't want to do this there's another option which says you can use a function called super the moment you type super we will be calling this function and we will simply say dot it says hello world when i say super it goes to the base class and then it will call hello world method the moment i run this program you can see we got the same output so either use base class which is direct name followed by dot operator and the method name otherwise you can use super is this like i can only use the overridden method no you can call any other method from the base class so let's say if i create another method here let's say by and i'm just going to add a print statement I also want to call this by method now so I will directly say again super okay uh, super function dot by let's run this so first it will say hello python from base then it will say by from python then it will execute hello python from child 
and here we go so this is how we can do so in today's videos we discussed what is method overriding how we can do method overriding with single level inheritance method overriding with multi level inheritance how we can use super functions to call the base class functions sorry how to use super function to call the base class method yeah so this is what i have for today and this is very interesting and very useful guys we will be using this super function multiple times once you move ahead so if you still have any doubt let me know in the comment section today in this video i will talk about how you can run your python script or i'll say python program in mac so in our previous videos we discussed how to install python in mac so in case if you are new to python and you don't have installed python in your system please go ahead and install python first and then you can come back to this video but in case if you already have python no worry you can directly continue with this video so let me quickly check do i have python installed and am i able to you know check the python version so i'm going to start a terminal so you can directly start a terminal and just check here okay let me just maximize and i will be using python 3 okay so by default we get python 2 as well right with mac so i'm going to use python 3 here and i will simply say python 3 version and you can see at the time of recording this session python version is 3.8.5 okay now i will show you how you can run the python program okay so whether it's one file or the complete program process will remain same okay so let me quickly create a python program or python script and then i will run from the mac terminal okay so first of all i will go back to any editor i'm using sublime text editor in case you're not using this sublime you can go with any editor or you can directly start with notepad and you can just save that file with .py extension and you can run your python program okay so what i'm going to do i will simply say uh, print okay and maybe first of all i will save this file okay so i will just click on save as and i will just go to desktop i will say my python files and here i will be saving this file as my first program dot py okay now this python file is saved now i will simply say print okay and i will just write hello python that's all i will say command s it will save the file now i will just go back to terminal and you can see i will simply check pwd which is present working directory so right now i am under my user so let me see so the folder that I have or where this Python file is present under in the desktop. So I will just go to desktop. Now again, I will put LS and there's so many files. So our program is under my Python files. Okay. So I will just say CD my Python files and let me clear everything so right now you can see if i just again type pwd right now i am under my current uh, working directory which is my python files now let me just say ls and you can see our python file is available right now i will simply say python 3 okay space and i will give that python file so which is my first program.py and hit enter and you can see we got the output call hello python very straight fire forward you just need to say python3 space and that file name and it will simply execute to python program or the python script let me quickly change a small let me make a quick change i will say hello python and running from terminal i will make a quick change i will again keep this inside a function so i will say def okay and i will simply say welcome underscore user okay colon and hit enter and i will keep this print statement under this function now let me quickly call this function so how to call just say the function name which is welcome user and just say command s which will save this file go back to terminal let me clear everything again i will check yeah i'm on the current working directory which is my python files again i will simply say python three space and what was a file name which was my first program.py 
and you can see we got the output again hello python running from terminal this is exactly what we have written right so this is just a quick video which will guide you how you can run the same thing from the terminal but if you're using any editor in the editor you get this option right, right click and run but when you work with uh, you know linux system or directly from the terminals you need to understand how to run okay today in this lecture i will talk about how you can run python script from the terminal or from i will say command prompt okay so till now we have seen how do we work with the editors right and how do we run the python scripts from the editor but i will be creating a small python file and i will be running that python script from command prompt so let me show you so this is my notepad you can use notepad notepad plus plus or any other editor i'm just going to write a small python script and i will run it but you can also have a lengthy or end to end script and you can run in the same manner so i will be using just a print statement or i will say print function and i will be just printing a small string and i will say hello python okay and i will simply just save this file so let me just write and save this file so i will press ctrl s or i will just go to file and save as and i will be storing this into a particular folder so on desktop i have created one blank folder called python files and here i will be storing this script or this file as dot py extension okay so in double quotes i will say my python dot py and i will hit enter which is nothing but save file and i will just go back to my terminal or command prompt as you can see right now i am under user folder and uh, you can see this is my folder python files and this is the file that we created so i just want to run this so let me copy the path and i will open terminal or command prompt i will simply navigate to that particular folder where my python script is available i will just type cd and i will just give the path so i have just pasted and you can see it is under desktop python files hit enter and if i just type dir so you can see i can see my python file is here which is my python.py so how do we run it's very straightforward just you need to type python space and you need to provide the file name in our case file name is my python and press tab and you can see it says my python.py file and hit enter and you can see now we have hello python so we have written a small python script and we executed from command prompt right now let me just uh, do quick modi modification here i will surround this into a function i will just create a function with the help of def and i will just give this function name is hello world okay colon and i will just keep four spaces one two three four so this is my function which is hello world now let me quickly call this function so i will say hello underscore world and pair of parentheses control s maybe i will just type this hello python from mukesh control s again i will go back to my command prompt now again i will type python and again i will say my python dot py file and the moment I hit enter, you can see it executed and it says hello Python from Mukesh. So it's very straightforward guys. Just you need to say Python and give a space and followed with your Python script that you want to run. Now, if you want to do the same thing from your editor. So let's say I have created one demo.py file. And again, I will create the same, let's say hello world function, put colon and I will just say print my first python program okay so earlier we used to just right click and run right now if you can see one option called terminal here so if you don't want to open a command from nando you can do from here as well so right now i am under python tutorials which is nothing but this path python tutorials so in the same directory i have this demo.py file in case this file is available under some other uh, package then first of all you need to navigate to that package and then you can run right now it is under my home directory so i can just type again python and which is the file name demo.py which is capital d 
okay so my mistake i have created a function but i have not called so let me quickly call this function which is hello world control s and let's execute once again and you can see i got my first python program in case if you want to run any program which is available under some uh, package so let's say i want to run this while loop demo dot py file which is under while loop demos so first of all i will navigate i will say cd and i will navigate under while loop demos so right now i am under the same folder or package now again i will say python and i will say while loop demo dot py file so this is how you can run if you open this while loop program it simply keeps on running in finite it will never stop okay so i have to stop this using uh, control c which is keyboard interrupt so very easy just open command prompt just type python followed by your python file from your term uh, from your python just open this terminal and you can continue okay that's a quick video but yeah very useful because the moment you work with real projects you will not get editor always so you need to use all these uh, terminal and command prompts yeah i hope this uh, session was useful today in this lecture we will be talking about constructor with inheritance okay so in the previous lectures we discussed about what is constructor and in the last lecture we also discussed about what is inheritance but today we will be combining both of the topics and we'll see how constructor will behave when we talk about inheritance okay so again it's a part of polymorphism so in case if you haven't seen that video then i will link these two videos in the description so please go ahead and watch in case if you haven't and let's get started with the constructor with inheritance so i have created already a python file inheritance demo 6 and i will be creating multiple classes just to show you how this constructor will behave when we have multiple classes okay so what i will do i will create a new class let's say same abc class or you can create child class base class whatever you name so i will say let's say uh, class a and in class a i'm just going to create a constructor okay so again i will say def space underscore underscore in it and i will simply say a print statement okay and i will simply say i am in class a okay now that's all i need in this class so i'm going to create another class called class b and i will be inheriting class a so this is how we inherit in parenthesis i will be giving class a which i want to inherit colon and now hit enter and i will be creating another constructor for class b again i will say underscore underscore in it underscore underscore and our constructor for class b is ready here also i will just give a print statement and i will simply say i am in class b okay now let's do one thing let's create object of class a okay so what i will say i will say obj1 equal to a that says how we create object right so right now i'm not doing anything and we don't have anything actually we just have two constructor one in class a one in class b so let me simply run this python program and we'll see the output the moment you run you can see the moment we create object class a constructor is getting invoked automatically and we are getting i am in class a right now what if i say obj2 or maybe i can directly change it now okay i will just create object of class b so in this case you can see the moment i run this program it says i am in class b so this is how constructor work when you have inheritance okay now whenever you create object of class b it will only call the constructor from class b okay it will not call class a constructor so in case if you want to call class a constructor you need to call explicitly and how you can do that so similar thing we have seen uh, in inheritance with methods right same thing you can do here so let's say i reached here okay now before calling this print statement i just want to call class a constructor how can i do that i will simply say class a dot and i will just call in it again method which is nothing but a constructor of class a okay and i will simply pass self so what will happen now if you run this program automatically class b constructor will be invoked which is this right and 
what we are saying first of all invoke class a constructor so it will come here and it will say i am in class a once it is done it will say i am in class b and it will run so you can see before printing class b it says i am in class a so this is how you can call class a constructor from class b so in the last video we also discussed about super function so same thing we can do here so if you don't want to say in this way what you can do you can simply say okay let me just comment it out and i will simply say super and i will just say dot and you can see again i'm getting underscore underscore in it which is nothing but constructor so what i'm saying super means the base class so before running this it is going to the base class which is nothing but a and it will call the constructor so again you will get the same output it is just instead of giving the class name then dot i'm just calling a super function dot in it i hope it is clear now so either you go with this or you go with this so this is how the constructor will work with inheritance so in the last uh, video somebody has commented that what if i have three classes okay so let's do one thing let's create one more class and see how it will work so for the time being again i will comment this i'm creating a separate class called class c so this is again multi level inheritance c will be inheriting b b is inheriting a okay so i will say c is a class which is inheriting class b so again this time i will create one more constructor and i will say same i am in class c okay now i'm not calling super or i'm not calling this base class constructor simply i will change this to class c objects so obj1 is object of class c this time if i run i'm getting only i am in class c because all the classes have same constructor now now from class c if i want to call class a constructor what i will say a dot underscore underscore in it and i will pass self so before calling this statement it will call the constructor of class a yeah now if, what if i want to call b that is also possible just say b dot and then again underscore underscore in it underscore 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 and pass the self so now it will call class a constructor then class b constructor then definitely class c constructor now about super this is what we are saying go to or call constructor from class a but what if i say super okay so super function and if i say dot in it now the question come will it call constructor from class a or from class b so let's run it and you will you can easily predict the output so when we say super super means it is going to call the constructor of its base class so c is inheriting actually class b right so super will represent now class b so it will call the constructor of class b and then it will continue with the class a okay which is this statement now what if i want to call again super from here will it work yes definitely so what i'm saying when i say super definitely it will go to class b constructor which is this and again from here i will say super dot in it which is again constructor of class a why because b is inheriting class a so it will say i am in class a then i am in class b and finally it will say i am in class c yeah you can see we got the output so super will always represent its o oh, its uh, base class okay so when i say super if i if you have multi level inheritance it will just go to its own base class so right now you will not understand the real use case okay but hold on for a few more sessions once you start selenium we will be using this kind of examples okay and once you start the framework right in the framework also we will be using the super function and this constructor a lot today in this video we are going to talk about exception handling in python as the name says exception handling so now we will talk about how do we handle the exceptions but the question comes what exactly is exception so for this let me show you the official documentation by python so as you can see this document is divided into two section one is error and exception so one is if you talk about syntax error which is also known as parsing error 
and this thing we have seen multiple times right because in python we need to take care especially of the indentation right the moment you make any syntax related issue or some syntax mistakes you will be getting syntax error and you can see syntax error second thing is exception okay now if you just read one statement that will make everything clear that any error which is detected during execution or runtime is called exceptions now how do we handle the exceptions that we will see now so syntax error i will show you which is quite obvious second thing will be exception so when everything works fine when your you know uh, syntax is correct but if your program is failing at runtime we will be calling this uh, we will be calling them as exceptions okay so do not get confused with these names okay you can see this is says error this is his error this is his error but these are actually exceptions okay i will show you the exception hierarchy all these exceptions if i show you now we will discuss now this in detail all these errors which we will be getting in runtime is part of exception class and this exception class is a subclass or it is inheriting another class called base exception so don't worry and do not get confused with the names any error at runtime will be called as exception fine so let me show you both one is syntax error then we'll talk about exceptions so let me switch back to the pie charm now how do we handle the exception so we will be using try and we will be using accept we will also use finally so these are reserved keywords and when we start writing this will be block of code so let me show you the syntax error first that is very easy so the moment I say while after that while I need to give some condition right so let me give this condition called true and the moment I put colon I need to give some condition but what if I miss this colon if I directly say some print here some dummy statement I will be giving the moment I run this run and you will get a syntax error which is quite uh, expected right and it says invalid syntax which is very easy to handle and which is very easy to catch as well but the problem comes with runtime okay the moment you run your program your syntax is correct your logic is correct but still you will get some exceptions okay so how do we handle let's see one by one so to demonstrate this part i'm just going to use a file now we haven't seen how to open a file how to close a file how to read a file how to read the file we'll see this in detail in separate video for the time being i'm going to use one open function so this function will simply open up a file and once this file is open, you can simply do the read operation, write operation. So the moment you call this open function, we need to provide the file which you want to read. So let's say I have, let me create one simple text file. I will give this file name is demo1.txt. So you can see I got this file. Now if I simply get the path, okay, let me just open this in explorer just to make your program easier i'm just going to get the path i will just press shift from my keyboard i will copy as path and uh, i will just give the path here in double quotes okay so in double quotes the moment we give path now we need to use either one forward slash or two backward slash so i will just use two backward slash just give me a second and your file is open now so the moment you put mouse over or if you open this particular function what it says it will ask you first file then it will also ask you give me in which mode you want to open okay so let me just open this in a read mode so what i will do i will simply give a comma okay and in double quotes i will just say r r means i just want to open this in a read mode so this is going to return a file so let me store this into a variable called let's say content okay now let's say i want to just read the content so i will simply say print and now the moment i say content i have multiple options now i can read you can see and i can also write while writing i need to provide the content as well and i can close the files so for the time i just want to read this file so i will say read and simply i will run and you can see we got python is my first language Make sense? Now what, due to some X, Y, Z reason, I just give some wrong file. Let's say I'm giving demo2.txt and I'm trying to open or read this file which does not exist. And you can see I got one error called file not found error. 
and if you see it says no such file or directory present and it will also give you exactly at which line you are getting so we are getting this error at line number one now I want to handle this okay I want to handle this error and I want to give a beautiful message or some message which actually explain what is happening or what went wrong here so what I can do now I can simply put this into a try block I will say try colon and I will simply keep these two statement within this try and I will just keep accept and you can see I got a specific file not found error okay so even if you don't write it will still handle just say accept colon and here you can say uh, something went wrong okay I'm just writing some dummy statement again and after this I will simply say have a nice day it means if something okay if I just give demo1.txt it should run which is running fine right it says Python is my first language then it says have a nice day this time if I give some wrong file which does not even exist and we have handled this with accept right it simply comes to this block and it says something went wrong you can see it is not throwing any error and it is working as expected so let's see if I have some more statement after this I will say uh, this is last statement again just want to show you that once your program is done okay it is going to execute this statement because this is not in a try this is not an accept so if something goes wrong it will come here and it will still run this program or it will continue with the set of statement correct now this is one exception what if I try to do one more part I will try to open this in a right mode okay so you can see the moment I put okay or let me do reverse I will still try to open this in a read mode which is a valid file in this case okay demo1.txt but I will just try to write something this is how we write I will say this is Mukesh now you can see what I'm doing I'm opening in a read mode but I'm trying to write something so definitely it will throw some exception so the moment you run you can again say see here it says something went wrong but this time I'm not able to understand what went wrong right so now we need to have the knowledge of the specific exceptions which is available in Python right so I cannot directly say accept and handle everything because I will not get some meaningful information from this so now we need to use the exact class name or at least the base exceptions so in this case what I will do after accept I will be giving the exception okay which is coming so what exception we were getting we were getting file not found error first right so now you just mention it here and you can just also use a keyword called s and you just give a variable which is nothing but the object here so I will just say err so whatever exception we will be getting all the information will be stored under err okay so if you just want to print you just mention here error so as we know when we get file not found error when this file does not exist right so let me just change this program and let me make it to read again okay right part I will show you just make it read once again now demo 1.txt it exists we are opening a read mode we are reading it and now let's simply run it says python is my first language which is coming from text file and as usual this is our print statement now what if i change this this time i will say demo2.txt let's run and you can see something went wrong this is exactly what we have given in the print statement now this is what the err is having it says error number two no such file and directory exist right so this is how you can handle the exceptions in Python now if I take right examples you might get confused because we haven't seen till now how to read the files how to write the files how to close the files. so let me take the again basic examples of division by zero giving the wrong input because everybody can relate it right but this is a very basic example of try and accept block so in the next example I will take uh, multiple accept 
we will also talk about finally we will also talk about else so i will just make it exception handling demo 2 and let me just delete everything so what i will do i will take few inputs from the user and based on the inputs we will do some calculation and we will provide the output so let's say i'm just taking one number from the user and uh, i will just say input and i will say please enter number one then i will just say number two this time i will say please enter number two and finally i will say result equal to num1 okay and num2 let's do division so it will divide number one by number two will get the output and we will simply print okay now one thing which you have to notice here guys that when we say input it will give me a string right so num1 will be string num2 will be string and it will say divide string by string let's see the moment i run this if i say uh, 90 and uh, 89 and you can see it's this type error why because this division operator does not work with string and string so i cannot divide one string with another string so this is one of the exception okay just remember type error so what i will do first of all i will just surround this into a try right because now we know that if something goes wrong this particular statement is going to throw exception which is type error so i will just keep this in a try i will just say try colon and i will just keep these three statements within try so just surround this piece of code and say tab and when it comes to yeah let's also have print now i will keep accept colon and i will say please provide only digits okay so we got this type error right so i will just say accept type error and s e r r so whatever we will get inside e r r i will print that as well so this time when i run you will see it will handle this very gracefully i will say 89 and uh, 78 now it says please provide only digit now you must be wondering that i am giving the proper input right but why still giving that please provide only digit because this input will return me everything as a string so now it is our responsibility that we will be converting this into uh, integer number yes so let me handle this i will just convert this number one and number two as an integer and this time let me give this here that result is and i will just put comma and this time we will be getting number one let's say 90 number two is let's say nine and we got result fine let's e let's use some weird input and let's see how it behaves so when i say run number one is let's say 80 number two is eight okay we have already given the valid input this time i will say zero so you can see we got another exception called zero division error so what it says you cannot divide any number by zero and which is true so the moment it is throwing any exception it is coming to accept block and here it is expecting type error but what this code is throwing zero division error so it is not able to handle and it is again throwing and it is uh, it is throwing exception and it is terminating our program can we have multiple accept yes we can have in this case i will just give this uh, zero division error and again i will store this into another variable called error and again i will say please do not enter zero some meaningful message and whatever information we will be getting in err i will simply just mention here let's run it number one 90 number two zero and you can see it says please do not enter zero so if user is giving any other input it should be able to handle it so in my case let's say if i give number one as mukesh number okay so here itself it failed and it is expected the reason is we got 
input right this input is nothing but a string what i was doing i was converting into integer now what is happening the moment i give input as mukesh it is trying to convert into integer which is not possible so it is failing here and it says if you see this part right line number two that value error invalid literal for integer so what we can do we can again handle this we can say a value error because this is value error right and i will say colon please provide valid entries something like that so just run this time and if you just give anything let's say this digit or some string it is going to say please provide valid entry the moment it will throw any exception it will start searching do i have any exception block or accept block which can handle value error so it came here it is not matching it came here it is not matching finally it matched here it says value error and it says please provide valid entry okay so this is how you can keep one try with multiple accept and at last okay let's say we have some any other exception as well which is not falling into this category can we still handle them yes you can just handle them with exception as i told you okay let me just explain you this diagram so let's do one thing first of all i will show you type error just go here and search for type error and you can see this type error is a separate class which is a child class of exception or this class inherit another class called exception and the base class of exception is base exception second zero division error copy and search here and you can see zero division error is again inheriting another class called arithmetic error arithmetic error is inheriting another class called exception and exception is again base exception finally value error just search value error as well this value error is a separate okay class in python and you don't need to remember this hierarchy but yeah make sure that exception and base exceptions are the main classes so these are the subclasses that we are using so exception class will be able to handle almost everything okay so in case something goes wrong we will finally handle with exception class and here we will simply say uh, something went wrong now we don't have this condition right now but yeah in case due to some xyz reason if these except are not able to handle finally this except block will be able to handle everything yes i hope it is clear now let me show you one more example and uh, just give me a few more minutes and everything will be clear now i want to also introduce one more keyword called finally okay so finally is a block which will execute no matter whether you get exception or not okay so try is a keyword but this is a try block except is also a keyword but this is except block in the same way we also have finally finally and in the finally whatever statement you will write it will execute anyways whether you get exception or not okay so i will say have a nice day so just right click and run let's provide some valid entry 90 and 9 you got result 10 uh, 10.0 and have a nice day this is from finally let me give some wrong output or input let's say 90 this time i will say ui something some bad entry it says please provide valid entry have a nice day last i'll give 89 divided by 0 it says please do not enter zero and have a nice day so you can see our program is able to handle all the exceptions very gracefully we're getting proper messages and finally is also executing now in finally right now we are just keeping print statement but in real time once you move ahead we will be keeping some statement or some piece of code that we have to execute always okay let's say you are 
connecting with a database you want to read some entries and you want to close the connection so in case if you get any exception okay while reading or while read while writing your database connection should be closed or when you are let's say reading a file making a connection to the server anything uh, when you're dealing with connection you need to close the connection that piece of code you can keep inside finally block okay I hope it is clear now we don't use this much but yes this is also one of uh, the scenario you can also have else with try accept okay so what does it mean I'm just going to add one more else okay just say else and here I will say print and I will say all went right some statement now what is the else will do here okay let me show you through output so again I will run this program I will say 99 so you can see it is giving me the result which is expected but it is also giving me all went right and finally this is from finally so now else keyword which you're adding so this is actually else block now so else will only execute when there is no exception except will execute when there is an exception and finally will always run whether there's exception or not so just keep this point in mind okay generally we don't mix else with finally but yeah i'm giving you this uh, example so that in case if you are attending some interviews and if you get this question make sure you answer else will only run when there is no exception except block will run when there is exception finally will always run whether there is exception or not so in case if you want to just cross check let me give some wrong input and you will see the output 90 and I will give 0 you can see this time all went right is not appeared because this time we got the exception yeah. I hope it is clear don't worry once you move ahead once you start working with selenium API performance you will be getting a lot of exceptions and we will be able to handle it but before I end this session I just want to show you two different things okay so the first thing which I want to show you the code the moment you open this type error okay so how do you open just press control from the keyboard put mouse over and you can see type error is a class which is inheriting exception okay if you just open this exception exception is a class which is inheriting base exception if you open this base exception it's a separate class which actually inheriting object class yes so you can see the hierarchy right whatever diagram I showed you this is exactly in the same way if you want to just see this hierarchy through code just open that uh, exception and you will be able to see how they are inheriting each other okay not only this let's say you want to open the first program which is demo one just open this file not found and you can see it is inheriting a class called OS error OS error is equal to Windows error here and if you open Windows error it's a it is also inheriting exception and as usual exception is inheriting base exception and finally this is object yeah it's very interesting it is just you should know how internally they're working then only you can customize them whenever you want now often when we talk about exception handling you will see a keyword called raise okay so this raise keyword is very important when you want to raise some exception based on some conditions we will be seeing this uh, with proper usage once we move ahead for the time being I will show you one basic program and I will be doing some condition if this condition is not valid I will throw some exception so I will just accept a number let's say number one and I will be taking input and I will say please enter number now I will write a small if condition okay and I will say if number one is equal to equal to zero then raise one exception okay so what is uh, exception it's totally up to you which exception you want to raise 
as of now i will throw some exception okay i will just give assertion error that's all it says please enter num1 this time if i just give 9 it is not doing anything because it is not satisfying this condition so let me do one thing let me just print uh, number is num1 so i will just give a space here run please enter number one this time i will say zero and you can see it is throwing assertion error so whatever exception you will give it will throw that particular exception depends on some condition and if this condition is not true it will continue as it is so using race you can raise a specific exception depends on the condition i hope it is clear to all of you so let me just give you a quick recap what we did we discussed about syntax error then we started with exceptions okay so we discussed about error at runtime is nothing but exceptions we have seen try with one except try with multiple except we have seen try except finally try except else and finally we also discussed the differences we also discussed about the race don't worry as i said earlier we will be getting this exception multiple times so we will be getting a lot of exception when we deal with selenium or when you work with performance or anything today in this video we are going to talk about assert keyword in python okay so python has a built-in keyword called assert and assert will help you to perform many kind of assertion based on your requirement okay so what exactly is assertion is let's say you want to verify something and you want to make sure that something is working as expected or not you will be using assertion okay so with the help of assert keyword you will be able to do all kind of assertions so let me show you what exactly assert is how does it work what is the syntax and when to use and different type of you know conditions that you can provide so if you talk about the syntax it's very straightforward uh, by the way i have created a dedicated package and i have created a dedicated python file so i'm just going to write assert so assert is a built-in keyword and what exactly assert will do it will simply take one condition okay if this condition evaluates to true it will continue with the next set of statement but if it fails it is going to throw assertion error okay so in case if you haven't seen my previous video where we discussed about exception handling then please go ahead and watch because here we will be getting assertion error so this is one syntax another syntax says you can give a condition and if this condition evaluates to false then you can also give an optional message here okay so you can just give an optional message here so this optional message will only come if any uh, condition false okay so let me show you through program so i will just type assert and purposefully i'm just going to give condition as true okay and i will just make a print statement and i will say bye so definitely this condition is true so it will simply say bye but what if i make it false if assert actually assert accept a condition okay so right now we are not giving condition purposefully i'm giving false so this particular statement is going to throw assertion error and it will stop the program yes and you can see i'm not getting this by so this is just a syntax now syntax says in case you want to give some optional message you can give this will only come if condition is false i will say condition failed so let's run so you can see it says condition failed which is nothing but this it's completely optional but yeah it will make more sense if you give the optional message what if i make it true will it print this no because this only will give if the condition fails so let me show you some real examples let's say if you're working with selenium and you want to verify some error messages you want to verify some help text you want to verify a title you want to verify url anything which you want to verify so i'm going to use assert now so let's say uh, i'm going to verify one string i will say string says selenium so i will be using uh, again a separate string selenium is for web automation okay so what exactly this condition will do it will check is selenium present in this particular string which is yes right because selenium is present here so i will just say here 
print and I will say validation pass validation passed and in case this validation doesn't work I will give comma in double quotes I will say validation failed or you can give the error message is not validated properly or whatever it is depends on your need so as of now since selenium is present it says validation pass but what if I say python here so it will check is python present in this definitely not so let's see what exactly it says first of all it says assertion error then it will also give you validation failed okay so this is just one second one let's do again a second assert I will use one string and I will say I just want to verify two strings okay uh, I will be using let's say str1 here let's say I'm taking python and again I will take a string 2 and let's say this is also python and I just need to verify whether these two strings are equal or not I will say assert is str1 equal to equal to str2 if yes then I will execute the next set of statement if it fails I will say strings matching failed anything depends on your requirement as of now I'm just saying string matching failed and here I will say validation to passed okay so as of now both are true so it will say validation to pass let me give a space what if I just make it small p will it work let's see the moment I run so you can see first of all it says validation pass which was the first one the second one assertion fail it says string matching fail because of this p so what does it mean it is case sensitive guys okay so just keep this point in mind and this time if I run it will say validation 1 and validation 2 passed perfect now let's say I want to verify I just want to assert that some value is present in a list or not so can I use assert with some list let's do that I will just say assert uh, let's say I have one thing selenium and I just want to verify into a list let's say I have a list of values I will say selenium I will say Python and I will just say one more thing let's say Java and I will also give an optional message here in case this fails I will say selenium is not present so if it works I will say validation 3 pass actually you can make into separate program so I'm just keeping everything into single program as of now this time when I run validation 3 pass because selenium exists into this list let me just change it to selenium okay actually there's a tool called selenium so in case if you're new you can explore so right now selenium is not present into this list so it says again assertion error selenium is not present and this is the assert that we have added right now I just used list can I use set can I use tuple you can use because assert only expect a condition if this condition is true it will continue if it is false it will just give assertion error let me give one last example that is again very basic but it will make your concepts very clear so let's say uh, I'm importing a math module okay so this is this math module we discussed earlier so I just want to print square root okay so if I say square root of 4 let's print we got value as 2 I just want to validate whether the value is equal to 2 or not so I will say assert math dot square root that's of 4 is equal to equal to 2 if yes it should continue the way it should say value is wrong and if it is working fine I will say pass so right now square root of 4 is 2 so it is working fine it says pass but what if I make it 3 will it fail definitely because it's not equal to 2 okay so we were expecting 2 but we got 3 so it says value is wrong and assertion error so very quick video but you yeah, are very important because we will be using assert a lot when we work with test automation we putting we will be putting multiple assert in our program so just make sure you are familiar with this assert keyword 
Today in this lecture, we are going to talk about how we can read and write text file in Python. Okay, so we are going to use again inbuilt function which Python provides. We are not going to use any third party modules and packages. So let me show you. It's very easy. You don't need to use any third party packages and modules. Okay, so let me go ahead and create a new file. And first example, we'll talk about how we can read the text file. Then we'll talk about how we can write the uh, text file. And again, we will be talking about three different modes. We'll talk about read, we will talk about write, and we will also talk about the append mode. Okay, so don't worry. Let me start one by one and we'll talk about all the different modes. So let me create a new Python file and this I will say read text file and hit enter. So first of all, in order to read any file, you need a file, right? So what I will do in the same package. Okay, so this is my package called IO demo and let me create a new file and let me give this file name as demo.txt it's just a small txt file and and i will simply write some text and uh, from learnautomation.com some random text i'm giving without any space okay i will tell you why and if you want to give some space just let's give some spaces no problem and now we have file and this file just in the same working directory as you can see this is the package in the same package i have created demo.txt and this is my python file right now let me use one inbuilt function called open okay so as you can see we need to provide the file and then we need to also provide the mode and you can also see we also have different you know uh, arguments like buffering encoding errors that's a different thing we'll talk about this in detail some other time as of now we'll talk about two argument one is file and second is the mode okay so as the name says we need to provide the file path so right now if you just notice this demo.txt is in the same folder so i don't need to provide any path i can directly say demo.txt and that's all i don't need to uh, give absolute path or any other path if it is available in the same directory it will detect easily and let me just store this into an object called f okay and once we get this you just need to call a method called read okay so now we have a method for read and we have a method for write so let me just call read and you're done the moment you call read method it will read the complete content okay and let me just store this into a variable called data and let me simply print this very easy just you need to call open function it will return you object okay which we say file object then we are going to call a method called read and this read method will return you the complete data from this demo.txt and you will get the data let's right click and run and you can see we got the complete data right this is Mukesh from learn .com. now what if this file does not exist so let's say uh, I just give demo1.txt which definitely does not exist so let's see what exactly it will throw so it is going to throw file not found error so if you have gone through my previous videos we discussed about exception handling right so same going uh, same thing we will be using here we will try to use some try and accept here in case this file doesn't you know exist it should not throw this file not found error it should gracefully handle it okay that we will see now but this is what how we are able to read the file just with a single method called read now let me show you some other stuff as well so let me just show you data and what if i want to just get some uh, you know first of all the name of the file so i will just say uh, this is actually our file right f object i will say f dot name it should give me the name of the file then let's say i just want to see in which mode my file is or opened okay so we haven't discussed about the mode we'll talk about the mode just give me a couple of uh, minutes when i say mode it should actually return me in which mode my file is and let me simply run it and let me show you so first of all when i say f dot name you can say file name is demo.txt then we have f dot mode means it is in read mode right now and then when I say data, it is giving me the data, right? Now, 
this is a ideal practice right not only with python when we work with any programming language that when you open some file when you open some connection when you making any request make sure you close it okay so let's say i want to close this file so i will say f dot close i'm just giving f guys you can give some any other variable name or any other uh, name of your choice now moment i close this file if i try to read this again okay just say f dot read again let's see what exactly it will return or uh, data new let's say data new let's run and you can see guys first of all when we say uh, when we actually close this file and when we try to read it again so you will see one value error is called io operation on close file it means once your file is closed as you can see at line number six we have closed the file right then again we are trying to read and it is throwing value error so once you are done with closing file you don't need to uh, you know you cannot directly read it again you have to open it and then you can read it yes makes sense so if you want to see whether your file is closed or not so you can just do one thing just type or just use print and we will say a closed or not okay so we have one property this will tell whether our file is closed or not so before closing if i call it will make it false because file is not closed but once i will call close method and again if i call this closed it should give me true right so let's right click run and you can see f dot name it is giving me file name then it is giving me read mode when i close if i okay so before closing when i say f dot closed it says false then i say f dot close file got closed and now when i call again it says it's true now there are few points which i want to highlight by default when you don't provide any mode it will be in a read mode right second thing it is always good practice to close the file okay because if you don't close then you you might get some leakage or there might be some other process which might do some io operation on this file now if you have gone through my previous videos we discussed about uh, try accept and finally right so in the finally block we always write the close connection or any statement which can close the resources so let's implement the same thing here so what I will do, I will just go ahead and create a new program. I will just do copy paste and I will make it to. So if I want to just write this with the help of try, accept and finally, what I will do, first of all, I will just make it a try block. Yes. So first of all, I will try to open this, then I will read and I don't need right now all of this. So I will just close or remove them. Then I will just say accept in case something goes wrong here. I will be making a print statement and I will say uh, exception is and let me handle exception here. Okay. And whatever the exception I will be getting, I will just print here as it is. And in the finally block, okay, I will keep this f dot close. So it means if no exception, it will simply read and it will close the file. If some exception, it will simply print this exception and then again it will close. Right? This is how we make sure that file is working fine or not. Now Python also have very interesting thing called context manager and what exactly this context manager will do, it will allow you to allocate and release the resources whenever you want to. Okay, let's say you want to open this file but you don't want to see guys if you miss this finally what will happen that it will not close the file right what if you want to write some logic or some piece of code which will automatically close the file okay once you're done with the file whether you got some exception or not it is going to close the file so we are going to use this context manager in python with the help of with statement okay so let me show you what i will do i will just create one more file and let me show you the context manager guys it's very very important 
when you see some standard libraries or standard programs you will find this context manager every time when you are working with files when you're working with any kind of database connection when you're making any server request so make sure whenever you make or open any connection you have to close it so now we are going to do the same thing with the help of with statement let me just close this yes so you just need to call with and now we will be calling the same function which is open function and here i need to provide the file okay which is demo.txt now you just need to write s and you can provide a object name okay so let's say same thing i will give f here now do not get confused guys this statement with this statement so here earlier we were storing object on the left hand side right now we are storing it right hand side but here we will be uh, getting some additional advantages let me show you how so what i will do when i say with open this file as f now it means now we got the file object now i can do the read operation before i do the read operation let me just check whether this is closed or not so definitely it will not be in a closed state it will be in an open state so what i will do i will say uh, current state is okay and i will simply print this now let me just do a read operation so what i will do i will say f dot read it should give me the data let me just store into a data variable and now let me simply print the data and now I'm coming out of this with statement okay so it's actually a block of code the moment you come out of this block automatically python is going to close this resource okay let me repeat this again the moment you come out of this with block okay with statement python is going to release the resources are uh, in simple words going to close the connection so if you just want to check you just make uh, again uh, state of the file okay of the file is and you just say f dot closed so when you say current state definitely it will say false because just now you open then we are reading but now you can see we're coming out of this with statement and the moment again i call f dot close it should give me true okay so let me just run it and as usual let's say current status is false then it is reading the data the moment you're coming out of this with it is closing the file and you can see it says f dot closed interesting right so always when you're working with this kind of new connections use a with statement okay so it is actually equal to what we did here okay so here we are calling finally explicitly right here it is doing internally so this is called context manager now a few more things which i want to highlight about reading a file okay now let's say right now i have this file in my current working directory let's say here what if i keep this demo.txt outside this directory so i will say demo new.txt which is here okay so it is not in this package io demo but it is in my current package which is python tutorial now how do i get the path one option is like you go ahead and you know copy paste the path so let me do one thing let me close everything except this three okay so if i try to just call this demo new.txt which definitely does not exist here right so it should throw me uh, error same file not found error now the question comes how do i get the path right now we are going to use a uh, os module here now when i say import os so this is the os module now i want to know the current uh, path so when i say os dot you will see we have a function called get cmd which is get current working directory so ideally it is going to return me current working directory which i will just store into a data variable uh, maybe i will say file path let's print this so that you should get the file path 
definitely it is going to throw the exception because this file does not even exist so again this is the file path we are getting right which is c drive users pycharm python tutorials io demo but if you notice guys my file is located here which is under python tutorials so what i have to do actually i need this path not the current working directory because anyways current working directory i will be getting uh, from this module when you say os.getcmd but i want till here now again if you just want the directory name what you can do you just call os.path and again you just say i need the directory name so when you say directory name it will ask you give me the path and path we already have right this one so when i will pass this path which is actually this so it is going to return me the directory name which is actually this okay so once i get this path i will just copy here and i will just give this path here so basically okay let's remove this from here and now let's try to read this now this file path is this till python tutorials and then we will be getting demo.txt so i will just say plus and here i will be getting just give me a second demo new.txt and as usual everything is same so what i will do here i will just make some changes in this file and i will say this is a new file so that we'll get to know let's right click and run again and you can see it actually reading the new file which is available in my uh, main parent directory right what if you don't want to uh, you know store this into variable no problem what you can do just keep this part here okay you might get confused initially okay but do not worry just practice little by what i'm doing i'm showing a statement by statement okay then i'm removing all the additional statement and then i'm passing here same thing you can do so this is going to return me the directory name for this you need a directory that we will call from os dot get current working directory this is the file name and that's all okay i hope it is clear if not then please let me know in the comment section and i will be happy to assist you now this is called the read operation now let me show you a few other stuff okay i will also talk about the write i will also talk about the append in the read again we have a read lines we have a read line then we have tail then we have a seek method okay so we will be discussing this some other time as of now this is enough let me quickly show you the write file as well for that what i will do i will just quickly go ahead and create a new python file and this time i will say write file demo and we got this so again i will be using a width and definitely we need to open that is mandatory so again here i can write the file okay into existing file or it will create a new file for you okay so let's say i just want to write something into mukesh.txt so first of all it is going to search that do we have this mukesh.txt file if yes it is going to overwrite if not it will create it so guys again i am not mentioning any mode okay and let me show you what exactly exception we are going to get now so what i will do we have a method called write method and here i will say new content or new data from python so ideally what it should do it should open a file if not if this file does not exist it is going to create then it is going to write f dot write now let's right click and run and first of all it is giving you no such file or directory because by default when you don't give any mode it takes as a read mode and read mode will never create any directory or file for you so you will always get this now let me change the condition let me just give this demo.txt which actually exists and now i'm trying to write this okay 
you will see the exception will change this time and this time since demo.txt exists it is not throwing that uh, file not a uh, found error this time this exists but when we are trying to write it says unsupported operation not writable and it makes sense because when you don't give any mode it takes as a read mode so just keep this point in mind so what i will do guys i will just give a mode here called write operate uh, write mode it means now we can write the file as well now if you see demo.txt contains this is mukesh from learn automation this time i am just saying new data from python and let's right click and run okay and the moment you open this it is actually overriding okay it removed my old content and it has updated my file with new content called new data from python so right is going to delete or override everything and it will add a new content what if i give some file which does not even exist let's say this so what now python will do it will create demo mukesh.txt file in a write mode and it is going to write this okay let me show you once again okay and if you notice we got this file and this file got the new content i hope it is clear we'll talk about few more methods when we once you move it as of now we are just you know reading some files we're writing and now i will also show you the append okay now just want to show you the append ones for that what i will do i will create okay let's take this one which is demo mukesh.txt and what i want to do i don't want to overwrite the file i don't want to create a new file i just want to append something in that case what i will do i will create a new python file and let me just give append demo and again i will say with open and as usual i will be giving a file called demo mukesh.txt and guys just remember we are not giving read okay we are not giving write we are giving append so for that you just need to say a and we will be uh, giving file object as f so first of all i just want to write f dot write and here i will say first of all hello then i will simply say write from mukesh and again i will say f dot write by just notice guys demo mukesh dot txt only has new data from python and this time i'm opening the same file in append mode and i'm just writing this hello from mukesh by now let's right click run okay it executed successfully just open this and you can see this was our old content right new data from python and it added actually hello from mukesh and it added by as well okay so it's appending actually and you can see it's not giving any space so in case if you want to format little bit so let's format it i will say f dot right and in double quotes i will give backward slash n okay so it will give me the new line then same thing i will do here after writing hello i want a new line and again from mukesh i will i want a new line it is just i'm doing formatting in case if you don't want this you can just give a tab and uh, this should be in a new line it means once we are done okay maybe i will just delete this and uh, then i will run you will see when it says slash n it is going to start this into a new line then i will give a tab it will say from mukesh and then from the new line it will say bye okay let's right click run and our code successfully done and you can see so this is how you can do the append append will not override it will have the old content and it will start appending the data at the last point okay very useful very interesting again we did a very uh, i would say basic stuff right now in upcoming days once you uh, you know once you are familiar with read write and append we will also discuss few more method okay as i said we will be discussing about read line read lines we will discuss about seek method we'll talk about the till methods and other some interesting stuff as well today in this video we are going to talk about a zip function which is in python 
and it is going to be very useful function once we move ahead and once you start working with multiple I will say iterables and we have to join them or I will say when we have to combine them so as the name says it is going to zip two iterables or more than two iterables and it is going to return you a list of tuples okay so let me talk about first of all the official documentation then I will sh slowly show you multiple examples then it will make everything clear so as you can see if you talk about python built-in functions we have one of the function zip function the moment you open this so you can see the zip functions will accept iterables and finally it will aggregate the elements from each of the iterables okay now this is the main part guys this will be little technical but i will make it very simple once we move it so just give me a couple of minutes and we will discuss this each like in detail one by one so what exactly it says it will return you a iterator of tuples which is nothing but a list of tuples in our case where the ith tuple contains the ith element from each argument sequence uh, sequences or iterables okay and this iterable will stop when input iterable is exhausted okay so it means it will keep on uh, giving you the list of tuples until the list or the whatever iterables you have given it is not exhausted okay now very uh, important point once again when you give a single iterable argument it is going to return a iterator of single tuple and in case of no arguments it is going to return an empty iterator okay so we'll come back to this definition once again once i will show you some examples okay don't worry if you're not able to understand this just give me a couple of minutes and you will be able to understand everything okay so first of all let's just call zip and you can see it is a built-in function so again in case if you want to cross verify so what you can do you can just say print just type dir and here you can just type underscore underscore built-ins okay so the moment you say you want to know built-ins it is going to return you number of built-ins which is available in python so you can see these are the built-ins we got so if you just scroll at last you are going to get this zip function right this zip function is exactly which i showed you which is this one okay so it started with all this one and we got the zip one now once you got this now let's see so what i will do first of all i will just call print and let me just just check what exactly this zip okay so i will just type zip and the moment i run this you can see it's giving you a class okay so just hold on to this point i will show you okay the moment you open the built-ins.py file you can see it's a separate class available and the moment you call this zip function it is going to call this constructor so do not get confused when we say class because the whatever iterables you will pass you will be passing here in the constructor itself so you can see this is the iterables right and this is what exactly we are going to get so the moment you pass any iterables here it is going to pass in the constructor okay so now let's do one thing let me create two different list and let me zip them and then we'll talk about the different uh, situations so let's say i have a list and let's say i have a list of names so I will just create few records. Let's say first name is Mukesh. Then I have second record, let's say Akash. And let's say third record, which I want to say, let's say Peter. So this is just a name and let's say I just want to have their marks. So let me store the marks again. So I will say marks, let's say 70 for first one, 80 for second and 90 for the third record. So you can see right now, these are actually two different lists, right? This is one list, this is separate list. Now, if I want to create a zipping or I just want to combine these two lists, okay? So either I can run a for loop where I will take first element from this list, first element from this list, and then I will add into another list, right? So that is again a tedious task where I have to iterate both the lists and finally I have to create list and add them. So let's call the zip function and here you can see it is asking give me the iterables so we have two iterables one is actually both are lists so let me pass first of all 
first iterable which is list then second iterable is the max so the moment you run this it is going to return you the zip object okay so if you just want to see let me just store this into a variable called data so you can do one thing you can just call a list function and within this list function you can pass the zip object which is data in our case okay so you will notice now let me comment this because we have already seen this is a zip object now this is going to return to the exact data so now i will just make this as my data and let me simply print this okay so you will get to know what exactly data we are getting the moment you right click run you can see now i got first of all the list right you can see this bracket because i am passing this zip object into list function now if you see each record is coming as part of tuple right we have seen tuple list in detail in case if you haven't discussed or in case if you haven't visited that videos please go ahead and watch that videos because that is the base for this example okay so now if you notice how it is doing the zip it is simply taking the first element from the first list first element from the second list it is creating a tuple for us so you can see mukesh 70 is one of the record which is nothing but a tuple it is taking akas 80 and you can see it's another tuple and third record peter and 90 it's another tuple so the final example is a list of tuple okay so this is very straightforward scenario where we are taking two lists we are zipping them we are getting a zip object that we are converting into a list and finally we are getting the data which is nothing but a list of tuples now let me do one thing let me add one more record here okay so in our case let's add python here so you can see now we have two iterables one is list another is also list but here we have three records here we have four records in this case now let's observe the output so you can see now it is going to again give you the same output because there's no record where it can generate a tuple for you okay so it will only generate the tuple with the valid number of argument okay so it will not give you any error but you can see we got only three tuples which was matching earlier okay okay 70 akas 80 and peter with 90. so this is another scenario where we we have two lists but the number of arguments or the number of values is not matching now let me show you another example where you have only list one list and you've still try to call the zip function what exactly happens so let's say if i say l1 i'm just taking some dummy name and let me take some numbers okay some dummy values again can i call the zip function yes so i'm just passing l1 so in this case again i should get uh, the zip object let me convert into a list directly so i will call the list function and i will pass the zip object here and let me print directly okay instead of storing into variables i'm just calling into one into one line okay so you can see still we are getting list of tuples since we have only one list so it is just having this tuple have only one value can you see this so it works with single list as well it works with uh, two list let's take for example of one more list okay here i will just take one more list where i will give them some address okay so address i will say let's say abc then second address xyz and third address let's say demo now is it possible to combine more than two list yes there's no restriction so you can just pass one more table which is address and just see the output just right click run and you can see so we got our first tuple which is mukesh 70 then abc then you can see the second record akash 80 xyz and the last one peter 90 and with demo right you can see how easy it is when you have multiple list again there's no restriction that you can only use list we can use set and other iterables as well it is just i'm giving example of these um, list okay so let's take another example where we will take multiple set and then we'll try to zip them so i will just take zip example two and now let's do one thing let's remove this 
and let's convert into a set okay so this is one set and since we already have seen this part so I will make this also a set okay and third is not required now if I try to zip them and if I say I want to zip name with marks so I will be getting a list of okay so sorry zip function is going to return me zip object so which I will just pass into list okay and I will just do a print here so that we'll get to know the final output okay now simply right click run and you can see it is matching again it says Akash with 80 so this is Akash with 80 then it's taking Peter with 90 and finally Mukesh with 70 okay so you can see since we're using set so we you might not get in the same order but the final output is still the same it is zipping two iterables and it is giving you the zip object that we're converting into list which is giving us the list of tuples right so this is how the zip function works so we will be using the zip functions a lot once we start working with excel file where we have to insert multiple data into excel and so what we will do we'll take multiple list records we will zip them and finally we'll feed into the excel sheet or in the database now the last part is unzipping again it is again since we know it's a list of tuples right so we can simply run a small for loop or we can just do the uh, tuple unpacking and we can do the unzipping okay so let's see how it works for unzipping again let me quickly create another file so that i don't want to confuse you so let's say if i create zip uh, let's do one thing let's take the first example for the unzipping so this is our file now let me simply do one thing let me remove this additional statement okay it's not required right now and let me remove this additional record as well so right now i have three list name marks and address then we're calling zip function where we are passing name marks address we got the zip object then we are converting into a list right now if you want to unzip this what you can do just type uh, zip and you can see it is asking give me the iterable right now in our case this is our final list right which has the list of tuples that we are going to pass here and you just need to okay just use it this and just say star so now it is going to give all these values and this one we have discussed earlier this is called tuple unpacking right so now i have three records here mukesh 17 abc so now i am going to continue three variables which is a comma b comma c okay now just notice one thing the moment i say print a if i just say print b and if i say print c you will get the values okay so this is, this is called the, uh, unzipping the values can you see when i say print a it means it is only giving me values from my first list since earlier it was a complete tuple so let me do one thing let me print com complete list of tuples or tuples so the moment you run and let's try to expand this so yes you can see this was my first tuple this was my second and this was the third so when we are doing unpacking so all the records from the first tuple is going into a then into b second record and at last third record into c so we got mukesh akash peter which is coming from this and same for marks and same for the address as well right you can see how easy it is it's a very small function but it's very powerful and we will be using a lot with excel right so i hope you got the point okay so let me do a quick recap so that you will get all the points so first of all we discussed that zip function is again a built-in function and we also have seen if you pass simply zip without any iterable it gives you zip object if you pass single list it will still give you zip object if you pass two list or multiple list or multiple any kind of iterable it is going to return you list of tuples that you can iterate so here we are doing the same thing we are iterating actually we are zipping three different lists we're converting into list and finally we're printing 
then in the second examples we have taken set examples we are combining two sets and finally we are getting the output in the third example we have seen how to unzip and we got the values right so that's all for this example today in this lecture we are going to talk about lambda functions or you can say anonymous functions okay so now before we start i just want to highlight that few people consider lambda functions or anonymous functions it's very complicated topic but it's not it's going to be very easy just give me a couple of minutes and stay till the end of the session and i will make sure that you understand lambda functions very easily okay so i will also show you some official document uh, documentation and definitions which will make everything very clear and lambda functions again we will be using once you move ahead we will be using with filter map and reduce and with different built-in functions as well it's going to be very interesting so let me first of all show you what exactly official documentation says and then we will finally take few examples and will make everything very easy so as you can see i'm just referring to official documentation from python it says small anonymous functions can be treated with the lambda keyword okay so now in simple words lambda functions are anonymous functions okay now if you just come back here it says lambda functions can be used whenever function objects are required just note this uh, point i will come back to this once again they're syntactically restricted to a single expression this is the main part or i will say n number of arguments but it can have only one single expression okay so let's talk about this in detail and uh, we'll see how do we use it so first of all i will show you what was the situation before lambda and what will be the situation after lambda okay so let's do one thing let's write a very small program that will simply calculate or simply print the square of a given number so this is how we do generally we will write a small function right where we will simply calculate the square of a given number so if i create a function called sqr where we will pass the number and it is simply going to give me a square of the same number okay so if i say whatever the number will give we'll just get the square of the same number so let's do one thing now if i just want to call this i will just call square and i will pass let's say number two and let's see what value we will get we will get four if i simply give four okay just run it once again we'll get 16 right now what if i have list of values so let's say if i have list of values if i create a list l1 equal to one three five six seven sorry these are just a list of values integer values so now i have four values if i just want to call this multiple times as we have seen in our previous videos how to iterate a list so i will say for let's say x in li or l1 so it is going to give me all these values one by one right so i can call this function now so now it is going to calculate the square of each number from this list so if i simply run this you can see we got the value 3 square 9 then 25 and 36 now this is happening with the regular approach where we are creating a function we are calling this function on a list of uh, elements okay now if i simply try to convert this into lambda function okay so how we will do it let me show you so first of all i will show you what is the exact syntax in order to create lambda function then we will write this program again or maybe some other program so first of all you need to write this lambda keyword then you need to provide the argument so this can be single argument this can be multiple argument so just i will mention arguments then i will write colon and here you need to maintain the expression now this expression is totally depends on your condition so this is the syntax would be and this is going to return the object of function object okay i will show you that as well so this is going to return i will say function object just remember the syntax guys and rest everything is very easy so let me write this lambda function i will say lambda okay this is the keyword then argument let's say argument is nothing but just one argument i will say number then colon right i will just say colon here 
finally we need to provide the expression so now expression i just want to uh, generate the square so i will say number into number okay now whatever data we will get let me store into a data variable and let me first of all show you what exactly is this data variable okay the moment you say print data just run this and you can see we got one function object now how do we call the normal function we simply write the function name and provide the argument same will be applicable for lambda function or anonymous function i will simply say data and i will simply provide the value let's say 5 now this will give you the final data let me store into a result variable and now let's print this result okay so i will say print result and just right click run and you can see we got the data if i want to calculate the square of 10 just change this and you will see the value so generally we will be using this lambda functions once we start using some higher order functions okay so once we move ahead we will be using uh, filter we will be using map we will be using reduce we will be using sort so whenever you use this high level or higher order of functions where we will be using function as an argument so instead of using uh, you know fully qualified function name we will use anonymous function or i will say the lambda functions so i can give you a few examples we will discuss this in detail once you move ahead but i can just quickly show you when do we use the moment you type map you can see map is a function which is expecting function as an argument and a table as an argument can you see so here we will be using this lambda function once again which is anonymous function let me show you the reduce sorry filter first so if you see filter also is expecting function as an argument and a table as an argument and there's one more call reduce for reduce we just need to import func tool don't worry we will discuss this in detail but uh, i will just say from func tool import reduce so the moment you say reduce you can see again it is asking give me the function and give me the sequence so can you see when you have to pass function within a function we will be using a lambda function or an anonymous function again guys just a small disclaimer whenever you have to write some complex programs or complex calculation go with the regular functions and use it normally this lambda function is only useful when you have to write a very small and quick code so just do with lambda function and finish it but the moment you have complex programs make use of normal functions okay because generally when it comes to readability lambda functions are not that readable but they are very good when you have the, a very small calculation with less number of arguments and with less calculation or i will say easy calculation but yes for the complex one you have to go with uh, normal functions okay it's totally up to you but this is what the suggested one because of the readability part so just to make you uh, you know very clear i will show you one more example okay so right now i just showed you example of only single argument what if i want to pass multiple argument so in that case let's say i just want to have again one more anonymous function let's say lambda is a keyword this time i want to pass three argument okay so let's say uh, num1 comma num2 comma num3 okay com and colon so num1 which we have simply do into 2 plus whatever second number we have multiply this number by 3 add the result number 3 that we have do this multiply by 4 so you can see number 1 into 2 plus number 2 into 3 number 3 into 4 this is what my expression and these are the number of argument that i will be passing so finally i will get the function object let me store this into a new data okay and now let me simply call this so i will say new data and let me pass one two three let's take this calculation simple so that i can show you easily just run this and you can see we got the data is 20. how we are getting 20 let's see so one will be passed into num1 num1 into 2 we got result is 2 plus then we are passing 2 2 will be stored in num2 num2 into 3 which is 2 into 3 which is 6 so this is 6 then 3 will be passed 
in num3 num3 a into 4 which is 3 into 4 which is 12 so this is 12 so 12 plus 6 plus 2 into 20 I hope you got this lambda function now which is anonymous function so there's no restriction you can pass n number of arguments it is just you need to give the expression here and you will get the function object and you can call this with the number of argument clear now there's a question what if I just want or if I simply pass two argument what will happen the moment you run this you will get simple just like a normal type error that missing one required positional argument num3 okay so just make sure you give the exact number of argument that you have mentioned in your lambda function I hope it is clear now if you still have any doubt let me know in the comment section and if you are new to this channel then make sure you subscribe this channel and I will see you in the next video have a nice day bye bye